The story that we are going to be talking about today is one of the most incredible and terrible stories that I have ever read. It is said by many to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, American novel ever written, and by others to be one of the most brutal and evil things ever put to paper. And as someone who has read the story a few times at this point, I have to agree with both sides. That story that we are going to be talking about today is the novel Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. There are a few stories that I read that I can definitively say change the way I look at storytelling or at narratives as a whole. And this book is certainly one of them. Now, of course, I am a little biased. Cormac's two most famous stories, No Country for Old Men and The Road, are among my favorite stories ever written. So, as a fan of the author, I went into Blood Meridian hopeful. And after reading it, I think this just might be his masterpiece. Now, a lot of you might have heard of Blood Meridian, not from its history as a novel, but its history as a film adaptation, or more specifically, the lack thereof. Blood Meridian has officially been put forward as a film on four separate occasions, some of them having names like Martin Scorsese and Tommy Lee Jones attached. And despite that, the film has never got out of pre-production most of the time because production companies find the contents of the novel far too disturbing and graphic to be adapted to film. And as mentioned earlier, I see where they're coming from. A lot of the stuff in here would be a massive risk to ever put to screen. But with that being said, if you're someone who values story and literature, especially American literature, this is a story you really shouldn't miss out on. And that brings us to today. What I want to do is go through the story of Blood Meridian, as I do with a lot of literature topics in these videos, and talk about the characters, events, and themes as they occur within the story. And as we read the book and analyze it together, I want to get across to you all why this is such an important and brutal story. So before we start, I have a couple disclaimers. For one, if you read any literature, or more specifically disturbing literature, and I'll talk about the specific contents of the book in a moment, and if you're okay with those contents, then I want you to stop watching this video right now, find Blood Meridian, audiobook, ebook, I don't care, and immediately listen to this story as it was originally told. I would hate to rob you of experiencing this story the way it was originally written, because it truly is a one-of-a-kind experience. So if you read anything and you're okay with disturbing content, then go ahead and enjoy the book. And for those of you that have already read it, uh, don't want to engage with the disturbing content of it, or a lot of people on YouTube who are like myself and will not read a story no matter how many times I tell you to, which, hi, then hopefully this video can serve as a substitute or summary for the events of the book, but I can never tell it in the way McCarthy did. And the second disclaimer for those who may be interested in the book, is know that this story takes place in a pre-Civil War United States. So all instances of extreme violence, racism, uh, sexual abuse towards both women and children, as well as extreme animal violence are depicted thoroughly and gratuitously. The story deals with the most evil parts of humanity. And there is a purpose to it, and we're going to talk about what that purpose is in this video. But if those are topics that you don't want to deal with, and you don't want to see outright, then do not read this book. And perhaps even don't watch this video. I understand that a lot of what I'm going to say is a lot, and also that this video probably won't be monetized. But I can't not talk about this story. But despite all of that, I find this book to be so special that I am excited to explain the story to those of you who haven't heard it before, and to nerd out about the details of it with those of you that have. So if you're as excited to hear about it as I am to talk about it, then stick around as we talk about the story of Blood Meridian, right after we deal with whatever emotional trauma I'm about to go through right now. Oh, why, hello there. I was just taking a moment to relax, as I think we all should, before talking about subject matters like we'll be talking about today. 
whenever we're confronted by emotional or intense media. It's important to analyze our own feelings and understand if this topic is right. Who cares about all of that, but we've got the high octane action of today's sponsor, World of Tanks. World of Tanks lets you participate in high adrenaline online battles, find the right armor and strategy that works for you, and get in on the best competitive tank game that's even free to play. In World of Tanks, you can customize your arsenal with tank destroyers, artillery, light, medium, and heavy tanks. And with over 600 vehicles to choose from, you can pick any strategy from ambushing your opponents or a full frontal assault or laying support fire with artillery or anything in between. And speaking of, thanks to World of Tanks historical accuracy, the bizarre amount of information I know about historical battles is actually useful for once. Because things like the optional upgrades and the weak points and the weapons of tanks in the game are accurate to their historical counterparts. And with over 40 arenas that let you battle in fields, cities, deserts, and forests, you can put those strategies to good use. And perhaps the most amazing thing about this game, given its depth, attention to detail, and fun, is that it's free to play. As someone who plays a lot of video games and has made a lot of ads about video games, I can promise you that World of Tanks is a game I love to play and am excited to play again. And if you want to get in on that excitement, then now's the perfect time. Because if you're a new player who registers with the link in the description and the invite code TANKMANIA, then you will get a slew of in-game rewards as soon as you register. This includes Excelsior, a tier 5 tank, 250,000 credits, and 7 days of free premium access. As well as 3 tier 6 rental tanks that you will get for 10 battles each. I can't stress this enough. World of Tanks is a great and fun game that's also free to play. So if you haven't tried it out yet, there's no reason not to. Head to the link in the description and use invite code TANKMANIA to get your in-game rewards and try the best tank shooter on the market right now for free today. Thank you all so much for watching the ad and thank you so much to World of Tanks for sponsoring this video. It really does mean the most. Hope you all check them out. Link is in the description and we are back to the video. We are going to go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. Now, a few of you probably noticed this green screen behind me, which is a change from the norm of my normal content, considering this actually adds some level of production value. But the story of Blood Meridian is, for one, a story that doesn't have that many illustrations or depictions, and two, even if it did, I probably couldn't show them on YouTube. So for this story, we're gonna have a lot of mood setting, a lot of environments for us to talk through, and there's gonna be a lot of sections of me reading pages out of the book, and I'll be reusing the same images. So bear with me through the low visual quality. I feel like the contents of this story more than make up for it. And also, as we begin, uh, it, it feels weird to say, but there's almost a nervousness to me making this video right now. Cause like I, I talk about a lot of important stories on this channel, right? The, things like the Divine Comedy or Paradise Lost. But there's something about this one that it, it, it just strikes such a personal chord with me about not only its contents and the message it's getting across, but the setting and the characters that I, I know if this resonates with someone the way it resonated with me, it can really change your life as a writer or a storyteller. Um, so it's, it's almost like I feel a responsibility standing here talking about it. So if there are certain segments in the story that I seem a bit dramatic or I am reading parts of it the way I feel they're intended to be read, then just bear with me. I think this story is one worth embarrassing myself over. So with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. With the first question that a lot of you probably have, what is this book even about? And to explain that, I need to explain a little bit of history. Shortly after the Mexican-American War, a little more than a decade before the American Civil War, along the border between the United States and Mexico, there was constant skirmishes between American soldiers and Mexican soldiers. Even though the war was officially over, some soldiers, referred to as filibusters, would mount up arms and charge into the enemy's country to continue the war. In the midst of this bloodshed, Native American tribes like the Apaches and Yuma were fighting soldiers on both fronts. 
the natives wanting both the Americans and Mexicans to stay off their land. So both the Americans and Mexicans were hostile towards the natives and vice versa, creating a scenario where all three sides of the conflict equally want each other dead. To combat these Native Americans, around 1849, the Mexican government began offering 100 pesos per Native American scalp. So that meant that anyone, Mexican, white, or Native, could get a contract from the Mexican government to go collect Native scalps and then sell those back to the government for money. One of the most famous practitioners of this was a man named Samuel Chamberlain, one of the American filibusters who I mentioned earlier. While in Mexico, Samuel separated from the American military and decided to join a gang who set about collecting native scalps. The leader of this gang was a man named John Joel Glanton, a former Texas Ranger and soldier in the Mexican-American War. The gang who rode with him was known as the Glanton Gang, and they were among the most feared and brutal headhunters in the Wild West. Years after Samuel Chambers left the Glanton Gang, he would detail their journeys in a book called My Confession, Recollections of a Rogue. So everything that I just said is from a true historical account of the American and Mexican Wild West. So where Blood Meridian comes into play is Cormac McCarthy took the legends of this gang, of which little is factually known, and he decides to tell the story of what they might have been like through the perspective of a young boy. And this grand tale that deals with fate and war and death and purpose simply begins with the description of this child. The book opening with these lines. See the child. He is pale and thin. He wears a thin and ragged linen shirt. He stokes the scullery fire. Outside like dark turned fields with rags of snow and darker woods beyond that harbor yet a few last wolves. His folk are known for hewers of wood and drawers of water, but in truth, his father has been a schoolmaster. He lies in drink. He quotes from poets whose names are now lost. The boy crouches by the fire and watches him. Night of your birth, 33. The Leonids, they were called. God, how the stars did fall. I looked for blackness, holes in the heavens, the dipper stove. The mother dead these 14 years did incubate in her own bosom the creature who would carry her off. The father never speaks her name. The child does not know it. He has a sister in this world that he will not see again. He watches, pale and unwashed. He can neither read nor write, and in him broods already a taste for mindless violence. All history present in that visage. The child, the father of the man. We are told from this already that the child, this kid, who is never named in the story, by the way, he is simply referred to as the kid. We are told that the kid's life was wrought out of violence. His very birth killed his mother, born in blood. We hear things like the imagery of the star falling as he was born. His father is a drunk who is both a schoolmaster but hasn't taught him how to read, almost inconsequential in the child's life. So at 14 years old, with no purpose left, and a mind for irrational violence, the kid runs away. He runs away from his home in Tennessee, and he doesn't know where he's going, but he just starts heading southwest. For several months, he stays in New Orleans, and while he's there, he periodically gets into fistfights on riverboats and decides to leave after he's shot. He's taken in and cared for by a kind woman, a tavern keeper's wife, who he doesn't have any money to pay, so one night he just sneaks out. For a couple of years, the kid just wanders the countryside, periodically getting into fights and working odd jobs. Eventually, he winds up in the city of Nacogdoches, and while he's there, he comes across a tent revival. The kid, having no other place to go and no other purpose in the world, decides to step into the makeshift church. There are several points in this story where characters within the story will give tales or parables that, as I talk about them, I'll talk about their greater meaning to the plot, but a lot of them are interesting, and I want to share them with you. I say that, and also say to mention, while this story is set in pre-Civil War United States, uh, as you can imagine, there are a lot of slurs <laughs> and other terms that are not acceptable to say, uh, especially on YouTube. So... For obvious reasons, if I come across a place where one of those slurs is present, 
I'm going to replace the word with black person or Mexican person or what have you because, again, duh. I don't even know if the portion I'm about to read contains any of those, but just in case it does, I wanted to make that known because there are a lot in here. The kid walks into the tent. It says that it's been raining for two weeks and inside of the tent, it just stinks with the smell of wet dogs and human odor. And apparently this Reverend Green has been preaching for two weeks straight. Neighbors, said the Reverend. He couldn't stay out of these here hell, hell, hell holes right here in Nacogdoches. I said to him, said, you going to take the son of God in there with you? And he said, oh no, no I ain't. And I said, don't you know that he said, I will follow ye always even unto the end of the road. That was my evangelical voice. Hope you enjoyed it. The Reverend continues to give his sermon talking about how no matter where you travel or what you do, God is always with you. He's an ever-present figure, even if you don't want him to be. The kid seems to disregard this and has a conversation with the man next to him about the weather. And it's immediately after this that we are introduced to, I have to think this over, but what might be the greatest villain in all of fiction, or at least top five greatest villains in all of fiction. It's weird to call him a villain because the story is primarily made up of villains. There's really no heroes here. Um, but he's certainly an antagonistic force in the story. And that is the character known as the Judge. And the Judge's introduction into the narrative is a perfect introduction of this character. An enormous man dressed in an oilcloth slicker had entered the tent and removed his hat. He was bald as a stone, and he had no trace of beard, and he had no brows to his eyes nor lashes to them. He was close on to seven feet in height, and he stood smoking a cigar even in this nomadic house of God, and he seemed to have removed his hat only to chase the rain from it, for now he put it on again. The reverend had stopped his sermon altogether. There was no sound in the tent. All watched the man. He adjusted the hat and then pushed his way forward as far as the crate board pulpit where the reverend stood, and there he turned to address the reverend's congregation. His face was serene and strangely childlike. His hands were small. He held them out. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel it my duty to inform you that the man holding this revival is an imposter. He holds no papers of divinity from any institution recognized or improvised. He is altogether devoid of the least qualification to the office he has usurped and has only committed to memory a few passages from the good book for the purpose of lending to his fraudulent sermons some faint flavor of the piety he despises. In truth, the gentleman standing here before you posing as a minister of the Lord is not only totally illiterate, but is also wanted by the law in the states of Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Arkansas. This man, who will come to find is known as the judge, steps to the front of the room and begins announcing how this man is not only fraudulent, but is wanted by the law. Oh God, cried the reverend, lies, lies. He began reading feverishly from his open Bible. The judge ignores this and continues on. On a variety of charges, the most recent of which involved a girl of 11 years, I said 11, who had come to him in trust and whom he was surprised in the act of violating while actually clothed in the livery of his God. A moan swept through the crowd. A lady sank to her knees. This is him, cried the reverend, sobbing. This is him, the devil. Here he stands. Not three weeks before this, he was run out of Fort Smith, Arkansas for having Congress with a goat. Yes, lady, that is what I said. Goat. Why, damn my eyes, if I won't shoot the son of a bitch, said a man rising at the far side of the tent, and drawing a pistol from his boot, he leveled it and fired. From there, the entire tent revival breaks out in a gunfight. People begin pulling boot knives and shooting randomly into each other. Several people in the tent, including the kid, begin to grab their knives and cut holes in the tent so they can make a speedy exit. The kid makes his way to a bar across the street, and from there he watches people run bleeding out of the tent before the tent itself falls over, surely with the dead reverend inside. By the time the kid gets there, the judge has already made it to the bar, and after more men begin to come into the bar out of the rain, a few of them walk up to the judge and begin talking to him. 
Judge, how did you come to have the goods on that no account? Goods, said the judge. When you was in Fort Smith. Fort Smith. Where did you know him to know all that stuff on him? You mean Reverend Green? Yes, sir, I reckon you was in Fort Smith before you come out here. I was never in Fort Smith, in my life. Doubt that he was. They looked from one to the other. Well, where was it you run up on him? I never laid eyes on that man before today. Never even heard of him. He raised his glass to drink. There was a strange silence in the room. The men looked like mud effigies. Finally, someone began to laugh. Then another. Soon they were all laughing together. Someone bought the judge a drink. The judge, either not liking the reverend or out of just plain meanness, walked into a tent revival, told a lie that got the reverend as well as several others killed, and seemed to do all of it for fun. Which is a perfect introduction to his character. The kid seemingly pays no mind to this. There's very few moments in the book where we're told explicitly what the kid is thinking or what his thoughts on something are, but he does take note of the judge's strangeness. It comes up later in the story. I mean, how could you not? You're in the middle of the Old West, and among all of the raggedy, shaggy faces of the men with their long beards and long hair, you have someone in an oiled suit who is nearly seven feet tall, completely hairless, and as we'll find later in the story, albino. Technically, I don't remember any point in the story where McCarthy explicitly says he's albino, but he describes him as very, very pale, and most people interpret his appearance to be that of a seven-foot-tall, giant, hulking albino man. He seems like an alien stepped into this world for some purpose beyond ours, and it's something that we'll touch on more as we get into his character. The other detail about this story, which I probably should have prefaced whenever I was telling people to go read it, so oops, um, but something you need to know going in is Cormac McCarthy doesn't use punctuation. He uses periods, the occasional question mark, every now and then a comma, and that's it. He also uses colons whenever he's about to list something, but that's it. Uh, he said in an interview, I believe the quote was, why would I mark up the page with silly little dashes and lines? So there's no quotation marks. <laughs> there's no, um, semicolons, there's no breaks in sentences, you decide where the commas would go typically. Um, so I am, even by just reading the words on page, I'm kind of giving you my interpretation of what's emphasized. I remember whenever I first started reading McCarthy in high school, uh, we read The Road, my junior year English class, which was a trip. Uh, but I remember whenever we started the book, the teacher was like, oh yeah, just so you know, McCarthy doesn't use punctuation. And I remember being like, you can do that? <laughs> you can get to such a level of writing that you're just like, meh, who cares? But it is a testament to his writing style that there are several points in this story where there are like more than three people having a conversation at once. And because of how each character is characterized, despite never being denoted who's talking or giving quotation marks, normally I have no trouble just reading straight through it and figuring out who's saying what. So a couple of days later, the kid's still staying in Nacogdoches, and it's still raining. So he goes out one day to go to the bathroom, or the Jakes, as they're called in the story. Effectively an outhouse. So he's walking out of the house he's staying in to go to the outhouse. And it had been raining for so long that they had set out boards through the middle of town. So that rather than stepping in the deep mud, you could just walk across the boards. So as he's going, as he's walking on the boards to go to the bathroom, there is a man walking up from the bathroom. So the two are walking towards each other. And as, as they get to the same spot, the man who's walking up says, you better get out of my way. So the kid just kicks him in the jaw. <laughs> and they both pull knives and immediately get into a knife fight. So <laughs> the kid... Like, he cares about his own life so little that stepping in the mud is like, eh, I guess it's worth dying over. <laughs> so as they get into this fight where they're both pulling knives and trying to stab each other, someone comes up and just knocks both of them out. Uh, it's also mentioned that they were both drunk in the street, so probably a police officer. And then the kid wakes up a day later in a hotel room sitting across from the same man he got into the fight with. The two of them realize that they have each other's knives, so they pass each other's knives back, 
and I guess decide to quit fighting. So the stranger introduces himself as Toadvine. Toadvine has several facial tattoos and it's... Toadvine is mentioned as having several face tattoos and also spending a time in prison. Uh, despite this, he thinks that the kid's all right. And as a matter of fact, he finds the kid so all right that he's immediately like, hey, you wanna help me go beat up a guy? And the kid, again, with nothing better to do in life, is like, sure. So the kid follows Tovine to a hotel and Tovine walks to the front desk and asks if this certain man's there. And the guy at the front desk says, yeah, but if he sees you, he'll kill you. And Toadvine brushes him off. They go upstairs to the top floor of the hotel where the man's door is locked, the man that Toadvine wants to beat up and rob. So Toadvine tells the kid to get some paper and light it on fire and shove it under the dude's door. So the kid does, and it starts to set the door on fire. So whenever the man comes to the door and unlocks it to put out the fire, Toadvine and the kid rush in, beat him half to death, and then run away as the entire hotel burns down. So the kid's at a point where he's walking through the mud and he's like, yeah, I'll die so that I don't have to step in it. Uh, and then he gets knocked out and he wakes up across from the guy who was trying to kill him. And the guy's like, hey, do you want to help me go beat up this random guy you don't know? And the kid's like, sure. And they get there and Toadvine's like, burn the hotel down. And the kid's like, okay. The kid has no purpose. He is, as the story said in the beginning, wrought with a mind for violence and not much else. So after this, the kid goes to get his mule and continue on his journey. And as the kid leaves town, the final lines of chapter one say this. When he passed back through the town, the hotel was burning and men were standing around watching it, some holding empty buckets. A few men sat horseback watching the flames and one of these was the judge. As the kid rode past, the judge turned and watched him too. He turned the horse as if he'd have the animal watch too. When the kid looked back, the judge smiled. The kid touched up the mule and they went sucking out past the old stone fort along the road west. The judge is an omnipresent threat throughout the story in a way that's hard to explain, at least on a first read through, a first understanding of the story. Uh, but it's menacing that even in the beginning, he was right there, smiling, just as fate so happened to bring these two together, even if for a short time. The judge will come up later in the tale, but for now we continue to follow the kid on his currently pointless expedition. As the kid continues on his journey, it begins to storm and he comes across a hermit who's living in a mud hut. Nowhere else to go, the kid asks to stay with him and the hermit agrees. All the hermit has to offer in way of food is some rotten prairie dog and old salty water. The hermit says that he used to be a slave trader and has since fallen on hard times, hence him now living in a mud hut on the side of the road. And as the hermit is describing his situation, the two begin to have a conversation, beginning with the kid. I thank you. Lost ye way in the dark, said the old man. He stirred the fire, standing slender tusks of bone up out of the ashes. The kid didn't answer. The old man swung his head back and forth. The way of the transgressor is hard. God made this world, but he didn't make it to suit everybody, did he? I don't believe he much had me in mind. Aye, said the old man. But where does a man come by his notions? What world's he seen that he liked better? I can think of better places and better ways. Can you make it be? No. No, it's a mystery. A man's at odds to know his mind because his mind is odd he has to know it with. He can know his heart, but he don't want to. Rightly so. Best not to look in there. It ain't the heart of a creature that is bound in the way that God has set for it. You can find meanness in the least of creatures, but when God made man, the devil was at his elbow. A creature that can do anything. Make a machine, and a machine to make the machine. And evil that can run itself a thousand years. No need to tend it. You believe that? I don't know. Believe that. The hermit puts forward the idea that man is especially evil because of his capabilities for evil. You can find meanness anywhere. You can find meanness in an animal. But maliciousness and terror, that is the work of man. And that at some point, man's evil becomes self-sustaining and is a creature that we can no longer control. There's also this strange mention. Uh, so the kid goes to sleep, and then it says, 
He woke sometime in the night with the hut in almost total darkness, and the hermit bent over him and all but in his bed. What do you want, he said. But the hermit crawled away, and in the morning when he woke, the hut was empty, and he got his things and left. So, um, th this is never stated, like, why the hermit was looking over. Maybe he was just, you know, weird and staring at the kid. But the story has a lot of notions or implications of, um, what's the word? Pedophilia. Uh, <laughs> and different instances. And I think this might be one of those. It would also be fitting to the narrative of this story if someone who talked about man's capacity for evil also had a large capacity for evil. But again, this is very minor compared to what we're gonna get into. As the kid travels, he meets a band of cattlemen going to Bexar. And this is one of the only instances in the entire story where a random meeting turns out good for everyone involved. The cattlemen are kind, they help give him directions, and the next morning before he leaves, he sees that they left him some food and a knife. And while the kids made it well into Texas at this point, it's fitting that one of the only acts of goodwill in the story happens right before he begins his pilgrimage down south. So the kid makes his way to the town of Bexar. Again, he's just kind of roaming randomly right now. And whenever he gets there, there's a big dance and party going on in the street, and he makes his way into a local bar. When he gets there, the bartender only speaks Spanish, and the kid tries to explain that he wants a drink, but he doesn't have any money to pay for it. So as the barman keeps saying in Spanish that he isn't going to give him a drink for free, the kid keeps saying that he'll work for a drink. Eventually, the kid starts making sweeping motions, so the barman figures out that he wants to sweep, even though he keeps saying the room doesn't need sweeping, but the kid can't understand him. So the barman hands him a broom, and the kid just starts sweeping up around the floors, and then whenever he comes back to the barman expecting a drink, the barman won't give him one because he never agreed to it. So the kid's like, all right, I'll kill you for it. And as he starts to make his way to the barman, the barman pulls a pistol on him. But then one of the older men in the bar says something to the barman, and the barman decides that I guess this isn't worth killing the kid over. So he puts down the gun and picks up a hammer and walks around the, the bar to fight the kid with his hands. So the kid grabs a whiskey bottle breaks it over the guy's head, and it's not explicitly said that he kills him, but it says that the kid stabs him in the eye and blood spurts everywhere, and the kid steals whiskey from behind the counter and leaves. After drinking the entire bottle, he then wakes up the next day in an abandoned and run-down church. Churches come up a lot in this story, and every time they do, there's death involved. This time being the first and most minor infraction, where the kid sees buzzards eating some dead animal at the front of the building. The kid drunkenly stands up, looks around for his mule, and can't find it, so he just starts walking down the river until he runs into it. Eventually, he finds his mule, and while he's at the river, he decides to take his clothes off and take a bath. While he's naked and lying on the riverbank, an American soldier walks up to him. So while talking through the branches on the side of the river, Howdy there, said the rider. He didn't answer. He moved to the side to see better through the branches. Howdy there, where are you at? What do you want? I wanted to talk to you. What about? Well, hellfire, come on out. I'm white and Christian. <laughs> the kid reaching up through the willows, trying to get his britches. The belt was hanging down and he tugged at it, but the britches were hung on a limb. Why don't you go on and leave me the hell alone? Just wanted to talk to you. Didn't intend to get y'all riled up. You done got me riled. <laughs> I love the language. Was you the feller knocked in that mixer's head yesterday evening? I ain't the law. Who wants to know? Captain White, you wants to sign that feller up to join the army. The army? Yes, sir. What army? Company under Captain White. We gonna whip up on the Mexicans. The war's over. He says it ain't over. Where you at? Captain White and the soldier who's come to recruit the kid are the filibusters that I mentioned earlier. American soldiers who, even though the Mexican-American War was over, decided to keep fighting for purpose or just because they hated Mexico. This is expanded on whenever the kid finally puts on his clothes and they start talking. Kindly fell on hard times, ain't you, son? He said. I just ain't fell on no good ones. <laughs> I don't know if that's funny to me. You ready to go to Mexico? I ain't lost nothing down there. 
It's a chance for you to raise yourself in the world. You best make a move some way or another before you go plumb in under. What do they give you? Every man gets a horse and his ammunition. I reckon we might find some clothes in your case. I ain't got no rifle. We'll find you one. What about wages? Hellfire, son. You won't need no wages. You get to keep everything you can raise. We go into Mexico. Spoils of war. Ain't a man in the company won't come out a big landowner. How much land you own now? I don't know nothing about soldiering. The man eyed him. He took the unlit cigar from his teeth and turned his head and spat and put it back again. Where you from? He said. Tennessee. Tennessee. Well, I don't miss doubt but what you can shoot a rifle. I like that. That's good. <laughs> so the man explains to him that the purpose that a lot of them are doing it is because it's war. They're plunderers, effectively. You can steal whatever you want, like a pirate. And after hearing that he'll get money and some clothes and a horse out of it, the kid's like, sure, I'll go die to kill some Mexicans. Who cares? I mean, the kid killed someone over a bottle of whiskey and was willing to die so he wouldn't step in the mud. I don't really think he has any creed or purpose to fighting. It's just, he gets new clothes. We rarely get mentions of the story of, like I said earlier, the kid's mental state or what's going on in his head. Uh, but we get a weird mention of shame right here whenever the kid goes to meet Captain White, the one putting together the filibuster regiment. When they meet, it says, the captain nodded his head. He was looking the kid over. What happened to you? What? Say, sir, said the recruiter. Sir? I said, what happened to you? The kid looked at the man sitting next to him. He looked down at himself, and he looked at the captain again. I was fell on by robbers, he said. Robbers, said the captain. Took everything I had. Took my watch and everything. Have you got a rifle? Not no more, I ain't. Where was it you were robbed? I don't know. There wasn't no name to it. It was just a wilderness. Where were you coming from? I was coming from Naka... Naka... Naka Doches? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. How many were there? The kid stared at him. Robbers. How many robbers? Seven or eight, I reckon. I got busted in the head with a scatlin. The captain squinted one eye at him. Were they Mexicans? <laughs> this, the, the captain, as we're going to see, just has hate in his heart, not much else. But the kid looks at the rags he's wearing, the fact he has no clothes or money, and decides to lie. He doesn't just say, this is how I am, as it seems he doesn't care about anything, but he does have some sense of self-pride because he was not willing to admit that. He instead says that he was recently robbed and that's why he looks the way he does. There are brief instances of the kid's humanity or at least his relatability throughout the story and this is one of them. The captain, after talking about how fine soldiers from Tennessee are, says, the captain leaned forward. We fought for it. Lost friends and brothers down there, talking about the Mexican-American War. And then by God, if we didn't give it back, Back to a bunch of barbarians that even the most biased in their favor will admit have no least notion in God's earth of honor or justice or the meaning of Republican government. A people so cowardly, they've paid tribute a hundred years to tribes of naked savages, given up their crops and livestock. Mine shut down. Whole villages abandoned. While a heathen horde rides over the land, looting and killing with total impunity. Not a hand raised against them. What kind of people are these? The Apaches won't even shoot them. Did you know that? They kill them with rocks. The captain shook his head. He seemed made sad by what he had to tell. The captain continues later and says, What we are dealing with, he said, is a race of degenerates. A mongrel race. Little better than black people. And maybe no better. There is no government in Mexico. Hell, there is no God in Mexico. Never will be. We are dealing with a people manifestly incapable of governing themselves. And do you know what happens with people who cannot govern themselves? That's right. Others come in to govern for them. So we see here while the kid and seemingly the soldier he talked to by the river are kind of in it for the money. The first thing he incentivized him with is, oh, we're going to get to keep whatever we got in Mexico. This Captain White genuinely has a purpose to go there, even if that purpose is to just murder Mexican people. But it is a stark contrast how the kid and most characters we're going to see later in the story just operate by their own greed and ideas. The captain has a reason or a, a, a calling to what he's doing 
rather than just his temporary incentive of greed or lust. And we're going to see very shortly what this story thinks of people who have purpose and motives and emotion. <laughs> so after this, the boy goes out with two other boys from the filibuster company and the captain has given them money to get a saddle, new boots, and new clothes. After they do that, the boys spend the extra money on women and booze. But as they get to one bar, it says that an old Mennonite is sitting in the corner. He begins to speak to them. They'll stop you at the river, he says. The second corporal looks past his comrades. Are you talking to me? At the river, be told. They'll jail you to a man. Who will? The United States Army, General Worth. Hell they will. Pray that they will. He looks at his comrades. He leans towards the Mennonite. What does that mean, old man? Do you cross the river with yon filibuster armed? You'll not cross it back. Don't aim to cross it back. We go into Sonora. What's it to you, old man? The Mennonite watches the in-shadow dark before them as it is reflected to him in the mirror over the bar. He turns to them. His eyes are wet. He speaks slowly. The wrath of God lies sleeping. It was hid a million years before men were, and only men have power to wake it. Hell ain't half full. Hear me. You carry war of a madman's making onto a foreign land, you'll wake more than the dogs. So, so far we've had the preacher who says that God goes with you everywhere, like it or not. We've had the hermit who says man has infinite capacity for evil. And we have the Mennonite who says that if they journey into this southern land, they're going to wake the wrath of God. And it seems that part of that wrath was awakened that night. Because as the three boys get drunk, they get into a pointless bar fight, and one of them is killed. That morning, as the kid and the other soldier stand in front of their fallen comrade, the Mennonite walks up once again and says, There is no such joy in the tavern as upon the road there too. In other words, the death of this boy is just one of many if you continue on this path. After this, the gang of filibusters begin to travel south with the kid in their ranks. They are immediately infinitely out of their depth. Only a few days of walking, they haven't even ran into combat yet, and they're already near dehydrated and at the end of their limits. Four of them die of sickness a week in before they've came into contact with any enemy. It says that as they bury their dead and leave the bones of the food they eat behind, that a pack of coyotes has just started following them across the desert and eats and digs up whatever they leave behind. So even nature itself knows they're not capable of surviving and that they're not a threat out here. They find a small house as they're walking through the desert and they go up to it to see if they can get any supplies. And all that they find there is an old man who was hiding from them and he's like curled up on the ground babbling. It says he wets himself. And Captain White looks at him and just says he's a halfwit and to get him out of there and they just leave. The hypocrisy that's kind of mentioned in the writing of the story is that Captain White is both there to free and establish government for the people of Mexico, while also talking about how much he hates the people of Mexico. Like every interaction he has with them is, you know, half wit or saying that they're barbarians or what have you. But he also talks about how his war is justified because he's really doing it all to help them. He is not only a man of principle, but a man of intrinsically flawed principle. Which even that is rare out here, as we'll soon see. Another element of this story, whenever people talk about it as, a, you know, the great American novel, is the writing of McCarthy himself. It, it's hard to explain unless you read it, but it's almost as if the word, and I don't want to say this and sound too pretentious, but it's almost like some of the wording transcends nature in a way that gives the story a scope of something greater going on. Like, there's so many beautiful sections of the story that talk about nature, but one right here uh, that describes the environment as the this gang of filibusters make their way across the desert is a good example. They rode on and the sun in the east flushed pale streaks of light and then a deeper run of color like blood seeping up in sudden reaches, 
flaring plane-wise, and where the earth drained up into the sky at the edge of creation, the top of the sun rose out of nothing like the head of a great red phallus, until it cleared the unseen rim and sat squat and pulsing and malevolent behind them. The shadows of the smallest stones lay like pencil lines across the sand, and the shapes of the men and their mounts advanced elongate before them, like strands of the night from which they'd ridden, like tentacles to bind them to the darkness yet to come. They rode with their heads down, faceless under their hats, like an army asleep on the march. By mid-morning, another man had died, and they lifted him from the wagon where he'd stained the sacks he'd laid among, and buried him also, and rode on. There's parts of the story where it feels like I'm not reading about Earth. It feels like I'm reading about some alien world, or some description from Dante's Inferno of hell itself. Um, it, it's, it's strange how the story in your mind can contort to fit whatever McCarthy's trying to get across in almost ways that, you know, the logistics don't matter, especially with characters like the judge, which we'll talk more about later. He, he was a metamorphosis to me through the story, the way he looked, the way he behaved. It, it's so interesting how different descriptions of the same thing can make that thing morph. And it's one of the, I'll, I'll talk about this more at the end, but it's one of the reasons it would be very hard to adapt this as a film because some of the uniqueness of this story is how it lays in your mind. Uh, as with any story, the unseen element is elaborated on by you. And if you have a creative mind, some of the depictions in here are beautiful and terrifying, sometimes at the same time. Eventually, as the filibusters are riding through the desert, they see a group of Native Americans ride up on them from the plane. And the captain looks at them and says, oh, there's probably about a dozen there. We'll have some action by the end of the day, thinking this all to be a game that he's already won. And whenever the Comanches ride up, the captain and his men are hopelessly out of their depth. A legion of horribles, hundreds in number, Half naked or clad in costumes, attic or biblical or wardrobed out of a fever dream with the skins of animals and silk finery and pieces of uniform still tracked with the blood of prior owners. Coats of slain dragoons, frogged and braided cavalry jackets, one in a stovepipe hat and one with an umbrella and one in white stockings and a bloodstained wedding veil and some in headgear of crane feathers or rawhide helmets that bore the horns of bull or buffalo and one in a pigeon-tailed coat, worn backwards and otherwise naked, and one in the armor of a Spanish conquistador. The breastplate and pauldrons deeply dented with old blows of mace or saber done in another country by men whose very bones were dust, and many with their braids spliced up with their hair of other beasts till they trailed upon the ground, and their horses' ears and tails worked with bits of brightly colored cloth, and one whose horse's whole head was painted crimson red, and all the horsemen's faces gaudy and grotesque, with daubings like a company of mounted clowns, death hilarious, all howling in a barbarous tongue, and riding down upon them like a horde from a hell more horrible yet than the brimstone land of Christian reckoning, screeching and yammering and clothed in smoke like those vaporous beings in regions beyond right knowing, where the eye wonders and the lip jerks and drools. Oh my God, said the sergeant. One of the critiques I saw people talking about this story, and I guess it's people who just, you know, enter the story with bad faith or whatever. They got to like that part and they quit reading because they thought the depictions of Native Americans was, you know, incorrect or whatever. Um, just wait to see how McCarthy <laughs> describes the white men and uh, the Mexican soldiers. It's not favorable towards them either. What he's describing here isn't the difference between white man and native. It's people who are not familiar with this country, with this world they've entered into, and people who are accustomed to it. The description of the Comanches as they're wearing clothing of previous battles and the armor of a Spanish conquistador, a war, a, a turmoil that is centuries now past, yet the armor, the remnants of it are still out killing, still part of battle to this day. These are people who are bred and hungry for war against the people who do not know what war they're getting into. And because of that, rightfully so, the filibusters are slaughtered. The following paragraphs 
are long descriptions of the bodies being torn to bits, the scalps getting ripped off, the slow death and defilement of the corpses. If I recall correctly, there were 50 men who began this journey with Captain White. Uh, and at the end of this, there are eight survivors. The kid had survived because early in the battle, his horse was hit with an arrow and the horse fell. And in the dust and the kid lying on the ground, they didn't see him as the Comanches went through and slaughtered everyone. So the kid, after the battle's over, begins to stumble his way through the desert and eventually comes across another survivor, a man named Sproul. Sproul's arm is laid up in a sash because it was injured during the battle. And at one point he begins to cough up blood into his fist and the kid asks if it's from the injury and Sproul says no, it's because he has tuberculosis or the consumption as they called it and he moved out west for his health, which is grimly ironic. So standing there in the middle of the desert, Sproul's like, well, you wanna head back? And the kid says to where? And Sproul says, I don't know, Texas? They've been walking for weeks to get out this far and they have absolutely nothing out here to save them. So their best guess is to just follow the road. So the men just start walking and they come across an abandoned town that it seems was also attacked by the Comanches. Also another point to mention about McCarthy's characterization of several characters in the story is the bias McCarthy has is always the bias that the kid has within the tale. Initially he will view some characters as mysterious or righteous only for later in the story them to be described as dogmatic or evil. And that's because even though the story isn't first person through the kid's perspective, he is the vehicle that we're following. So a lot of the world as it's described is the way the kid sees it. We also learn information about peoples and groups in the story as the kid and the gang as a whole does. So as there's quotes and pages I read that have to do with terms like savages or barbarians, that is again the kid's perspective as he is introduced to this world and its effects. They get to the town and Sproul decides to hang back because his arm's injured, so the kid starts looking through the houses. As he does, he finds some food, but he also finds the charred remains of people who have been burned alive and the slaughtered remains of families. As the kid makes his way back to where Sproul was, he looks through the courtyard and the story says, when he returned to the square, Sproul was gone. All about lay in shadow. He crossed the square and mounted the stone steps to the door of the church and entered. Sproul was standing in the vestibule. Long buttresses of light fell from the high windows in the western wall. There were no pews in the church, and the stone floor was heaped with the scalped and naked and partly eaten bodies of some forty souls who barricaded themselves in this house of God against the heathen. The savages had hacked holes in the roof and shot them down from above, and the floor was littered with arrow shafts where they'd snap them off to get the clothes from the bodies. The altars had been hauled down and the tabernacle looted, and the great sleeping god of the Mexicans routed from his golden cup. The primitive painted saints in their frames hung cocked on the walls as if an earthquake had visited, and a dead Christ in a glass buyer lay broken in the chancel floor. The murdered lay in a great pool of their communal blood. It had set up into a sort of pudding crossed everywhere with the tracks of wolves or dogs, and along the edges it had dried and cracked into a burgundy ceramic. Blood lay in dark tongues on the floor, and the blood grouted the flagstones and ran in the vestibule where the stones were cut from the feet of the faithful and their fathers before them, and it had threaded its way down the steps and dripped from the stone among the dark red tracks of the scavengers. Sproul turned and looked at the kid as if he'd known his thoughts, but the kid just shook his head. Flies clambered over the peeled and wigless skulls of the dead, and flies walked on their shrunken eyeballs. Come on, said the kid. They crossed the square in the last of the light and went down the narrow street. In a doorway, a dead child with two buzzards sitting on it. Sproul shooed his good hand at the buzzards, and they batted and hissed and flapped clumsily, but they did not fly. They continue to walk through the desert. Sproul says that his arm is beginning to stink, or in other words, it's infected. 
The two of them become so thirsty that they begin to hallucinate a oasis in the middle of the desert. They eventually keep walking until they get to a road leading up a cliff face, and around the corner they see a Mexican soldier along with a company riding their way, and at the front, the leader is sitting on Captain White's horse, with Captain White nowhere to be seen. So if, you know, a Mexican soldier is riding White's horse, things aren't looking too good for White. The leader approaches the two and sees that they're thirsty and offers them a drink of water. The two drink as much as they can, hurriedly stealing it back and forth from each other. After giving them the water, the leader says, When the lambs is lost in the mountain, he said, they is cry. Sometime come the mother, sometime the wolf. He smiled at them and raised the sword and ran it back where it had come from and turned the horse smartly and trotted it through the horses behind him and the men mounted up and followed and soon all were gone. The leader delivers an ominous line about how they need to be weary of the wolves of this country. As they continue to travel through the desert, a wagon of a family of four come by and the two of them effectively hold up the wagon so they can hitch a ride to some place that is in the middle of the desert. So the two of them hop in the wagon, drink most of the family's water, and then sleep the night in the wagon in front of the family's house. The next morning, the kid wakes up to find that Sproul has died of his infection over the night. And then shortly after realizing this, the Mexican army shows up because, you know, the family whose wagon they semi-hijacked called the police. So the soldiers, knowing that this kid is one of the renegade American soldiers who came to mess with Mexico, arrest him and take him into the nearby town. In the town, there is a large parade of people dancing and merchants selling things. And as the soldiers drag the kid through the middle of this party, they throw him on the ground. And when the kid looks up, someone is holding in front of him the severed head of Captain White floating in a jar. The kid spits on the ground and says, he ain't no kin to me. And of course they would celebrate the death of these guys. They came into their country to just cause problems. When they kill the leader, they're gonna, you know, have a parade about it and I guess put his head in a jar. So that's what happens to people who set out to be pirates, but they claim to do it for their own greater purpose or because they have some greater stake or merit in the world. They die and their body is made a spectacle as those around them suffer and bleed as well. So the kid is taken to jail, and then shortly after that, he is transferred to Chihuahua City. When he gets to the Chihuahua City Jail, who else is also in that jail but his friend Toadvine? Well, I use the term friend kind of loosely. The guy that he tried to kill in a knife fight and then they burnt down a hotel together. So Toadvine's in this jail as well, and because of their brief history, the two develop a sort of camaraderie between each other. There's some brief banter between the two, uh, one of the jail keepers has gold teeth, so Toadvine keeps saying that he wants to kill him so that he can take the gold teeth. They're in a corral for a while that just has like a high wall around the corral, no fence, and these children hop up on the wall and start throwing rocks at him. So the kid just takes like a, a small stone and chucks it as hard as he can at a kid, and it says it hits the kid in the head, the kid falls over the wall, and they never hear from that kid again. So I guess, I guess the kid killed a child with a rock <laughs> who was just standing at the wall throwing pebbles at him. And then one day, as Toadvine, the kid, and another friend that they met, who is known now as the veteran, one day as they're out scrubbing the streets of the city, a group of men ride in on horseback and ride into the governor's courtyard. These men are described as absolute monsters. They're barbaric in nature. They're wearing the skins and furs of several different animals. They have knives on their hips that go down to their knee. They have every manner of firearm and bladed weapon you could imagine. Not to mention that most of these men are white, which is particularly strange considering they walked into the governor of Chihuahua City's courtyard dressed as they did with no problem. And who else is riding among them except? Foremost among them, outsized and childlike with his naked face, rode the judge. His cheeks were ruddy and he was smiling and bowing to the ladies and doffing his filthy hat. The enormous dome of his head when he bared it was blinding white and perfectly circumscribed about 
so that it looked to have been painted. He and the reeking horde of rabble with him passed on through the stunned streets and hove up before the governor's palace where their leader, a small black-haired man, clapped for entrance by kicking at the oaken door with his boots. The doors were opened forthwith and they rode in, rode in all, and the doors were closed again. This is, finally, the Glanton Gang. They are riding into Chihuahua City to deliver their payment of scalps to the governor as per their contract. Toadvine sees this and thinks this might be their ticket out. Sure enough, as they're cleaning the streets the next day, Toadvine managed to talk to a member of the Glanton Gang and gets them an in. See, the Glanton Gang constantly loses members given the nature of their capital. So because of that, they're constantly looking for new people to refill their ranks. Anyone who knows how to fight. So Glanton makes a request to the governor, and the three men, Toadvine, the kid, and the veteran, are all released into John Glanton's care. And with that, the kid, Toadvine, and the veteran are now officially, and finally for the story, members of the Glanton gang. The child who had nowhere to go, who was willing to join any tribe or people as long as it meant killing and as long as it meant money, has now found the perfect home to do just that. And it seems that by pure chance or perhaps fate, he has once again crossed paths with the judge himself. This mysterious figure who is set apart in any room that he exists in. So what does that mean for the kid? Does that mean he's finally fit in and found a place that he will exist freely? Or is this going to be a Cormac McCarthy novel? Let's find out. So the three men ride out with the Glanton gang from the town that they were once prisoners in, now hailed as heroes. Initially, we meet several of the more interesting characters in the gang. It seems to be that there's about 30 of them at this time, and while several of their names are mentioned sparsely throughout the book, I'm just going to talk about a few who are important. Because, spoilers, a lot of people die, so we're just going to be talking about the ones who actually do something. Of course, we have the Judge and Glanton, who we'll talk about more as the story goes on. But there's also members like the ex-priest Tobin, who joined the gang sometime shortly after the Mexican-American War. Despite being an ex-priest, he still holds some views of God and religion in a place of secrecy, which is very interesting as the gang's actions begin to unfold as the story goes on. There are two men in the company who are both named John Jackson. One of them is a white man and the other is a black man, so the gang refers to them as White Jackson and Black Jackson, respectively. That may be surprising to hear that this gang of headhunters in the 1850s has a black man in their ranks. But as we're going to see, the Glanton gang, save for the judge, holds no values or morals or any set of rules when it comes to the actions they commit. They are solely soldiers of fortune. There are several instances in the book where they talk about the savagery and evil of the Native American people, and then in the next chapter, ally themselves with them. There are several points in the book whenever someone in town mentions that they don't like Black Jackson being there because he's black, that the gang members will agree with them and talk about how he's the member of an inferior race, only to then turn around and murder the guy that they said that to. They hold no values or morality, at least none that they can't be bought out of. And while it may seem respectable that a gang at the time has a black man in their ranks, it is solely because Black Jackson is also a murderous killer. And that is exactly the kind of men that Clanton needs, not caring for their race, religion, or creed. The gang also has four Delaware Indians in their ranks who mostly stick to themselves and don't really interact with the rest of the gang, at least not socially. So while they are out on the plains headhunting Native Americans, there are four Native Americans in their ranks. There is a Mexican man in the company whose name is Miguel, but the Americans don't care to pronounce it correctly, so they just call him McGill. There's a scout named Webster who frequently hunts and travels out with the Delawares. There's a man named David Brown, often called Davy Brown, who has a intense propensity for violence. Uh, and seems to relish in a lot of what the gang does, more so than the other members, again, excluding the judge. And the last member that I'll mention right now is a man named Bathcat, who previously lived on the island that is today known as Tasmania, 
where he used to hunt Aboriginal people for sport and for money. So coming to the American West to hunt Native Americans is a normal day in the office for this guy. In his introduction, it mentions that he wears a necklace of human ears from people that he's killed. And several members of the gang take pieces of humans as trophies after a killing. In the description for Bathcat, there is a blink and you'll miss it line that prophesies his death. Toadvine and Bathcat are having a conversation about the two Jacksons, arguing which is going to kill the other first because the two Jacksons hate each other, probably because they're both named Jackson. While it's also mentioned later that White Jackson hates Black Jackson because he's black, but I'm sure having the same name also doesn't help. While they're discussing this, the book says, Toadvine glanced at the man's forehead, but the man's hat was pushed down almost to his eyes. The man smiled and forked the hat back slightly with his thumb. The print of the hat band lay on his forehead like a scar, but there was no mark other. Only on the inside of his lower arm was there tattooed a number, which Tovine would see in a Chihuahua bathhouse, and again when he would cut down the man's torso where it hung skewered by its heels from a tree limb in the waist of the Pimeria Alta in the fall of that year. Whenever I first read through this, I had to read over that section a few times. It's just giving normal descriptions of what the gang members look like, and then it mentions that Bathcat has a tattoo that Toadvine would see again whenever he pulled his corpse that was hung by its heels on a tree in the middle of the desert. Fate is a reoccurring topic in this story that becomes more prevalent as the story goes on. And it's interesting that even in the introduction of this character, his death is already set in stone, as if it was something that was always meant to be. So as the gang is in this small town, they're waiting for a merchant to come to sell them weapons. Whenever the merchant arrives, he hands Glanton, again the leader of the gang, a Colt revolver from a box of several Colt revolvers. In testing out the pistol, Glanton pulls back the hammer and just starts shooting animals that are around the town. He shoots a cat, and it says that the cat explodes. He shoots a chicken. He shoots a goat. And then after looking over the gun, he says, I don't think this is worth $50. So he haggles with the salesman over the price, and it seems that the murder of the animals was completely inconsequential to him or anyone else in the gang. A captain of the Mexican army walks into the center of town because, you know, these strangers are shooting guns at random things. And as soon as the Mexican captain starts talking about locking the men up, the judge jumps down from his horse and immediately starts talking to the captain in Spanish. As they're speaking in Spanish, the judge continues to shake his hand and then walks the captain through the parade of these killers and introduces all of them to the captain one by one. Come to find out later in the story, the judge speaks several languages and has been all over the world. In the story, fluently speaking Dutch, German, Spanish, and English. As the judge is walking the captain through the group of men, he talks of their bravery and how they're each respectable dignities as the men stand there with human fingers and necklaces of ears. When they get to Black Jackson, the captain remarks that it's strange having a black man in their company. So immediately, again in Spanish, the judge launches into a diatribe about how Jackson is part of an inferior race and how the whites and Mexicans are so much more prosperous and blah blah blah. And Black Jackson, who can't speak Spanish, asks the judge what he's saying and the judge effectively tells him not to worry about it. Again, the morality of the gang is whatever best suits them in the moment. As the men are about to leave the town, a family of performers comes out to ride with them. See, at the time, any area that wasn't immediately in the city or jurisdiction of a police force was effectively lawless. So if you traveled out by yourself, you were easy prey to not only the animals and elements, but also robbers and killers who may be on the path. So if you were a family traveling for anything, it would be smart to travel with a group of armed people. So, in exchange for money, because that's all they care about, Glanton allows this family of performers to join them through the desert. I'm going to mention it now because it comes up a lot and I can't stop at every instance of it. Nearly every time that they travel out into the desert, they are completely engulfed by death that lays all around them. I mentioned one instance earlier, whenever the kid and Sproul went into the destroyed village and there were all the dead bodies in the church. 
Well, that kind of thing happens constantly. Also on that journey, the kid and Sproul came across a thorn bush that was skewered with dead babies. Setting out on this journey, they find the bones of Apache families who were lined up and shot by Mexican soldiers. Every time that they journey out, there is instances of the world that they inhabit constantly reminding them of what it is. Hanged bodies swinging on the sides of road with words like murderer painted on their chest. Entire cascades of horses and merchants line the gutters of the roads, having been shot for the crime of being present. As I talk about the details of this story, just know that death surrounds every aspect of it. They sit around the fire that night, and Glanton looks at the father of the Mexican family of performers who he's allowed to come along with him. Glanton looks at the father and asks the man if he tells fortunes. The showrunner's excited and begins to get his family together so that they can perform a fortune telling. They do this by having the father hold a deck of tarot cards in front of one of the gang members. And as he does it, his wife, who's also one of the performers, sets on a log facing out into the darkness of the desert night. One of the gang members draws the card, and as they do, the woman begins to cry out into the desert to receive what the fortune of the man is. Black Jackson goes first, and he draws the card, The Fool. As the lady chanting begins to say his fortune in Spanish, Jackson begins to ask the men around the campfire what she's saying. Also, there are entire conversations in this book that are entirely in Spanish. Uh, for this book, Cormac McCarthy learned Spanish, just so he could read the records easier and also give accurate depictions of uh, Mexican speech. And also, while I'm mentioning it, McCarthy wrote this book over the course of 15 years and moved to El Paso, Texas to do so, having traced the route of the Glanton gang several times during his time writing it. Historians have read the novel and remarked that it's about as historically accurate as a book can get. Anyway, so Black Jackson is standing around the fire, and he first asks Tobin, the ex-priest, what the woman's saying. Tobin says that this is all idolatry and witchcraft, and he doesn't want to be a part of it. Eventually, the judge smiles at Jackson and says that what this woman is saying is that in Jackson's fortune lie all of theirs. And when Jackson asks what he means, the judge laughs and says that it means he's supposed to stay away from rum. The Fool's card is often associated with ignorance or new beginnings. And the implication here seems to be that Jackson is in a position to follow after whatever he chooses. He's at the start of the rest of his life. And whatever actions he does from here, moving forward, will determine his fate as well as the fate of the rest of the gang. After this, the showman then takes the deck of cards to the kid. The kid draws and receives the Four of Cups. As this is all happening and the woman's chanting and everyone's looking at the kid, he begins to get kind of scared and nervous, and he looks over at the judge, who's partially naked, by the way. He's naked from the waist up. He's just wearing his pants. So this giant seven-foot man is leaning over right next to the kid and laughing while staring at him. The kid looks around the rest of the campfire and sees that no one else is laughing and tells the showman to get away. So the showman stops. The Four of Cups is most often associated with stagnation or a lack of purpose, which is very fitting for the kid at this point. He joined the military and a group of crazed killers just because there might be some money involved, with no regard for his life or the life of others. The kid is heading down a destructive path, and it seems that from his choices, he has no concern in the matter. Finally, the showman makes his way over to Glanton, the gang's leader. Glanton's hesitant at first, but since everyone else is doing it, and since he's a little drunk, he decides to play along. After Glanton takes a card, the story says, The juggler folded shut the deck and tucked it among his clothes. He reached for the card in Glanton's hand. Perhaps he touched it, perhaps not. The card vanished. It was in Glanton's hand, and then it was not. The juggler's eyes snapped after it, where it had gone down the dark. Perhaps Glanton had seen the card's face. What could it have meant to him? The juggler reached out to that naked Belden beyond the fire's light, but in the doing, he overbalanced and fell forward against Glanton and created a moment of strange liaison with his old man's arms about the leader as if he would console him at his scrawny bosom. Glanton swore and flung him away, and at that moment, the old woman began to chant. See, up until this point, every time that someone draws a card, the showman has been reading the card out loud so that his wife can tell their fortune with it. Glanton rose. She raised her jaw, gibbering at the night. 
Shut her up, said Glanton. La Corosa, La Corosa, cried the beldam. Invertido, carta de guerra, de Fenganza, la vicin ruda sobre un rio obscuro. Glanton called to her, and she paused as if she'd heard him, but it was not so. She seemed to catch some new drift in her divinings. Perdida, perdida. La carta esta perdida en la noche. Un maleficio, cried the old woman. Que viento tan malienta. By God, you will shut up, said Glanton, drawing his revolver. Corosa de muertos, Lena de Jesus, el joven que... The judge, like a great ponderous gin, stepped through the fire and the flames, delivered him up as if he were in some way native to their element. He put his arms around Glanton. Someone snatched the old woman's blindfold from her, and she and the juggler were clouded away, and when the company turned in to sleep and the low fire was roaring in the blast like a thing alive, these four yet crouched at the edge of the firelight among their strange chattels and watched how the ragged flames fled down the wind as if sucked by some maelstrom out there in the void. Some vortex in that waste opposite to which man's transit and his reckonings alike lay abrogate. As if beyond will or fate, he and his beast and his trappings moved both in card and in substance under consignment to some third and other destiny. Glanton saw what the card was, more than likely, at least for a second, and then either hid it so that the showman couldn't see it, or threw the card away. But at the same time, the woman knew exactly what was on the card, and begins chanting about this boat of death, this ferryman of death, uh, and whatever it is she's saying, or whatever she's about to start saying, Glanton is terrified of it. He begins to draw his gun, threatening to shoot her, but the judge stops him. I could explain what this ferryman of the night might mean, but I think it will mean more if it's points revealed later in the story. So with that, the next day, the game continues on their travel. They meet up in the town with a few of the scouts who had went ahead to see what was down the trail, and the scouts... Webster and a couple of the Delawares come back with an old woman. This old woman is an old Apache woman who was left behind at an abandoned market some ways up the road. The woman is so old that she can barely walk and she trembles to herself and shakes, barely looking at the knees of the men around her. This portion's particularly graphic, but I find it important to read considering it sets the tone and several of the events that will soon follow. Glennon crossed in front of his horse, passing the reins behind his back. Watch her, Cap, she bites. She had raised her eyes to the level of his knees. Glennon pushed the horse back and took one of the heavy saddle pistols from its scabbard and cocked it. Watch yourself there. Several of the men stepped back. The woman looked up, neither courage nor heart sink in those old eyes. He pointed with his left hand, and she turned to follow his hand with her gaze and he put the pistol to her head and fired. The explosion filled all that sad little park. Some of the horses shied and stepped. A fist-sized hole erupted out of the far side of the woman's head in a great vomit of gore, and she pitched over and lay slain in her blood without remedy. Glanton had already put the pistol at half cock, and he flicked away the spent primer with his thumb and was preparing to recharge the cylinder. McGill, he said. A Mexican, solitary of his race in that company, came forward. Get that receipt for us. He took a skinny knife from his belt and stepped to where the old woman lay and took up her hair and twisted it about his wrist and passed the blade of the knife about her skull and ripped away the scalp. It says after this that no one in the company is paying any attention to what's going on, none except for the new recruits. Because this is the nature of blood money. This is the nature of what the economy for killing was at this time. Didn't matter how old or feeble they were, combatants or not, you were paid for native scalps, and it didn't matter who those scalps came off of. And everyone's okay with this, it's just the nature of their business. And if anything, an elderly woman who can't fight back is just an easy paycheck, or a receipt, as Glanton refers to her scalp. The violence continues throughout the story, and I'm not going to read every instance of it verbatim because it's a lot. Uh, there's several people who love this book, who talk about how they couldn't read it on the first set-through. Um, and it, it's certainly brutal, but I feel it is entirely not only justified, but needed. There are so many tragedies, and not just world history, but specifically American history, 
that get overridden as a statistic. We hear both in school and movies about these men of the Wild West who would hunt down the natives or they would fight back against, you know, the, the no good outlaws of the country. And we kind of just brush them off as numbers. But whenever we hear something like so many people killed in a battle or uh, scalps that were sold for cash or people hanged on the side of roads, um, I think it's important that we don't lose the brutality of that. Like McCarthy here certainly has not. This book came out in 1985 at the height of the good guy cowboy aesthetic of the West. And as kind of a counter to that, it puts a highlight on how brutal the nature of manhunting actually is. It's not heroes with swelling music and a chiseled jawline fighting back against the people who matter less than him. It is most often these monstrous, almost animalistic people who prey on the weakest targets they can find. And to emphasize the historic and thematic evil of the story, the violence matters. The performers separate from them in this next town and the men walk into a bar. While in there, an old man begins to cryptically talk about how Mexico is a dangerous country and how these men are heroes, but there is a cowboy on the plains who's looking to kill them, vaguely referring to death or the devil or some concept similar. And the entire time they're in this bar, there is a man moaning in the back of the bar, seemingly at the end of his life, just while everyone else is drinking and caring about as usual. On their way out of the bar, Toadvine and Bathcat have a short conversation. That was his son, said Bathcat. Who was? The lad in the corner cut with the knife. He was cut? One of the chaps at the table cut him. They were playing cards and one of them cut him. Why don't he leave? I asked him the same myself. What did he say? He had a question for me. Said, where would he go to? The land is so desolate that the man's son was stabbed in a card fight and is about to die, and the man just keeps running the bar, as usual. Like, what does the death matter? And even if it did, what would they do about it? Between the religious symbols, to the death that surrounds them, to the fortune teller, there are constant signs that they should stop this journey before they begin it. And the men continue to ignore these signs at every remark. Well, at least one of them picked up on all the clues the universe was laying down. Remember the veteran? The guy who joined the gang with Toadvine and the kid? Well, the next morning they wake up and he's just gone. The judge interrogates the kid and Toadvine about it, asking where the man went to, and Toadvine just says he figures the man quit and they have no idea where he went. It seems that the veteran realized that this was going to get a lot worse before it got better, so he deserted. In response to this, Glanton sends two of the Delawares to go find him. That night, the gang is setting around a couple of campfires. And it says that there's no real rules to the gang. As mentioned earlier, they don't really care about race, at least not when it comes to the members of their rank. But it seems like the men naturally segregate between the people they're most comfortable with. So that night at the fire, all of the Delawares and McGill, the Mexican I mentioned earlier, along with the new members of the gang, are by one fire and everyone else is by the other fire. Black Jackson walks up to the fire with everyone else and White Jackson stops him and says that his kind can go sit at the fire where everyone else is sitting. In other words, telling him to get over there with the natives and the Mexicans and the newcomers. In the conversation between Black Jackson and White Jackson, we have this. The white man swung his head, one eye half closed, his lip loose. His gun belt lay coiled on the ground. He reached and drew the revolver and cocked it. Four men rose and moved away. You aim to shoot me, said the black. You don't get your black ass away from this fire, I'll kill you graveyard dead. He looked to where Glanton sat. Glanton watched him. He put the pipe in his mouth and rose and took up the officiamore and folded it over his arm. Is that your final say? Final as the judgment of God. The black looked once more across the flames at Glanton, and then he moved away in the dark. The white man uncocked the revolver and placed it on the ground before him. Two of the others came back to the fire and stood uneasily. Jackson sat with his legs crossed, one hand laying in his lap, and the other was outstretched on his knee holding a slender black cigarillo. The nearest man to him was Tobin, 
and when the black stepped out of the darkness bearing the bowie knife in both hands like some instrument of ceremony, Tobin started to rise. The white man looked up drunkenly, and the black stepped forward and with a single stroke swapped off his head. Two thick ropes of dark blood and two slender rose-like snakes from the stumps of his neck and arched, hissing into the fire. The head rolled to the left and came to rest at the ex-priest's feet, where it lay with eyes aghast. Tobin jerked his foot away and rose and stepped back. The fire steamed and blackened, and a gray cloud of smoke rose, and the columnar arches of blood slowly subsided until just the neck bubbled gently like a stew, and then that too was stilled. He was set, as before, save headless, drenched in blood, the cigarillo still between his fingers, leaning toward the dark and smoking grotto in the flames where his life had gone. Glanton rose. The men moved away. No one spoke. When they set out in the dawn, the headless man was sitting like a murdered anchorite, disscaled in ashes and sark. Someone had taken his gun, but the boots stood where he'd put them. The company rode on. They had not gone forth one hour upon that plain before they were ridden upon by the Apaches. Life is so inconsequential out here that these two men, who yes, hate each other, both Jacksons, get into a simple fight where White Jackson expresses prejudice, saying that, he sh that Black Jackson should go sit with the other undesirables, as White Jackson would see them. And Black Jackson just says, is that your final say? And when White Jackson says yes, uh, Black Jackson gets a bowie knife and cuts his head off at the campfire. And everyone, other than the mention of the ex-priest jerking his foot away, has no reaction. Glandon just gets up and goes to bed, and the next day they take his gun, but they leave his headless body setting up on the log with his boots set up next to him. His death, the death of a man they've probably rode with for years at this point, is just a thing that happened, a, a coincidence, a circumstance of fate. And there's no sense crying over it, so why say anything about it? The next day, a group of Apaches ride out to fight them, and the gang dismounts their horses and begins to shoot back. In the battle, one Apache is killed and the others ride off. The judge walks up to the dead Apache and begins to disrobe him, taking his personal effects from underneath his clothes, before scalping the Apache as they do any other native they kill. It's their first sign of the judge cataloging the world and effects of others around him, and it'll come up more as the story goes on. It's also mentioned that that afternoon, the two Delawares who went out on a scouting mission come back with the veteran's horse, with the veteran nowhere to be found, most likely having been shot by the two Delawares for desertion. You can take, hurt, and kill whoever you want, but you can't leave the gang. That's the one rule that they all seem to stick to. As they continue on their journey, they come across more dead bodies, a carriage of people who had been shot to death before they whip the horses and send the carriage full of corpses to just walk out into the desert. The gang eventually comes across an old abandoned presidio. Uh, a presidio is effectively like a plantation house, not necessarily a mansion, but a large house that several people would live out of. And from inside of the presidio, they can see smoke rising. So the gang goes up to enter the compound. Whenever they come to the door and knock on it, the first thing Clanton yells is he says, Come out if you're what. <laughs> Eventually the people inside let them in, and the gang finds that these are five survivors who are near death because of their starvation and dehydration. They said that the group they were with were attacked by Apaches, and these were the only survivors who managed to take shelter in this abandoned house and they have great survival instincts as they're just letting camp smoke go up into the air for anyone around to see. The five men seem crazed and starved. The first thing they ask for instead of food is tobacco. They go inside one of the offices of the Presidio, and there is a man who is holding a wound and bleeding onto the floor of the house, seemingly having been attacked by the Apache some days earlier. Irving, the doctor in the company, walks up to him and says, what have you done for him? He said, ain't done nothing. What do you want me to do for him? I ain't asked you to do nothing. That's good, said Irving, because there ain't nothing to be done. Outside in the courtyard, there is a horse that got bitten in the face by a snake. So its entire head is swelled into this throbbing mass. And the horse is making awful noises. Like they, they should definitely put it down. So looking outside, why don't you shoot that thing, said Irving. Sooner it dies, the sooner it'll rot, they said. Irving spat. 
You aim to eat it and it snake bit? They looked at one another. They didn't know. Also inside of the Presidio is a 12 year old boy who's described as a mixed race between uh, Mexicans and a native. Uh, and it seems that he was there when the five others got there. Because whenever they ask about him, the men say that they don't know who he is. And there's this one quick interaction that didn't mean anything to me on a first read through, but means far too much to me now, where it says, who's this child, said the judge. They shrugged, they looked away. Glandon spat, shook his head. We will come back to that. Later, out in the courtyard, the judge is explaining to these five scared men how the earth works. He's explaining to them how the rocks hold the secrets of God and how the earth itself is an extension of God. And then whenever they nod like they believe him, the judge laughs at them at their foolishness and so willing to believe anything that someone who seems to be smarter than them tries to say. That night, there's a storm outside, and as all the men are inside, it says, the men who had been on watch entered the room and stood steaming before the fire. The black stood at the door neither in nor out. Someone had reported the judge naked atop the walls, immense and pale in the revelations of lightning, striding the perimeter up there and declaiming in the old epic mode. Glanton watched the fire silently, and the men composed themselves in their blankets in the drier places about the floor, and soon they were asleep. So in the middle of a storm, the judge is completely naked, on the roof, yelling old poetry. The judge, as we're gonna find out later, is one of the most terrifying characters I've ever read about, and this kind of imagery doesn't help. That next day, as the men are about to leave, they find the child dead in one of the cubicles. He was lying face down naked in one of the cubicles. Scattered on the clay were great numbers of old bones, as if he, like others before him, had stumbled upon a place where something inimical lived. The squatters crowded in and stood about the corpse in silence. Soon they were conversing senselessly about the merits and virtues of the dead boy. So something killed this child in the middle of the night, and we'll talk about what that might have been later. Whenever Glanton goes to leave, the squatters who were staying there say that they want to join him, and Glanton just ignores them and rides off. They don't have sense or a horse to ride on, so they're useless. And the men ride away as they hear the crazed inhabitants switching between cursing God and singing hymns. Later on, sitting around the camp during the day, the ex-priest, Tobin, is teaching the kid how to mend a leather strap. I want to be careful about my language here. Tobin is not a good man by any regards. None of the people in this story I would classify as good men, at least none of the main characters. Tobin is still responsible and complicit with the murder of dozens, if not hundreds of people. But he does seem to have an affinity for the kid. He looks after him, he talks to him consistently, and in this scene, he decides to give him some information about the gang. While he may be compassionate to those in his group, he's by no means a compassionate man. As the two continue to talk, while speaking of Tobin, it says, he glanced across the fire toward the judge. That great hairless thing. You wouldn't think to look at him that he could outdance the devil himself, now could you? God, the man is a dancer. You'll not take that away from him. And fiddle. He's the greatest fiddler I ever heard, and that's an end on it. The greatest. He can cut a trail, shoot a rifle, ride a horse, track a deer. He's been all over the world. Him and the governor, they set up till breakfast, and it was Paris this, and London that, and five languages. You'd have given something to have heard him. The governor's a learned man himself. But the judge... The ex priest shook his head. The judge is a mystery. This man who seems to be of so many different cultures and experienced in such education, for some reason is now roaming around the desert hunting down natives for money. While talking about godly gifts, Tobin says that God speaks in the least of creatures. He watched the kid. For let it go how it will, he said. God speaks in the least of creatures. The kid thought him to mean birds or things that crawl, but the ex-priest, watching, his head slightly cocked, said, No man is give leave of that voice. The kid spat into the fire and bent to his work. I ain't heard no voice, he said. When it stops, said Tobin, you'll know you've heard it all your life. Is that right? Aye. The kid turned the leather in his lap. The ex-priest watched him. At night, said Tobin, when the horses are grazing and the company is asleep, who hears them grazing? Don't nobody hear them if they're asleep. Aye. And if they cease their grazing, who is it that wakes? Every man. 
Aye, said the priest, every man. The kid looked up. And the judge? Does the voice speak to him? The judge, said Tobin. He didn't answer. I seen him before, said the kid, and knock Odoches. Tobin smiled. Every man in the company claims to have encountered that sooty-souled rascal in some other place. Tobin rubbed his beard on the back of his hand. He saved us all. I have to give him that. And from there, Tobin begins to tell the kid the story of how the Glanton gang met the judge in the first place. Tobin tells the kid a story about one time the Glanton gang was down to 14 men when they set out on that expedition with 38. All their gunpowder was used up and they were running scared from the pursuing natives. And then as the Glanton gang, out of gunpowder, dehydrated, are riding through the middle of the desert, Tobin says, Then about the meridian of that day we came upon the judge on his rock where in that wilderness by his single self. Aye, and there was no rock, just the one. Irving said he'd brung it with him. I said that it was a mere stone for to mark him out of nothing at all. He had with him that selfsame rifle you see him with now, all mounted in German silver, and the name that he'd give it set with silver wire under the cheek piece in Latin. Et in Arcadia he go. A reference to that lethal in it. Common enough for a man to name his gun. I've heard Sweet Lips and Heart from the Tombs and every sort of lady's name. His is the first and only ever I seen with an inscription from the classics. So the gang is riding out through the desert and then just setting on a rock in the middle of nowhere in an act that Irving says the judge must have brought the rock with him. Just setting on the rock is the judge, a seven foot tall, albino, hairless man just waiting for them to show up with a rifle slung over his back. The inscription engraved on the rifle, et in Arcadia ego, is a phrase that's used in a lot of classic poetry and stories, and it translates to, even in Arcadia, there I am. Arcadia was seen as sort of an idyllic paradise in a lot of stories, and the I referred to in that sentence is referring to death. It's an old saying that effectively means even in the best places in the world, death still exists. So on the judge's rifle is engraved the phrase, even in Arcadia, there I am. When the Glanton gang asked where he came from, he said that he was in a wagon company and just decided to start walking across the desert. So the judge says, can I ride with you guys? And gets on one of their spare horses and just begins traveling with them. The gang is still being chased by the natives. So the judge instructs them that they begin heading towards this mountain off in the distance. As they get closer to the mountain, they realize that it's not a mountain and is in fact a volcano. <laughs> As they're making their way up the mountain, the judge keeps getting off the horse and scraping up pieces of flint and metal and volcanic rock. This is again as they can look out on the horizon and see the Apache horses getting closer. Eventually, the track gets too treacherous for them to ride, so everyone's leading their horses. And as they are over these couple of days, <laughs> the judge is getting guano from bat caves and charcoal and he's burning it in an oven and no one has any clue what he's doing. Uh, Tobin also mentions that at this point Glanton was so ready to die, he didn't really care. Eventually, they make it to the top of the volcano, and as they do, they see that they are completely surrounded by the Apache, and they're probably going to die any minute now. As the men are worried about this, they look over, and the judge has dug out a little hole in the ground, and he's put all of his concoctions of charcoal and volcanic rock into the center of the hole, and he's peeing on it. And as he does, he orders the men to quick, hurriedly get over here and start peeing on the mixture as well. As the men are peeing on it, the judge gets down on the ground, half naked at this point, and begins to knead the mass of charcoal and guano and pee that people are actively peeing on him with, and he just starts to mold it until it becomes this black clay. So the judge takes this concoction and he spreads it with a knife on the hot rocks. And for an hour, as it's drying, the men are standing around watching the Apaches get closer, and the judge is sitting off to the side just drawing pictures in a notebook. And after an hour has passed, he stands up, walks over to this dried concoction, and he picks it up, and it's so dry it's almost powdery. He takes the powder, shoves it into a shotgun barrel, and fires, and sure enough, the gun goes off. The judge was making homemade gunpowder this whole time. And now, while stinking, 
he's made enough rudimentary gunpowder to supply the entire company. So he orders the men to grab the stinking gunpowder and shove their guns full, and with the balls of ammunition and the firing caps that they still have, they manage to defeat all of the Apaches, not losing another man. So this random figure in the middle of the desert leads him to a volcano where whilst <laughs> waiting to be killed, he makes gunpowder out of the rudimentary materials he can find and the gang is saved. On finishing this story, it says the ex-priest turned and looked at the kid and that was the judge and the first I ever saw him. I, he's a thing to study. The kid looked at Tobin. What's he a judge of? He said. What's he a judge of? What's he a judge of? Tobin glanced off across the fire. Ah, lad, he said. Hush now. The man will hear you. His ears like a fox. So, d just the wildest story of how the judge came into the gang's life. But not only that, whenever the kid just asks the basic question, what's he a judge of? Tobin tells him to not bring it up again. The judge is an oddity. He's this constant figure, this shape that exists with the gang through their journey. I also have to mention this now. This is jumping the gun a little bit into the analysis section at the end, but this is such a cool thing. I can't not bring it up after talking about it. So that portion I just mentioned about the judge taking them into the volcano to make gunpowder to fight back against the Apaches is a direct reference to Paradise Lost. A lot of the language of the volcano and the mountain they go to is similar to the caves and mountains that Satan and the eventual armies of hell hide out in during their war with heaven. I talked about Paradise Lost on this channel, uh, but if you haven't seen that video or aren't familiar with the work yourself, there's a portion in the story where the angels who are soon to be fallen that have allied themselves with Satan are fighting against the armies of heaven and the devil decides that they should make gunpowder. And a lot of the language and imagery between the judge taking these men up the volcano to make gunpowder is very similar and harkens back to a lot of the story's themes. McCarthy said that his two primary influences for the character of the judge was Kurtz from Heart of Darkness, which that's another great story and character if you're familiar with that, and Satan from Paradise Lost. That will become more apt as the story goes on. The next day, they are riding through the wilderness and as they are crossing over a fallen down tree, one of the Delawares jumps over the tree on his horse. And as soon as he does, a grizzly bear rises from right next to him. It had been eating a dead animal. And it growls and picks up the Delaware with its teeth. It just grabs him. The Delaware starts screaming. And the bear runs off. And they never see that guy again. Straight up. They're just going through the woods. A bear grabs a guy disappears. It says that the other Delawares go to track him and they come back empty handed. Just in the midst of everything, a bear eats a dude. It says when the other Delawares get back that they sparse out his belongings between them and the man's name was never spoken again. Perhaps some of my favorite interactions in the entire story are between the judge and the Glanton gang sitting around the campfire, especially one near the end that we'll get to. The scout I mentioned earlier, Webster, is standing by the campfire and he's watching the judge scribble drawings in his book. Webster asks the judge why he's drawing pictures in the book and the judge says that it's to catalog all of the earth and everything in it. Webster says that it's impossible to draw everything in the world and the judge smiles and says, well said, and keeps drawing. Webster then follows up and says, but don't draw a picture of me in that book of yours. As he says this, other people around the campfire begin to hoot and holler, saying, why do you care if the judge puts your ugly mug in his book? Why do you want to put it in there anyway? And the judge defends him and says, no, no, it's because Webster here doesn't want to be chronicled. He doesn't want to be perceived as a certain thing in the eyes of man that may come after him. He doesn't want his image to be whatever I decide it should be. After he finishes, Webster says, it ain't like that. And the judge says, well, good. You won't mind if I draw your picture then. And Webster says, no, I don't want you to draw it, but it ain't like that. There's this weird command the judge has over the emotions and the beliefs of the people around him. Where they're setting at this moment is in the ruins of the Anasazi. Whenever white settlers first came to this area of Mexico, they saw these old stone houses built into the faces of cliffs, and they assumed that they were built by the current native population. It turned out that these were actually bitten by a group of people known as the Anasazi. 
The Anasazi disappeared for some unknown reason, and the modern natives that are simply living in the structures that they built have no idea what happened to them. As the men are there discussing this, discussing who might have made these houses, the judge begins to tell a story. One of my personal favorite things in media, I guess I'm, an, I'm such a nerd, <laughs> one of my favorite things in stories is whenever the story stops for a moment to tell another story. Uh, most of the time they're very, you know, short and interesting, I find. And the judge tells a story here to this group of men that I feel is uh, worth repeating. So with that, this is the judge's story. In the western country of the Alleghenies, some years ago, when it was yet a wilderness, there was a man who kept a harness shop by the side of the federal road. He did so because it was his trade, and yet he did little of it, for there were few travelers in that place. So that he fell into the habit before long of dressing himself as an Indian, and taking up station a few miles above his shop, and waiting there by the roadside to ask whoever should come that way if they should give him money. At this time, he had done no person any injury. So a harness maker in the middle of the wilderness isn't making that much money, shocker, so he decides to dress himself as a native and go beg for money up the road. One day, a certain man came by and the harness maker in his beads and feathers stepped from behind his tree and asked this certain man for some coins. He was a young man and he refused and having recognized the harness maker for a white man, spoke to him in a way that made the harness maker ashamed so that he invited the young man to come to his dwelling a few miles distant on the road. This traveler rebukes the harness maker and he feels so bad about it that he invites the traveler into his home. While in the harness maker's house, the traveler begins to talk of virtue and of good ethics and decides to give the harness maker a gold coin. After receiving the coin, the harness maker immediately asks if he could have another, or perhaps some more after that. Immediately, the traveler jumps up and begins to berate and yell at the harness maker, saying that he is unjust and not right with God and a greedy man. He says this to the harness maker in front of his family as well. With this, the old man repented all over again and swore that the boy was right, and the old woman who was seated by the fire was amazed at all she had heard, and when the guest announced that the time had come for his departure, she had tears in her eyes, and the little girl came out from behind the bed and clung to his clothes. The old man, the harness maker, so thankful to have received this advice from the traveler, asked the traveler if he can accompany him to the fork in the road, and the traveler agrees. As they walked out, they spoke of life in such a wild place, where such people as you saw, you saw but once and never again. And by and by they came to the fork in the road, and here, the traveler told the old man that he had come with him far enough, and he thanked him, and they took their departure each of the other, and the stranger went on his way. But the harness maker seemed unable to suffer the loss of his company, and he called, and by they came to a place where the road was darkened in a deep wood, and in this place the old man killed the traveler. He killed him with a rock, and he took his clothes, and he took his watch and his money, and he buried him in a shallow grave by the side of the road. Then he went home. On the way, he tore his own clothes and bloodied himself with a flint, and he told his wife they had been set upon by robbers, and the young traveler murdered and him only escaped. She began to cry, and after a while, she made him take her to the place, and she took wild primrose, which grew in plenty thereabout, and she put it on the stones, and she came there many times until she was old. Perhaps because he was ashamed of the traveler, or perhaps because the traveler was such a better man than him, or maybe similar to the way Webster didn't want the judge to write a picture of him in his book, the traveler perceived the harness maker for what he was, and the harness maker wouldn't stand for it. So he kills the traveler and lies to his family, saying that they were set upon by robbers. The harness maker lived until his son was grown, and never did anyone harm again. As he lay dying, he called the son to him and told him what he had done. And the son said that he forgave him if it was his to do so, and the old man said that it was his to do so, and then he died. But the boy was not sorry, for he was jealous of the dead man. And before he went away, he visited that place and cast away the rocks and dug up the bones and scattered them in the forest, and then he went away. He went away to the west, and he himself became a killer of men. So the child who all his life has grown up with the legend that this traveler was a man who was set upon by robbers, now hears at his father's deathbed that his father was the reason this righteous man died. And in response to that, the kid becomes furious. It says he's jealous of the traveler. Maybe the traveler's reputation, or maybe because of his 
father's attention of him, or who knows. But for some reason of the other, the kid despises this so much that he goes and he throws apart his bones and becomes a killer of men. It says after this, the old woman goes out and regathers the traveler's bones and places them all back in the grave and continues to watch over his final resting place. Uh, it's out of my scope to talk about. There's entire college lectures on this book, by the way, that go into different subjects I'm not even going to touch on in this video. Uh, it's a very deep book. It, it's an intensive book with a lot of its imagery. Um, but there is something to be said about how women are portrayed compared to men. Nearly every man in the story, except for maybe the cow, the, uh, the herders at the beginning, uh, and the Mexican general who gave uh, the kid water whenever they, he was running from the filibuster army, other than them, every man in the story is barbaric or monstrous in some way. But to that degree, every woman is heartfelt and compassionate. Um, perhaps McCarthy's saying something about the, the counter to man's anger, to man's hatred, is the spirit of womanhood. Uh, perhaps it is showing what man is capable of, if not indebted and baptized in the war and blood around them. Who knows? But it does go to mention that every woman in this story seems to be saintly in nature, as seen by even the woman in the judge's story who regathers the bones and takes care of the grave. At the ending of the story, people begin to protest, saying, no, I've heard that story, you got this detail wrong. And no, he wasn't from here, he was actually from here, and blah blah blah. Upon hearing this story, and that everyone is familiar with it, and that this is a story that has stood the test of time, the judge stops everyone. And he says, wait now, he said for there's a rider to the tale. There was a young bride waiting for the traveler with whose bones we are acquainted, and she bore a child in her womb that was the traveler's son. Now this son, whose father's existence in this world is historical and speculative, even before the son has entered it, is in a bad way. All his life he carries before him the idol of a perfection to which he can never attain. The father dead has euchred the son out of his patrimony, for it is the death of the father to which the son is entitled and to which he is heir, more so than his goods. He will not hear of the small, mean ways that tempered the man in life. He will not see him struggling in follies of his own devising. No. The world which he inherits bears him false witness. He is broken before a frozen god, and he will never find his way. He's saying, this story you're all familiar with. Sure, some of the details are different, but you've all heard of it. Now imagine being the son of the traveler. Your entire life, you have the idol of a father you never knew, who everyone tells you, every legend you hear is of the kindness and compassion of your father. But that son, who he, the judge says, is owed the death of his own father. He is heir to it more so than his goods. To see the legacy which came before you. The son is blasphemed with that legacy because he never knew a father in the way most boys would. He never saw how he failed or his shortcomings. He never got to see that his father was human too. And because of that, it says he stands before a frozen God. He constantly has to live up to this expectation of a perfect father who he will never hear as anything other than perfect. And that is in a bad way. The judge then continues explaining why he told this story in the first place. What is true of one man, said the judge, is true of many. The people who once lived here are called the Anasazi, the old ones. They quit these parts, routed by drought or disease or by wandering bands of marauders, quit these parts ages since, and of them there is no memory. They are rumors and ghosts in this land, and they are much revered. The tools, the art, the building, these things stand in judgment on the latter races. Yet there is nothing for them to grapple with. The old ones are gone like phantoms, and the savages wander these canyons to the sound of an ancient laughter. In their crude huts they crouch in darkness and listen to the fear seeping out of the rock. All progressions from a higher to a lower order are marked by ruins and mystery and a residue of nameless rage. So, here are the dead fathers. Their spirit is entombed in the stone. It lies upon the land with the same weight and the same ubiquity. For whoever makes a shelter of reeds and hides has joined his spirit to the common destiny of creatures, and he will subside back into the primal mud with scarcely a cry. But who builds in stone 
seeks to alter the structure of the universe. And so it was with these masons, however primitive, their works may seem to us. The judge says that the people of this country, the modern land, not just the natives, but he's also speaking of the, the Mexicans and the white settlers, especially the white among them in Mexico now. He's saying that all of them are the son of the traveler. They all have these, the, the frozen God, as he describes them, dead fathers to look back on, who built I, these creatures, these statues and monuments out of stone and marble, and here they are building huts out of mud. And if those previous people who walked before you, if they built mountains and idols to God, and you build with twigs, and they didn't make it, and somehow you hope to make it, of what hope does humanity have? It goes to speak of a lot of themes of this story, that despite the superiority that the gang has because they have equipment and guns and food, they are just children toiling at the feet of a dead father. Think back to stories of Europeans during the Dark Ages who built houses out of straw and stone. Imagine them stepping into the ruins of Rome and Greece, just worms before the feet of a dead god, and then as a worm trying to survive and make something of yourself to see that even they fell. What must that have felt like? The gang hears all of this and everyone's quiet for a minute, thinking on what the judge has said, until finally Tobin speaks up. It strikes me, he said, that either son is equal in the way of disadvantage. So what is the way of raising a child? Because the son of the harvest maker became a better outlaw, and the son of the traveler, while not explicitly said, is also bitter and will probably lead a life of violence. At a young age, said the judge, they should be put in a pit with wild dogs. They should be set to puzzle out from their proper clues the one of three doors that does not harbor wild lions. They should be made to run naked in the desert until... Now, hold on now, said Tobin. The question was put in all earnestness. And the answer, said the judge. If God meant to interfere in the degeneracy of mankind, would he not have done so by now? Wolves cull themselves. Man, what other creature could? And is the race of man not more predacious yet? The way of the world is to bloom and to flower and die, but in the affairs of men there is no waning, and the noon of his expression signals the onset of night. His spirit is exhausted at the peak of its achievement. His meridian is at once his darkening and the evening of his day. He loves games, let him play for stakes. This you see here, these ruins wandered at by tribes of savages. Do you not think that this will be again? Aye, and again, with other people, with other sons. The judge is saying that everyone is doomed. Every son who is born from here on out, every son that has been, is set to flounder in the monuments before them. That everything that came before is so great, how can one person amass to anything in this world? That's why it says the only way to raise a child is to throw it to the dogs, to make it fight with lions, so that through sheer determination and matter of will, he can become an instrument of something greater than himself. Through trial, he can become a tool, something that matters. And what's interesting about this story that I didn't pick up on the first read is obviously the judge is very harsh here in his depiction of, you know, how children should be. But then it occurred to me that what the judge is describing here is nearly the kid. The kid, like while he was raised debatably by his father until he was 14, ever since then his life has been defined by violence and hate and murder. And perhaps it seems the judge's ideal person, ideal of what a son should be, is what the kid already is. The next day, the gang, this band of dead sons, begins to march off and they enter an abandoned Apache village. When they get there, Glanton finds an abandoned dog. So Glanton manages to feed it with a piece of jerky, and for the rest of the story, Glanton keeps this dog at his side. Now, it's up to you if this means that Glanton is an animal lover and shows compassion for animals, or if he just shows compassion for things that will do what he says. I'm more inclined to believe the latter. As they realize they're getting closer to the Apache camp, they begin to move at night so that they won't be seen. Until finally, one night, they come across an entire Apache village 
full of nearly a thousand people, men, women, and children alike. So, in a scene that is probably the most brutal in the entire book, at least through its descriptions, I am not going to read the entire thing here, but I'll give you a short description. The Glanton gang encircles the village at night and begins riding in at all directions. To save ammo, they use clubs and begin to beat people on the outskirts of the village by riding by them and swinging their heavy mallets into their face. Once they get to the village, they begin to run the horses through the street as fast as they can, Glandon's horse specifically stepping on several women and children, murdering them as it gallops through the middle of the town. People on fire begin to pour out of the burning houses, and children as young as infants are brutally slaughtered. Most of the warriors had left the village at this point, which is what caused Glanton's gang to attack in this moment. But a few of them run out of the houses with lances and arrows and try to fight back, but it's of little use. In the night, several people tried to escape down the shoreline of a lake until Glanton's men began to ride in between them, picking them off one by one. It says whenever the sun starts to rise that the entire village and the waters in front of it are bathed in red. Hundreds and hundreds of dead strewn between the burning houses and the shallow waters. Several of Glanton's men are trotting through the water using clubs to kill anyone who still might be drowning. All the while, taking as many scalps as they can. Glenn is mentioned as having a handful of heads in his hand that is tied up with the hair, with him clutching a fist of hair, jingling them like they're some sort of instrument walking through the street. And in his other hand, he has a spear with the head of the tribal leader, who he believes is a man named Gomez. Gomez was a leader of the Apaches, and there was a specifically high price for his head to be brought in. So stepping over the burning bodies of the children they killed and the noises and smells being described as he breaks bones as he's walking across them, he makes his way over to the judge and gesturing towards the head on a stake says, hey, does this look like Gomez to you? The judge shook his head. It's not Gomez. He nodded toward the thing. That gentleman is Sangre Puro. Gomez is Mexican. He ain't all Mexican. You can't be all Mexican. It's like being all mongrel. But that's not Gomez, because I've seen Gomez, and it's not him. Will it pass for him? No. Glennon looked toward the south. He looked down at the judge. You ain't seen my dog, have you? There is something about that moment that hit me like a truck the first time I read through it. The description in the pages before is brutal with, like I said, the blood and sounds and descriptions of the dead. It, it is stomach churning, even for someone who's used to disturbing content. Um, and you're, you're just sick reading about it. And then you have him trying to figure out if he can get extra money out of this head. And then with concern, he goes, have you seen my dog? Like just such a, a, a detachment from anything resembling humanity, from any form that could be mustered of compassion or sympathy. It's just animalistic. Like the dog is his, so it matters. But the dead bodies he's standing on top of, are worth nothing more than the scalps on their heads. Also in the midst of this, McGill, or his real name Miguel, the one Mexican in the group, steps out of a house with a lance through his stomach, slowly bleeding out. The kid, who hasn't really been mentioned in this altercation up until this point, starts to step forward to help Miguel, but then Glanton comes up behind him and tells the kid, stop, step away from him. And then whenever the kid steps away, Glanton pulls a gun, shoots Miguel, and then as soon as Miguel's on the ground, he scalps Miguel and keeps his scalp. Miguel was a guy who rode for him in a while, and the kid tried to show compassion, which was immediately shut down by Clanton. And hey, Miguel's Mexican, right? So they could probably sell his scalp as one of the natives, because, you know, how's the Mexican government going to tell the difference? No honor among thieves to the point that your scalp can still be used for profit if possible. As they're leaving the Apache village, because they know that the Apache warriors will show up soon, they are also stealing all of their cattle. So as they're herding the cattle away from the village, it says that Glanton's dog comes up, and Glanton gently takes the dog and sets it on the pommel of his saddle. Because, again, he cares about this dog, as opposed to the several human heads and scalps that are riding on the back of the horse. And it's also mentioned, as they're leaving the village, that the judge has a small native boy sitting on his lap at the front of the saddle. 
alive, a living child, sitting at the front of his saddle. That night, while sitting around the camp, David Brown has an arrow where the top of the head is peeking through the other side of his thigh. So, Brown needs someone to push the arrow the rest of the way through so that they can cut off the head and pull it out. After several people say they're not going to help him, eventually, the kid decides to do so. So, David bites down on a belt, the kid pushes the arrow through, and then they chop it in half and pull out the shaft. When the kid returned to his own blanket, the ex-priest leaned to him and hissed at his ear. Fool, he said. God will not love you forever. The kid turned to look at him. Don't you know he'd have took you with him? He'd have took you, boy, like a bride to the altar. Tobin is highlighting the depravity of these men. If the kid had messed up and cut an artery or done anything to kill David on accident, David would have killed the boy, no question. Took him like a bride to the altar, as Tobin says. That's why no one else wanted to help David. They knew that if they did something wrong, David would probably kill him for it. And this is just the code among these men. I have got to take off this jacket. It is way too hot in here. Did I break the screen? No, we're good, okay. Do I need to up the cowboy aesthetic? I've got this if we need it. Let me dare to put this on camera. I don't know how I feel about it. We'll leave it on for a bit, why not? Remember that kid, this is so weird. Remember that kid that the judge took with him, uh, took them out of the Apache village? Well, that kid has been with the boys for the past few nights. And then one morning, Toadvine wakes up and the kid is sitting on the judge's lap and he's bouncing it up and down. And Toadvine walks away and 10 minutes later he walks back and the judge has killed the kid and is now scalping it. Toadvine, angered by this, pulls a gun and puts it to the judge's head. The judge says, you either shoot or take that away. You do it now. And Toadvine, not willing to kill him, decocks the revolver and reholsters it. It's bizarre on both ends. Why would the judge keep this child for a few days just to then kill and scalp it like the rest, especially playing with it among the group? It says that they played games with it and would feed him jerky. And we'll talk about why that might be later, but also, it's a little weird if you think about it for Toadvine. Like, the reason Toadvine put the gun to the judge's head is because they had cared for this kid for a few days, right? But they had just massacred about a thousand Apaches, and now Toadvine's threatening to kill the judge over this one? It's strange how these moral instances arise in the gang. How people so godless and without creed are willing to pick up arms over seemingly trivial actions. And I do agree that it is more sinister to keep the kid and then lull it into a sense of security for a few days and then kill it. But even then, in a strange way, it makes Toadvine a sort of hypocrite. Around this time, the gang begins to be chased by a group of Apaches. As they're running from them, the gang begins to run through small villages and haciendas to lose the Apaches in the ensuing slaughter. They ride in front of houses where men come out to greet them only to immediately be murdered by the Apaches right behind them. Eventually, it works, and on July the 21st of 1849, the gang makes it back to Chihuahua City. They receive a hero's welcome. Women come out and throw roses at them, and men and merchants begin to throw them goods and gold. Because to the people, these are seen as the heroes. They are ridding the land of the evil people who seek to harm them whenever they step out of the city's gates. And it's bizarre to see this band of child murderers praised by the women as these heroic knights. They make it to the governor's courtyard and count up 128 scalps and eight heads. Or in other words, a lot of money. After this, the men are promised that they'll be paid at dinner and they all go to the public bathhouse where they just destroy the water with all the caked gunpowder and blood and soot and dirt that's laid all over their skin. As they leave the bathhouse, they see that the scalps they had gathered now hang as banisters in front of the Capitol building. That felt too strange looking into the camera view over and over and seeing that hat on my head. We're back to this for now. That night at the dinner, Glennon is told that his men can sit at a different table while Glennon comes and dines with the governor. And Glennon refuses, saying he's not eating without his gang. While they're eating at the dinner table, the governor is giving some speech of bravery and camaraderie and the spirit of the Mexican government. And as he's giving the speech, the merchant comes in, or I guess the scalp dealer, who has the money for their scalps. And as soon as he hands the bag of gold and silver to Glanton, 
Blanton immediately quits caring about what the governor's talking about, and he throws the bag of money down on the dinner table, and using a knife, he separates each man his shares, and then they just get up and leave. They were only sitting around entertaining the governor for as long as there was food, and they hadn't been paid. And as soon as they do get paid, uh, they turn the entire city into a giant brothel. They go to the governor's house and take all his expensive furniture and throw it into a big bonfire. They go to all the random houses and bars and just start stealing alcohol and women. They'd walk out into the night drunk and just start shooting bullets into the sky. These scenes and scenes like them were repeated night after night. The citizenry made address to the governor, but he was much like the sorcerer's apprentice who could indeed provoke the imp to do his will, but could in no way make him cease again. The baths had become bordellos, the attendants driven off. The white stone fountain in the plaza was filled at night with naked and drunken men. Cantinas were evacuated as if by fire with the appearance of any two of the company, and the Americans found themselves in ghost taverns with drinks on tables and cigars still burning in the clay ashtrays. Horses were ridden indoors and out, and as the gold began to dwindle away, Shopkeepers found themselves presented with debits scrawled on butcher paper in a foreign language for whole shells of goods. Stores began to close. Charcoal scrawls appeared on the lime-washed walls. Mejor los indios. The evening street stood empty and there was no pesos and the young girls of the city were boarded up and seen no more. So they're just a terror. As soon as they get their money, they become these debaucherous lunatics. I mean, they always were, but now they have money to actually act on it. They ride to another town and are once again greeted by a hero's welcome, and then it says three days later they leave and everyone's excited that they're gone. <laughs> There's also mentions that they find these random groups of native people just by themselves defenseless, and as always, they slaughter them, take their scalps, and then sell them at the next town they ride into. Eventually, they make it to the town of Nakori, a small stowaway town that has a cantina. So the men go in to get drunk, and as soon as they sit down at the cantina, someone at a table next to theirs says something offensive, probably a reference to them being white and this far into Mexico. As soon as that table says something to them, the kid stands up, walks over to the table, and it says that he speaks in his, quote, wretched Spanish. He's trying to find out which of these drunk men said anything about him and his gang, but as they're talking, a funeral passes the street in front of the cantina. This funeral party that's walking through the center of town has a juggler at the front of it who is lighting rockets and performing tricks. It says that as the juggler passes the section of the street that has the gang's horses and the local Mexican's horses, that the Mexican's horses are freaked out by the explosions, but the gang's horses don't move, which is a sign of things to come, because those horses have heard their fair share of gunshots. And if the people in the cantina saw it, maybe they wouldn't have started a fight. Instead, at the sound of explosions, everyone goes out front to check. John Dorsey and Henderson Smith, two boys from Missouri, were the first into the street. They were followed by Charlie Brown and the judge. The judge could see over their heads and he raised one hand to those behind him. The buyer was just passing. The fiddler and the cornetist were making little bows to each other and their steps suggested the martial style of the air they played. It's a funeral, said the judge. As he spoke, the drunk with the knife, now reeling in the doorway, this is the man who insulted them whenever they walked in, now reeling in the doorway, sank the blade deep into the back of a man named Grimley. None saw it but the judge. Grimley put a hand on the rough wood frame of the door. I'm killed, he said. The judge drew his belt pistol and leveled it above the heads of the men and shot the drunk through the middle of the forehead. Immediately, the cantina turns into a bloodbath. All that the gang sees is that the judge shot someone, so they figure he had a reason for it, and all that the Mexicans see is that the judge shot someone. So immediately, both sides just start shooting each other. From inside came the uninterrupted sounds of gunfire, and the doorframe was filling up with smoke. In the middle of the gunfight, it says, the survivors were making for the daylight in the doorway, and the first of these encountered the judge there and cut at him with his knife. But the judge was like a cat, and he sidestepped the man, seized his arm, and broke it, and picked the man up by his head. He put him against the wall and smiled at him, 
but the man had begun to bleed from the ears and the blood was running down between the judge's fingers and over his hands and when the judge turned him loose, there was something wrong with his head and he slid to the floor and did not get up. Middle of a gunfight, knives and bullets flying everywhere, the judge grabs a man by his head, picks him up on the wall, and crushes his skull with his bare hand. Again, this guy is a monster among monsters. It says when the dust settles, the kid and Toadvine are in the center of the room back to back with their pistols in hand, smoking barrels, as they've been shooting at everyone who runs up at the windows. So now they have a problem. They are effectively contracted by the state of Mexico to save Mexican people from the natives. And now they just killed a whole lot of Mexicans. So that means they can't leave any witnesses of this. Three men were running down the street to leave town, so the gang grabs their rifles and gun them down as they're trying to escape. As they're standing there amongst all the dead, none of them having been killed except for Grimley, who was stabbed in the back at the beginning of this and is now bleeding out. As they're standing there among the dead, Glannon thinks to himself what you guys have probably figured out at this point. There's not really a way for the Mexican government to tell what's a native scalp and what's a Mexican scalp. So as they're standing there among 36 dead Mexicans, he looks at the boys and says, Hair boys, the string ain't run on this trade yet. So they just go about scalping everybody. It says in 10 minutes they scalp all 36 men and begin to make their way up out of the town. 30 minutes later, it says the people of the town begin to make their way to the cantina to care for the wounded, but at this point, the damage has already been done. And as a matter of fact, why stop there? The next day, they ride on another defenseless village and decide, hey, these are just a bunch of scalps ripe for the taking. So they go through this Mexican village and just start killing everyone. They run over them with their horses like they did to the native village. And it says that all the people in the town who are defenseless go to a church's altar and begin to pray. So the gang members walk up behind them and just start dragging them away from the altar one by one and begin to scalp them while they're still alive right there at the pulpit. Eventually, they're walking through another town, this one a bit too big to cause a fuss, but as they do, they are approached by a troop of Mexican soldiers who have likely heard word of their actions at this point. So, upon seeing the soldiers, before even seeing if the soldiers have anything to do with them or if they even know to be on the lookout for the Glanton gang, Glanton just pulls a rifle and shoots the commander. <laughs> and immediately the street erupts into gunfire. It's a shootout between the Mexican soldiers and the gang. And while the gang managed to wipe out most of the soldiers, a few of them got away and started running down the street towards Chihuahua City. At this point, they're about four days out from the city, and the Mexican soldiers have about half a day's lead on them. So over several days, they just continue to chase down these soldiers so that they can't get back to the capital and tell the governor what the Glanton gang is doing. Because, you know, this massacre that happened out in the small town takes a while to get back to the head office. Eventually, only a couple hours outside of the gates of Chihuahua City, the gang catches up to him and guns the soldiers down. They quickly dig a ditch and put their bodies in it, of course, after scalping them, and then stamp on the ground with the horses to make it look like it's nothing suspicious. And then, immediately after, they ride in Chihuahua City and sell the scalps of the Mexican villages they had slaughtered, as well as the soldiers that they had just slaughtered outside of the gates. They entered the city haggard and filthy and reeking with the blood of the citizenry for whose protection they had contracted. The scalps of the slain villagers were strung from the windows of the governor's house, and the partisans were paid out of the all but exhausted coffers, and the sociedad was disbanded and the bounty rescinded. Within a week of their quitting the city, there would be a price of 8,000 pesos posted for Glanton's head. They rode out on the north road as would parties bound for El Paso, but before they were even quite out of the sight of the city, they had turned their tragic mounts to the west and they rode infatuate and half on towards the red demise of the day, toward the evening lands and the distant pandemonium of the sun. So they make their way into the city, sell Mexican scalps to the Mexican government, who are none the wiser, and then it says a week later there is a bounty for 8,000 pesos on Glanton's head. So for a while, they just make their way to these small towns who don't have words that, you know, they're murderers yet. Well, they've always been murderers, but now they're murderers of Mexicans, so the government cares. These small towns don't have word of that, so they just go to these small towns and take their bounty 
and sell it on, again, women and booze until they terrorize the town so much they have to leave and they just keep doing that. In one of these towns, it says while the judge finds a fiddler and begins to dance in the street, the men just start pulling out their guns and shooting pictures of Christ, Jesus Christ and Mary that are along the streets. So a priest walks out holding up a crucifix uh, to ward them off because he rightfully thinks they're the devil, so they just beat him half to death in the street. There's this interesting moment whenever the priest stands up. Uh, it says that whenever he was on the ground, the men were throwing gold coins at him mockingly. Uh, and then whenever the priest stands up, these young boys run out from the street and start to pick up the coins. And the priest stops them and says, bring the coins to me. And on hearing this, the gang begins to cheer and have a toast to him. Again, there are these constant defamations and blasphemies of both churches and images of God throughout the story. The next day was the Feast of Las Animas. And as opposed to a lot of the cities they were in, this town actually observed it. So they began to have their feast and their traditions to respect Christ. As they do this, it says, the judge sat alone in the cantina. He also watched the rain, his eyes small and his great and naked face. He'd filled his pockets with little candy death sheds. And he sat by the door and offered these to children passing on the walk under the eaves, but they shied away like little horses. Shortly after this, it says, by noon the day following, Glanton in his drunkenness was taken with a kind of fit, and he lurched crazed and disheveled into the little courtyard and began to open fire with his pistols. In the afternoon, he lay bound to his bed like a madman, while the judge sat with him and cooled his brow with rags of water and spoke to him in a low voice. Outside, voices called across the steep hillsides. A little girl was missing, and parties of citizens had turned out to search the mine shafts. After a while, Glanton slept, and the judge rose and went out. Keep that mention in mind for later. As the judge walks out in the street, a young boy standing by the bridge is holding two puppies that he's trying to sell. The boy's trying to sell the dogs, so the judge reaches into his pocket and pulls out a gold coin that the story says is worth a bushel of these dogs. So he gives the boy the golden coin, and the judge takes the two puppies into his hand and smiles at the boy and walks over to the bridge and throws the puppies into a river. As he does that, Bathcat is standing underneath the bridge, peeing into it, and whenever he sees the puppies flying to the river, he pulls his gun and shoots them as they're floating down the water. If this is done out of mercy or out of meanness, the story never says. But what is apparent is it seems while the judge gave far too much money for these two puppies, it was well worth it to him to be able to extinguish a life that wasn't his own. In the meantime, Glanton, who's stumbling drunk out of bed and seemingly has no purpose in his life now that he can't kill people for money because good luck finding a local governor's house that he can sell the scalps at, he just decides to start a problem. He cuts down a Mexican flag and ties it to the tail of a mule and just starts walking the mule down the street for fun, thinking it's funny to, you know, drag the flag across the dirt. Eventually, someone gets tired of this, and as Glanton rounds a corner, someone pulls a gun and fires at him. Immediately, Glanton fires back, and it erupts into a gunfight with all of the gang showing up to just start shooting at random people in this Mexican town. Eventually, the gang realizes they're outgunned, and they all mount their horses and ride out of the city, leaving six of their dead and wounded behind. After they get out of the town, a couple of gang members who were held up join up with the gang, and say that the locals were taking their wounded, uh, the Glanton gang's wounded, and they dragged them into the street, and the priest baptized them before a soldier executed them. Which, the baptism before death is much more mercy that the Mexicans are giving to the Glanton gang than the Glanton gang are giving to the Mexicans. So they continue on their journey, and they get to this section where it is a switchback on the side of a cliff face, or in other words, like... The mountain does this. And it's a very narrow walkway because this is a path to a mercury mine at the base of the mountain. So as the Glanton gang begins to walk on it, there are several mine workers who are whipping mules up the cliff face as they have bags of mercury saddled over them. So the Glanton gang just ignores them and Glanton at the front just pushes through this group of mules and is so close to several of the mules that the mules are about to step over the cliff face. And eventually, Glanton steps by one of the riders, uh, or one of the people who are ushering the mules up these hills, and the man begins to yell at Glanton. Glanton pays him no mind, and after Glanton passed, 
the man pulls out a gun. So immediately on seeing this with no hesitation, David Brown just pulls his own gun and shoots the worker. And at the gunfire, every member of the gang just starts slaughtering the mules and the people working them. The novel describes this as bad luck on behalf of the mine workers. They just so happen to run into the Glanton gang, which of course surely meant death. It talks about the mules falling over the cliff face hundreds of feet screaming only to explode in a pop of silver and red. A scene that isn't really explained is when they get to the base of the mountain that night, uh, the judge points out that Black Jackson's missing. So the judge and a couple of the Delawares go to find him and they bring him back. But it says when they bring him back, they had the black with him. He was naked save for a blanket he'd wrapped himself in. He didn't even have boots. He was riding one of the bone-tailed pack mules from the conductor and he was shivering with cold. The only thing he'd saved was his pistol. He was holding it against his chest under the blanket for he had no other place to carry it. So perhaps Jackson tried to defect. So whenever the judge found him, he shamed him by making him strip naked to ride back into camp. Or maybe he lost his clothes or got separated. I don't know. Make of that interaction what you will. Knowing what we know about the judge later in the story, I'm kind of inclined to believe it was a type of shaming. So as the gang, especially Glanton, is kind of at a breaking point, uh, they have no purpose anymore. Well, beyond what little purpose they had of murder and money, but now they can't even do that. So everyone's kind of losing their mind. They're just killing for the sake of killing, except for the judge who seems completely unbothered by everything that's happening. At this point also, they've gone so far south, so they're beginning to hit the jungle. And it says as they're walking through the jungle, the judge is just like shooting birds and catching butterflies to catalog and draw pictures of in his book. So eventually one night when they're sitting around the fire, Toadvine looks at him and says, what's the point of this book and all of this cataloging he does anyway? Which leads to another of my favorite scenes in the entire novel. The judge's quill ceased at scratching. He looked at Toadvine. Then he continued to write again. Toadvine spat into the fire. The judge wrote on and then he folded the ledger shut and laid it to one side and pressed his hands together and passed them down over his nose and mouth and placed them palm down on his knees. Whatever exists, he said, whatever in creation exists without my knowledge, exists without my consent. He looked about at the dark forest in which they were bivouacked. He nodded towards the specimens he'd collected. These anonymous creatures, he said, may seem little or nothing in the world, yet the smallest crumb can devour us. Any smallest thing beneath yon rock out of men's knowing. Only nature can enslave man, and only when the existence of each last entity is routed out and made to stand naked before him will he properly suzerain of the earth. What's a suzerain? A keeper, a keeper or overlord. Why not say keeper then? Because he is a special kind of keeper. A suzerain rules even where there are other rulers. His authority countermands local judgments. Toadvine spat. The judge placed his hands on the ground. He looked at his inquisitor. This is my claim, he said, and yet everywhere upon it are pockets of autonomous life. Autonomous. In order for it to be mine, nothing must be permitted to occur upon it save by my dispensation. Tovine sat with his boots crossed before the fire. No man can acquaint himself with everything on this earth, he said. The judge tilted his great head. The man who believes that the secrets of the world are forever hidden lives in mystery and fear. Superstition will drag him down. The rain will erode the deeds of his life. But the man who sets himself the task of singling out the thread of order from the tapestry will by decision alone have taken charge of the world and it is only by such taking charge that he will effect a way to dictate the terms of his own fate. I don't see what that has to do with catching birds. The freedom of the birds is an insult to me. I'd have them all in zoos. That'd be a hell of a zoo. The judge smiled. Yes, he said. Even so. The judge has such an interesting and almost selfish outlook on the world. He touches the dirt and says, this is my claim, the world and everything in it. And anything in this world that exists without my knowledge doesn't look to me for permission. It exists without my consent. 
He says the freedom of the birds, the autonomy of them, is an insult to him. He'd rather they all be locked up in zoos, because then it would be cataloged and it would be under his command. He is not trying to be the master of his own destiny, he is trying to be the warlord of everyone else's. After this, once again, the gang does the same thing, where they go to a small town, and there's a hostel, and they take it over and have a party and burn stuff in the backyard. So the men make it to Sonora, and out here they don't have word of what the Glanton gang's done yet, so they get another contract to collect native scalps. So they immediately go back to the new, much easier trick than fighting our natives, and instead just massacre another Mexican village. This time, while they're on their way back, they are approached by Mexican cavalry led by General Elias. In the fight, Glanton's gang is outgunned and immediately begins an escape. However, in the initial shootout, three of them are dead and seven of them are injured. That night, they can see out in the horizon the fires of Elias' soldiers. They're being chased through the desert, and it doesn't seem like Elias is going to lose interest in them anytime soon. Elias, again, was a general of the Mexican military who didn't take kindly to Glanton killing Mexican civilians. Of those seven that are wounded, four of them are wounded so badly that they can no longer ride. And if they leave these men behind to the Mexican soldiers, then there's no telling what the Mexicans will do to them. So the gang decides to draw lots. They take arrows out of a quiver and they wrap pieces of flannel to them. And whoever draws the arrow with the flannel has to stay behind to put down the wounded soldier. The four men that are wounded are two of the Delaware Indians, uh, a Mexican who is new to the gang, or I guess was new to the gang, and a man named Dick Shelby. There's this weird moment whenever the kid goes up to draw arrows where it says, he sat on the ground with the quiver upright between his knees while the company filed past. When the kid selected among the shafts to draw one, he saw the judge watching him and he paused. He looked at Glanton, he let go the arrow he'd chosen and sorted out another and drew that one. It carried the red tassel. He looked at the judge again and the judge was not watching and he moved on and took his place with Tate and Webster. So they're sitting there casting arrows and right before the kid goes to, the judge is staring him down and it changes the kid's mind and sure enough, the arrow that he pulls next has the flannel attached to it. It's like the judge is instrumenting the kid's life to put him in these horrific scenarios. Again, it's an instance of fate, perhaps. Or perhaps the judge is an agent of it. So the kid's standing there with the three other men who drew the arrows, and then one of the uninjured Delaware Indians walks up to the line and goes to two of the men and takes their arrows from them, because the Delaware sees it more fitting that he kills his own people rather than them. They watch as the Delaware walks to the two other injured Delaware and he takes a club and just caves their head in and leaves. So that leaves the kid and a man named Tate to kill the wounded Mexican and Dick Shelby. At this point, everyone else in the gang has started to move out so they can get some ground on the soldiers and Tate and the kid need to finish what they're about to do fast. So after everyone leaves, the conversation picks up. Tate squatted in the sand, his hands dangling in front of him. He turned and looked at the kid. Who gets the Mexican? He said. The kid didn't answer. They looked at Shelby. He was watching them. Tate had a clutch of small pebbles in his hand and he let them drop one by one into the sand. He looked at the kid. Go on if you want to, the kid said. He looked at the Delawares, dead in their blankets. You might not do it, he said. That ain't your worry. Flanton might come back. He might. Tate looked over to where the Mexican was lying, and he looked at the kid again. I'm still held to it, he said. The kid didn't answer. You know what they'll do to them? The kid spat. I can guess, he said. No, you can't. I said you could go. You do what you want. The kid senses that Tate's having trouble thinking about putting these men, men that he probably considers friends, down. So the kid tells Tate to get out of there. Again, it's one of those instances of the kid's weird rule of mercy and something we're about to see another instance of right after. So Tate leaves and now the kid is standing there by himself with the Mexican and Shelby. The kid sat in the sand and stared off to the south. The Mexican was shot through the lungs and would die anyway. But Shelby had his hips shattered by a ball and he was clear in his head. He lay watching the kid. He was from a prominent Kentucky family and had attended Transylvania College, and like many another young man of his class, he'd gone west because of a woman. 
He watched the kid, and he watched the enormous sun where it sat boiling on the edge of the desert. Any road agent or gambler would have known that the first to speak would lose, but Shelby had already lost it all. Man, I love, I love the way just McCarthy writes these scenes. Any road agent or gambler would know that the first to speak would lose, but Shelby had already lost it all. It makes me want to scream at such a good book. Why don't you just get it on with, he said. That's Shelby talking. The kid looked at him. If I had a gun, I'd shoot you, Shelby said. The kid didn't answer. You know that, don't you? You ain't got a gun, the kid said. He looked to the south again. Something moving, perhaps the first lines of heat. No dust in the morning so early. When he looked at Shelby again, Shelby was crying. You won't thank me if I let you off, he said. Do it then, you son of a bitch. The kid sat. A light wind was blowing out of the north, and some doves had begun to call in the thicket of greasewood behind them. If you want me just to leave you, I will. Shelby didn't answer. He pushed a furrow in the sand with the heel of his boot. You'll have to say. Will you leave me a gun? You know I can't leave you no gun. You're no better than him, are you? The kid didn't answer. What if he comes back? Glanton? Yes. What if he does? He'll kill me. You won't be out nothing. <laughs> Kid's like, oh, he'll kill you? Yeah, we wouldn't want that to happen now, would we? <laughs> you won't be out nothing, you son of a bitch. The kid rose. Will you hide me? Hide you? Yes. The kid spat. You can't hide. Where are you going to hide at? Will he come back? I don't know. This is a terrible place to die in. Where's a good one? Shelby wiped his eyes with the back of his wrist. Can you see them? He said. Not yet. Will you pull me up under that bush? The kid turned and looked at him. He looked off down country again, and then he crossed the basin and squatted behind Shelby and took him up under the arms and raised him. Shelby's head rolled back and he looked up, and then he snatched at the butt of the pistol stuck in the kid's belt. The kid seized his arm, he led him down and stepped away and turned him loose. When he returned through the basin leading the horse, the man was crying again. He took the pistol from his belt and jammed it among his belongings, lashed to the cantle, took his canteen down and went to him. He had his face turned away. The kid filled his flask from his own and reseated the stopper where it hung by its thong and drove it home with the heel of his hand. Then he rose and looked off to the south. Yonder they come, he said. Shelby raised up on one elbow. The kid looked at him and he looked at the faint and formless articulation along the horizon of the sky. Shelby lay back. He was staring up at the sky. A dark overcast was moving down from the north and the wind was up. A clutch of leaves scuttled out of the willow bracken at the edge of the sand and then scuttled back again. The kid crossed to where the horse stood waiting, took the pistol, stuck it in his belt, and hung the canteen over the saddle horn, and mounted up and looked back at the wounded man. Then he rode out. Even though Shelby reached for the kid's gun, even though he was probably going to kill him in that moment, the kid went over to him and in the middle of the hot desert, he refilled a dying man's canteen with his own water. Just one of the elements of this story uh, that becomes more apparent, I think, whenever you think of the ending, the place it ends, is the kid's morality is almost subjective. And in my opinion, I'm jumping the gun on the analysis a bit. But in my opinion, I think that is the greatest thing that would be lost if you made this into a film. Like, yeah, studios won't do it because of the brutal depictions of elderly women and babies being murdered, right? But from a thematic perspective, whenever you read this story, it is almost up to you how evil the kid is. Because, like, in all the mentions earlier in the story, whenever it's talking about the gang scalping people, murdering people, the kid is never mentioned in the violence. He is definitely there, and he's mentioned afterwards. Like, for example, whenever they slaughtered the Apache village, the kid isn't mentioned through the entire slaughter. He's mentioned at the end whenever he sees that Miguel has been stabbed. And that's the first time he comes back into the tale. So you can imagine the kid as going through and just massacring people along with the rest of the gang, or kind of being a witness to it all. Nowhere else to be in the world, this is just where he lives. 
So in moments like this, where I don't, I don't know in, mo in moments like this, where there's an act of mercy that is unseen by the other members of the game or, or, or unthinkable even by the other members of the gang. I don't know. It, it feeds this idea that perhaps the kid definitely not innocent, but is more blameless than most. Uh, it's, it's so interesting to me. I, I heard people talking about this story, like, you know, people giving lectures on it and stuff, and they would talk about a kid that was not my kid. It was not, the, the way they would describe his actions and his evil were completely different from what I envisioned in my head, and I heard other people who treated the kid much more favorably than I had in my head. And it's like, not only is the kid an audience surrogate, in a way, you know, because he's what we see the actions of the story through, but he's almost a moral, I don't know, imprint. It's weird. What you think he's most likely to do in this scenario is what he does, except for instances like this. And because of that, and because of where the story ends, I like to think that perhaps the kid is different from the rest of the gang in some way. He might be nihilistic. He might be empty with, you know, compassion of man, but he's not a, he's not a man hunter. He's not a monster, at least not yet. I don't know. It's an interesting aspect of the story, something I don't see done a lot. So the kid is riding up the trail to catch up with the gang, and as he does, he sees a lone rider standing offside of his horse. As he gets closer, he realizes that this is Tate. As the kid rides up, he sees that the horse is standing on three legs, which is not a good sign. The kid begins by speaking to Tate. Can he walk? Not much. He got down and drew up the horse's leg, the frog of the hoof was split and bloody, and the animal's shoulder quivered. He let the hoof down. The sun was about two hours high, and now there was dust on the horizon. A couple things to note. The reason that the horse's hoof split is because earlier in the story, whenever they were being tracked, I believe it was by the Mexican army, the Mexican army was able to follow them easier because they just looked for the horse, the horseshoes in the ground. So they de-shoed the horses, which is what caused this injury. The other detail is that dust on the horizon is the Mexican army getting closer. So this is quickly becoming a problem. He looked at Tate. What do you want to do? I don't know. Lead him a while, see how he does. He ain't going to do. I know it. We could ride and tie. You might just keep riding. I might anyway. Tate looked at him. Go on if you want, he said. The kid spat. Come on, he said. I hate to leave the saddle. Hate to leave the horse far as that goes. The kid picked up the trailing reins of his own animal. You might change your mind about what you hate to leave, he said. <laughs> I love the kid. I love his dialogue. Like when He doesn't speak that much, but when he does speak, it's always some matter-of-fact statement that I, I love. So both of them are now walking their horses at a much, much slower rate, and Tate has to keep fighting his animal to make it move forward. I should also mention... That I know the passage of time's probably weird in my description. It's more better defined in the story. And now they've worked their way back uh, north, and they are now in the mountains around Sonora. I mention that because it's about to start snowing, and that'd be really weird considering last I mentioned they were in the jungle. The gang's been riding with the kid for going on a year at this point. Eventually, the snow got blowing to such a degree that they had to wrap in their blankets and face away from it as it pelted them in the eyes. They can barely see a few feet in front of them, and Tate says, Ain't this hell, he said. Will your horse lead? Hell no, I can hardly make him fall her. We get turned around, we might just run plumb into the Spaniards. I never seen it turn so cold so quick. What do you want to do? We better go on. We could pull for the high country. As long as we keep going uphill, we'll know we ain't gone in a circle. We'll get cut off. We never will find Glanton. We're cut off now. Tate turned and stared bleakly to where the whirling flakes blew down from the north. Let's go, he said. We can't stand here. So they eventually get up to a little, like, cliffside in the snow and decide to wrap themselves in their sleeping bags for the night. The next day, the kid wakes up underneath a pile of snow because he hears footsteps. The kid, underneath the snow, grabs his gun and sets upright, throwing the snow off of him, and when he does... He sees five Mexican soldiers walking up on him with rifles. 
Immediately, the kid pulls his pistol and shoots the one in front of him before rolling out of the sleeping bag, grabbing his boots, and sprinting down the mountainside as he fires bullets behind him. Up on the mountainside, he can hear gunshots continue to go off, and from here, Tate is never mentioned again. Well, he's mentioned, but he's never seen again. So it's more than likely that the Mexican soldiers killed him up there on the mountain. From here, we're treated to this interesting scene where it's kind of like the beginning of the novel, where the kid is traveling across the countryside of his own, seeing the remnants of war and nature as it carries around him, and he's just kind of a voyager through it. It's so cold that he can't feel his feet, and as he's walking, he's picking up patches of snow and keeps eating it to stay hydrated. He sleeps curled up in a ball, having lost his sleeping bag on top of the mountain, wrapped around his pistol, as it's the only artifact he has and the only thing that could possibly save him. As he's walking one night, again, it's been a few nights of him walking over the mountaintops through the cold. As he's walking, he looks out in the darkness, and he sees a solitary fire. It's weird. There's several scenes in this book that I continue to think about after I finish reading it. Um, one of the primary ones being the ending of the book, which, again, we'll get to. Uh, but probably, next to that, the scene I find myself thinking of the most, or thinking what it might mean, is this. He continues to walk through the darkness, through the fog. It says a couple of times, it seems that the image of the fire is cut off. He thinks maybe wolves are running in between him and the fire. But it doesn't distract him from it. He keeps pushing on. And when he gets there, it was a lone tree burning on the desert a heraldic tree that the passing storm had left afire. The solitary pilgrim, drawn up before it, had traveled far to be here, and he knelt in the hot sand and held his numbed hands out, while all about in that circle attended companies of lesser auxiliaries routed forth into the inordinate day. Small owls that crouched silently and stood from foot to foot, and tarantulas and solpugas and vinegaroons and the vicious Miguel spiders and beaded lizards with mouths black as a chow dog's deadly demand and the little desert basilisks that jet blood from their eyes and the small sand vipers like seemly gods, silent and the same, in Jeddah and Babylon. A constellation of ignited eyes that edged that ring of light, all bound in precarious truce before this torch, whose brightness had set back the stars in their sockets. It... I think this is... this will make more sense later. But for me, this was the turning point of the novel. The kid has witnessed horrific atrocities of man over and over again. Uh, and so, some things nearly unspeakable in how evil they are. And now, he is separate from the gang. He is apart from them. He is his own agent, if desperate, still, you know, acting on his own here, in his own accordance. And just before the scene happened, he had done everything to be right by his fellow man. He had, you know, he, he spared Shelby. Uh, Shelby didn't want to be shot, it seemed, so the kid didn't do it. Uh, he stuck with Tate, and that's what put him in the situation, but he wouldn't leave his man alone. And it's like now, after all of that happened, he's given a herald, uh, this, a blazing tree left by a storm in the middle of this tundra. And it says that, you know, it's, it's an offering of salvation, that he's near freezing to death, about to lose his hands, and he can use the fire to warm his hands. Um, but this, this boy, who has been, at least been complicit with evil all this time, as he stands there before a burning altar surrounded by the snakes and the spiders, he crawls before it humble, a pilgrim, as the story describes, and he draws warmth from it. And it's also... Not to be overlooked how the image of a burning tree in the wilderness directly harkens back to the biblical story of Moses and the burning bush. Uh, but here, God isn't speaking. It's just quiet. It's just, it's just uh, a salvation that happens for him. Even if for a moment it keeps him going to the next day. And I'll, explain, I'll come back to the scene when we get to the ending. But I think his decision after this his decision to walk back towards the gang is, how do I phrase this, is symbolically the final step of his journey. 
He eventually comes off the mountain and gets back on the trail the gang was following. As he's walking down the trail, he sees a giant smoldering mass, and when he gets closer to it, he realizes it's all of the gang scalps thrown into a pile and burned. This is twofold. For one, they're not going back to Sonora to sell these things, not while being chased by the Sonoran military. So that's out. There's no reason to carry them. And two, they are about to try to make deals with the natives. And if you show up with a horse full of native scalps, they're probably not going to be in a talking mood. Eventually, the kid makes it back to the gang. At this point, he had found one of the horses that the gang had left behind in the desert, and he managed to get on top of it and catch up with them. When he gets there, he finds that four more have been killed and the gang as a whole is in a very bad state of being. That night, they're all starving, so the judge walks over and finds the most sickly looking horse and decides to kill it for me. He asks the men to come help him, and no one will except for the kid who again volunteers. However, this time, unlike he did with David Brown, the priest tries to stop him. Tobin says, pay him no mind, lad. The judge called again from the dark beyond the fire, and the ex-priest placed a cautionary hand upon the kid's arm. But the kid rose and spat into the fire. He turned and eyed the ex-priest. You think I'm afraid of him? The ex-priest didn't answer, and the kid turned and went out into the darkness where the judge waited. He stood holding the horse, just his teeth glistened in the firelight. Together they led the animal off a little ways, and the kid held the woven riata while the judge took up a round rock weighing perhaps a hundred pounds and crushed the horse's skull with a single blow. Blood shot out of its ears and it slammed to the ground so hard that one of its forelegs broke under it with a dull snap. That's a, such an interesting note. For one, we see more of the brutality of the judge, that he's able to pick up this boulder and just smash its head. But that quick mention of the kid about to go help him and the priest tries to stop him. Uh, this will become more prevalent as the story goes on. They spend some days going from town to town, staying in dingy stables to stay away from the cold. And eventually, they come to an old deserted mission, or effectively a church that several people would live at that would also operate as sort of a community center. They decide to go check it out, and a few of the men enter the church before Glanton and some of the others, and as they're riding up to the church, they hear a gunshot. Quickly, everyone runs inside to see what's going on. They walk in to see their men reloading a rifle, and some stranger lying dying on the floor in between them. The man in the floor was dying, and he was dressed altogether in homemade clothes of sheep hide, even to boots, and a strange cap. They turned him over on the cracked clay tiles, and his jaw moved, and a bloody spittle formed along his lower lip. His eyes were dull, and there was fear in them, and there was something else. John Pruitt stood the butt of his rifle in the floor, and swung his horn about to recharge the piece. I seen another and run, he said. At least two of them. The man in the floor began to move. He had one arm lying in his groin, and he moved it slightly and pointed. At them, or at the height from which he had fallen, or to his destination in eternity, they did not know. Then he died. Something about that, just a man dying, and all, all this details about him in his last moments. It's so, it's so melancholic. So they said that as they walked in, there was a hole in the ceiling, and there were two guys up top, so Pruitt took his rifle and shot one of them, and he had fallen from the ceiling to the church floor, and that's the scene that everyone walked in on. The rest of the gang finds this second man and brings him before Glanton. He's babbling like a fool and speaks no English and a little Spanish. So then the judge begins to speak to him normally because it turns out they both speak German. It's explained that the man who they shot who fell to the ground was that second man's brother and that the two of them had jumped off of a boat some time ago that was coming over from Germany, and they had been living in this abandoned mission for quite some time. So the gang decides to leave them there. And as they're riding away, it says the judge caught Glanton up, and they rode side by side out to the road. Glanton spat. Order shot that one too, he said. The judge smiled. I don't like to see white men that way, Plan said. Dutch or whatever, I don't like to see it. As the men continue to ride, it was mentioned earlier that they sent out a scouting party ahead to see if there is any danger on the horizon. As the men continue to ride, they find the scouting party hung upside down from the thorns of a tree with thorns ran through their heels as they had been slowly cooked by the natives that had captured them. One of these men who was hanging upside down on the tree was Bath Cat, and as it was prophesied near the beginning of the book, Toadvine walks up to him and cuts him down from the tree, 
observing that tattoo that it was mentioned all the way back then, he would see when he cut his naked torso from a tree in the wilderness. They continue riding and eventually they come across an Apache village. Now typically this would be the part where the gang starts murdering them, but now because the gang doesn't have the faculties to do that and also they can't get paid for it, they decide that why not talk to the Apaches for once. The Apaches are standing there with their leader out front, so Glanton walks up to the leader and the two approach each other, and as soon as Glanton starts to talk to him, Glanton's horse reaches forward and bites the ear of the Apache leader's horse. Just rips the ear out, blood starts spurting everywhere, because Glanton's war horse is so used to killing, and more specifically killing anyone who looks like these Apaches, that it just immediately goes to fight and Glandon has to start punching it in the face to make it stop. So immediately, the Apaches and the gang begin to draw weapons on each other. But before anyone can fire, the judge rides up and begins his smooth talking. The leader comes to them and the gang says they don't want any trouble and they're just looking to barter. The Apaches agree that they'll let bygones be bygones if they can trade money for whiskey. The gang says that they don't have any whiskey, but at this point they're pretty close to Tucson, Arizona. So they tell the Apaches that if they give them three days, they'll be back to trade a barrel of whiskey for gold. So now back in America, the gang is in Tucson and they are met by an American lieutenant named Kautz. And again, Kautz has no idea what the Glanton gang's been up to. So they meet each other, exchange their pleasantries, and then the gang goes to a bar to get drunk and eat food. They also need to rebuild the gang. So as a lot of these men go to bars to get drunk, Glanton and the judge start to walk through the town, seeing if anyone's interested in joining up for a ride to California. Everyone in the streets kind of laugh at them until eventually someone says, hey, go to the end of the road and see if Klaus and that madman want to go with you. So Glanton and the judge go to look for it and the story says, Glanton and the judge sought them out, a rude tent thrown up out of an old tarp, a sign that said, see the wild man, two bits. They pass behind a wagon sheet where within a crude cage of palavered poles crouched a naked imbecile. The floor of the cage was littered with filth and trodden food and flies clambered about everywhere. The idiot was small and misshapen and his face was smeared with feces and he sat peering at them with dull hostility, silently chewing a turd. Chloe steps out and the two ask if he's the keeper of this thing and Chloe says that he is. After some conversing, Glanton says that he'll take Cloyce and this wild man in a cage for $100. Cloyce says that he'll get the money because he wants to make it to California, and as mentioned earlier, you can't travel by yourself. And on the way out, Glanton turns to him and says, you let women see that thing? And Cloyce says, I don't know, said the owner. There's none ever asked. So Cloyce just has a crazy person who is inside of a cage who it says is covered in his own filth and excrement, and he just takes people's money so they can look at him. A right fit for the Glanton gang. So Glanton and the judge join the rest of the gang, and they go to an eating house to get food. As they're sitting there, they're encountered by a problem that they haven't experienced a long time because it wasn't a problem in Mexico. Perhaps the owner of the restaurant, it says a man in a blood-stained apron, walks up to them from out of the back and says, Gentlemen, he said, we don't mind serving people of color, glad to do it, but we asked for him to sit over here at this other table here, right over here. He stepped back and held out one hand in a strange gesture of hospice. His guests looked at one another. What in the hell is he talking about? Just right over here, said the man. Tovine looked down the table to where Jackson sat. Several looked toward Glanton. His hands were at rest on the board in front of him, and his head was slightly bent like a man at grace. The judge sat smiling, his arms crossed. They were all slightly drunk. They sat in silence. The old woman in the court had commenced wailing some dolorous air, and the man was standing with his hand outheld. Piled just within the door were the satchels and holsters and the arms of the company. Glanton raised his head. He looked at the man. What's your name? He said. Name's Owens. I own the place. Mr. Owens, if you was anything at all other than a damn fool, you could take one look at these here men and know for a stone fact they ain't a one of them going to get up from where they're at to go sit somewhere else. Well, I can't serve you. Suit yourself about that. Ask her what she's got, Tommy. 
Harlan, one of the gang members, Harlan was sitting at the end of the table and he leaned out and called to the old woman at her pots and asked her in Spanish what she had to eat. She looked toward the house. Hueso, she said. Hueso, said Harlan. Tell her to bring him, Tommy. She won't bring you nothing without I tell her to. I own this place. Harlan was calling out the open door. I know for a fact that that man yonder's a black man, said Owens. Jackson looked up at him. Brown turned toward the owner. Have you got a gun? He said. A gun? A gun. Have you got a gun? Not on me, I ain't. Brown pulled a small five-shot colt from his belt and pitched it to him. He caught it and stood holding it uncertainly. You got one now. Now, shoot the... Black man. Wait a minute, said Owens. Shoot him, said Brown. Jackson had risen and he pulled one of the big pistols from his belt. Owens pointed the pistol at him. You put that down, he said. You better forget about giving orders and shoot the son of a bitch. Put it down, man. Tell him to put it down. Shoot him. He cocked the pistol. Jackson fired. He simply passed his left hand over the top of the revolver he was holding in a gesture brief as a flint spark and tripped the hammer. The big pistol jumped and a double handful of Owen's brains went out the back of his skull and plopped in the floor behind him. He sank without a sound and lay crumpled with his face in the floor and one eye open and the blood welling up out of the destruction of the back of his head. Jackson sat down. Brown rose and retrieved his pistol and let the hammer back down and put it in his belt. So they're at a bar and the owner says that Jackson can't eat with them because he's black. So Brown's like, all right, let's make it interesting. And he throws a gun to the owner. So in a duel, Jackson stands up and kills Owens. Immediately after this, Clouts, who's the lieutenant in Tucson, as mentioned, comes to Glanton and the men who are now drinking at a different establishment and says, I'm sorry, Glanton, but I'm going to have to arrest whoever was responsible for the murder of Owens. And Glanton's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and Clout says, well, you all walked into the bar and then we, there was a gunshot and now he's dead. And Glanton says, did you witness it? Do you have any witnesses of it? And, <laughs> and um, Clout says no. And Glanton said, well, you can go ahead and ask the boys, but none of us were in there either. And through the judge finagling with Clouts, uh, they get away with it because they're all sworn to secrecy towards each other. Again, their own sense of loyalty. Also in one of these bars, Glanton and the judge begin talking to Klaus about the nature of this wild man. It turns out that this wild man is Klaus's brother, who was just born that way. He says that he has taken this boy from town to town, and in every town he has been ridiculed, tarred and feathered. He had one town where they were convinced he was drugging the boy, so they jailed both of them for a while, and when the boy didn't get any better, they just released both of them and let them go about their way. So effectively, Klaus is a traveling showman with the showman being his mentally ill brother. It's also mentioned that within the village that night, another child goes missing. And of course, as with every single town they go to, they get drunk that night and they go naked through the streets door to door, demanding for women and liquor to be brought out to them. So, you know, their standard charming self. It's also said that the farrier in Tucson doesn't have an anvil to work with, and instead he has a meteorite that fell to the earth that weighs potentially hundreds of pounds. So for a series of bets, the judge first picks it up, and then he picks it up above his head, and then he throws the meteor 10 feet. Again, attesting to the capabilities of this man. So as they leave Tucson, they go back to finish their deal with the Apaches. The deal was they would trade gold for a barrel of whiskey. So what Glanton does is he gets a barrel and he takes a sack, like a leather sack, and he ties it to the inside of where the spigot is located on the outside of the barrel. So there is enough whiskey in that sack for, you know, a few cups full, but the rest of the barrel is filled with water. So he goes and he tricks the Apaches, gets the gold for the whole barrel's worth, and takes off. One of the new recruits who they got in Tucson rides up next to Brown and asks what will happen if the Apaches decide to retaliate. They won't ride at night, said Brown. The recruit looked back at the figures gathered about the keg in that scoured and darkening waist. Why won't they, he said. Brown spat. Because it's dark, he said. <laughs> Why won't they ride at night? I don't know, maybe because they can't see, idiot. During this time around the campfire, it says that Glanton is nearly broken. So many people dead 
the members of the gang now aren't even the people that he started with. And he just sits there, staring, as the judge sits next to him, watching the idiot stare at the fire from his cage. Also, I'm not being mean calling him the idiot. Uh, that's what the story calls him for the rest of it, so you can take it up with the author. One night, the men are sitting around the fire, and someone asks the ex-priest if it's true that at one point in history, there were two moons in the night sky, which was a belief held by a few, I guess, groups of people at this time. The ex-priest says it was fully possible. Perhaps God put up two moons and then decided that humanity only needed one. After that, someone asks the question of if there's life on other planets out there among the stars. The question was then put as to whether there were on Mars or other planets in the void men or creatures like them. And at this, the judge who had returned to the fire and stood half naked and sweating spoke and said that there were not and that there were no men anywhere in the universe save those upon the earth. All listened as he spoke, those who had turned to watch him and those who would not. The truth about the world, he said, is that anything is possible. Have you not seen it all from birth and thereby bled it of its strangeness? It would appear to you for what it is. A hat trick in a medicine show, a fever dream, a trance be populate with chimeras having neither analog nor precedent. An itinerant carnival, a migratory tent show whose ultimate destination after many a pitch in many a mudded field is unspeakable and calamitous beyond reckoning. The universe is no narrow thing and the order within it is not constrained by any latitude in its conception to repeat what exists in one part and any other part. Even in this world, more things exist without our knowledge than with it. And the order in creation which you see is that which you have put there, like a string in a maze, so that you shall not lose your way. For existence has its own order, and that no man's mind can compass. That mind itself being but a fact among others. The judge is saying, of course there isn't life on other planets. There's no order, there's no repetition in the universe. It is entirely chaotic and changing. In every instance, humanity isn't looking. Why would we expect something as strange as life to happen anywhere else? Again, it falls back on the judge's belief that the world itself is without order unless we assign order to it. Brown spat into the fire. That's some of your craziness, he said. The judge smiled. He placed the palms of his hands upon his chest and breathed the night air, and he stepped closer and squatted and held up one hand. He turned that hand, and there was a gold coin between his fingers. Where's the coin, Davy? I'll notify you where to put the coin. <laughs> the judge swung his hand and the coin winked overhead in the firelight. It must have been fastened to some subtle lead, horsehair perhaps, for it circled the fire and returned to the judge and he caught it in his hand and smiled. The arc of circling bodies is determined by the length of their tether, said the judge. Moons, coins, men, his hands moved as if he were pulling something from one fist in a series of elongations. Watch the coin, Davy, he said. He flung it and it cut an arc through the firelight and was gone in the darkness beyond. They watched the night where it had vanished and they watched the judge and in their watching, some the one and some the other, they were a common witness. The coin, Davy, the coin, whispered the judge. He sat erect and raised his hand and smiled around. The coin returned back out of the night and crossed the fire with a faint high droning and the judge raised hand was empty and then it held the coin. There was a light slap and it held the coin. Even so, some claimed that he had thrown the coin away and palmed another like it and made the sound with his tongue, for he was himself a cunning old malabarista. And he said himself, as he put the coin away, what all men knew, that there are coins and false coins. In the morning, some did walk over the ground where the coin had gone, but if any man found it, and he kept it to himself, and with sunrise, they were mounted and riding again. So the judge is explaining that, you know, the world is without order, but at the same time, Humans are only destined to go so far. The coin can only move as far as the arc will allow it to. And much the same, people are kept to their own devices of their birth, of what they make of it. If you don't aspire to be anything greater, then you will never be something greater. The coin can never go farther than the horsehair allows. But then he does the magic trick where he throws the coin across the fire and then another one appears in his hand. And you would think, oh, well, he just threw a coin and then pulled out another one, right? But it says the next day they all looked for it and if anyone found it, they kept them to themselves. Again, another mysterious trait, almost supernatural about the judge's character. 
It seems at this point in the game that Glanton has kind of given up on any greater hope or purpose, and the judge is just taking his run of the show, doing what he wants. And that's proven when a couple nights later, he's giving another of his sermons. And this sermon is by far his most famous and perhaps the most famous segment of the entire book. Whenever I went into this story, I had several of my friends who had read it say, wait till you get to the part where the judge talks about this. It's one of the greatest monologues in fiction. And after reading it, I see the hype. They were gathered around and the story says that the subject of their discussion was war. The good book says that he that lives by the sword shall perish by the sword, said the black. The judge smiled, his face shining with grease. What right man would have it any other way, he said. That line does go pretty hard. <laughs> the good book does indeed count war as an evil, said Irving, yet there's many a bloody tale of war inside it. It makes no difference what men think of war, said the judge. War endures. As well, ask men what they think of stone. War was always here. Before man was, war waited for him. The ultimate trade awaiting its ultimate practitioner. That is the way it was and will be. That way and not some other way. He turned to Brown, for whom he'd heard some whispered slur or demurmur. Oh, Davy, he said, it's your own trade we honor here. Why not rather take a small bow? Let each acknowledge each. My trade? Certainly. What is my trade? War, war is your trade, is it not? And ain't it yours? Mine too, very much so. What about all them notebooks and bones and stuff? All other trades are contained in that of war. Is that why war endures? No. It endures because young men love it and old men love it in them. Those that fought, those that did not. That's your notion, the judge smiled. Men are born for games, nothing else. Every child knows that play is nobler than work. He knows, too, that the worth or merit of a game is not inherent in the game itself, but rather in the value of that which is put at hazard. Games of chance require a wager to have meaning at all. Games of sport involve the skill and strength of the opponents, and the humiliation of defeat and the pride of victory are in themselves sufficient stake, because they inhere in the worth of the principles and define them. But trial of chance or trial of worth, all games aspire to the condition of war, for here, that which is wagered swallows up game, player, all. Suppose two men at cards with nothing to wager save their lives. Who has not heard such a tale? A turn of the card. The whole universe for such a player has labored, clanking to this moment, which will tell if he is to die at that man's hand or that man at his. What more certain validation of a man's worth could there be? This enhancement of the game to its ultimate state admits no argument concerning the notion of fate. The selection of one man over another is a preference absolute and irrevocable, and it is a dull man indeed who could reckon so profound a decision without agency or significance either one. In such games as have for their stake the annihilation of the defeated, the decisions are quite clear. This man holding this particular arrangement of cards in his hand is thereby removed from existence. This is the nature of war, whose stake is at once the game and the authority and the justification. Seen so, war is the truest form of divination. It is the testing of one's will and the will of another within that larger will because it binds them is therefore forced to select. War is the ultimate game because war is at last a forcing of the unity of existence. War is God. And for the first time in the story, it makes sense why a seven foot tall mountain of a man who is educated in matters of government, law, and art chooses to be in the middle of a rove of headhunters in the American Southwest. See, as the judge says, nothing in the world matters more than war. Nothing matters more than the conquest of one man over the other. If man was made to play games, then what greater game could there be than one where the risk is the very existence of man itself? What more noble or better cause is there to fight for than one that you die for? Or even better, 
one that you kill for. He's not out here killing people wildly in the desert because he loves it, although that is part of it. He's doing it because there's simply nothing else worth doing. Brown studied the judge. You're crazy, Holden. Crazy at last. The judge smiled. Might does not make right, said Irving. The man that wins in some combat is not vindicated morally. Moral law is an invention of mankind for the disenfranchisement of the powerful in favor of the weak. Historical law subverts it at every turn. A moral view can never be proven right or wrong by any ultimate test. A man falling dead in a duel is not thought thereby to be proven in error as to his views. His very involvement in such a trial gives evidence of a new and broader view. The willingness of the principles to forego further argument as the triviality which it in fact is and to petition directly the chambers of the historical absolute clearly indicates of how little movement are the opinions and of what great moment the divergences thereof. For the argument is indeed trivial, but not so the separate wills thereby made manifest. Man's vanity may well approach the infinite in capacity. But his knowledge remains imperfect, and however much he comes to value his judgments, ultimately, he must submit them before a higher court. Here, there can be no special pleading. Here are considerations of equity and rectitude and moral right rendered void and without warrant, and here are the views of the litigants despised. Decisions of life and death, of what shall be and what shall not, beggar all question of right. And elections of these magnitudes are all lesser ones subsumed, moral, spiritual, natural. The judge searched out the circle for disputants. But what says the priest, he said. Tobin looked up. The priest does not say. The priest does not say, said the judge. Nile diss it. But the priest has said. For the priest has put by the robes of his craft and taken up the tools of that higher calling, which all men honor. The priest also would be no god server, but a god himself. Tobin shook his head. You've a blasphemous tongue, Holden. And in truth, I was never a priest, but only a novitiate to the order. Journeyman priest or apprentice priest, said the judge, men of God and men of war have strange affinities. I'll not second say you in your notion, said Tobin. Don't ask it. Ah, oh, priest, said the judge. What could I ask of you? that you've not already given. All that as to say that morality, principles, all of that to the judge is meaningless. What, what is an opinion or a thought of how something should go when there is instead an arena of combat in which one lives and the other dies? That is the final decision maker. That is the only thing that matters in this world. Not any decry of God or virtues or life or love, only Death, the final absolute decision that is just and fair in every ruling. And he looks to the priest and he says, look at the priest. He's thrown off his robes and decided to be something greater. He has found the true religion, the religion of war. Not a God server, as the judge says, but a God himself. While everyone else in the gang, excluding the kid potentially, while everyone else in the gang is there as soldiers of fortune, and willing to shed misery on others for the sake of profit, the judge is there because it's noble. Because murder, conquest, destroying any life in your path to be the one left standing, that is nobility, that is honor, that is something to be praised. So as the others are there for money and for the, the women and the booze, the judge is there because it feels good, because it's supposed to feel good. Because if war, if death, if murder is the highest calling a human can aspire towards, then what other call might a man or a king have than mass bloodshed? A few days later, the gang makes it to the Colorado River. And when they get there, they see that the ferry across the river is being ran by a man named Lincoln. So the gang begins to conspire as another way to make money off of these people. The Yuma Indians who are nearby have been thinking about attacking Lincoln and the ferry. So the gang goes to the Yumas and say that they'll be happy to help them attack the ferry. They then go to Lincoln and say that any day now, the Yumas are probably gonna attack and it's in Lincoln's best interest 
to let the gang set up fortifications, to which Lincoln agrees. Also, in the midst of this, a woman who is traveling on the ferry sees uh, Cloyce and his deranged brother in a cage, and she scolds him for being a bad brother and for, uh, you know, locking up your mentally ill brother and putting him on a cage to sell shows to. <laughs> so she asks Cloyce what the idiot's name is, and he says that his name is James. So the woman takes James to the river, and her and several other women clean him off and set his carriage on fire. That night, the idiot gets up from camp and walks into the river by himself and nearly drowns. But he stopped whenever the judge who is walking alongside the river sees him drowning and wades into the river to pull him out. The relationship between the judge and the idiot, as he's called, or James, is weird. Uh, typically, the judge despises all life and, you know, everything around him that lives that, you know, is without his permission or whatever. But he ca not really cares. He keeps the idiot alive and keeps him around uh, for here and, like, some parts of the story moving forward. And I don't know if it's because he's interested in him as a specimen, if he likes the idiot, or if he likes... I keep saying idiot because that's what the story calls him. If he likes James... It's a little mean. <laughs> if he likes James because James bends to his will, perhaps? But for some reason, he seems to have a soft spot for him. Even though he's, you know insane and can't talk, which is probably the aspect that the judge likes about him. So once all the pieces are in play, the day of the Yuma attack comes. Another thing that I should mention is that one of the goods Lincoln, the guy who ran the ferry, had in his possession was a 12-pound howitzer cannon. The gang decides to set it up to prepare for the advancing Yumas. They get up on a cliffside where they can oversee the other bank of the ferry, and as soon as the Yumas launch their attack, they light off the cannon, killing a dozen Yumas with grape shot out of the cannon all at once. The Yumas begin to scream and shout, calling them traitors and monsters, and the gang ignores their cries and guns them down on the side of the Colorado River. Something interesting to note is that after the gang kills the Yumas, they start scalping them. This is weird because the gang can't sell the scalps anymore. It seems that they're doing it just out of tradition or love of the kill. After they do this, Lincoln decides to not try to hinder the men in their future endeavors because, you know, the last guys that tried got blown up by a cannon. So Lincoln effectively just lets Glanton run the show. And that goes exactly as you'd expect. Glanton took charge of the operation of the ferry. People who had been waiting three days to cross at a dollar a head were now told that the fare was four dollars. And even this tariff was in effect for no more than a few days. Soon they were operating a sort of Procrustean ferry where the fares were tailored to accommodate the purses of the travelers. Ultimately, all pretense was dropped and the immigrants were robbed outright. Travelers were beaten and their arms and goods appropriated and they were sent destitute and beggared into the desert. The doctor came down to remonstrate with them and was paid his share of the revenues and sent back. Horses were taken and women violated and bodies began to drift past the Yuma camp downriver. As these outrages multiplied, the doctor barricaded himself in his quarters and was seen no more. So Glennon figures, hey, since we lost that whole gimmick we had going with the selling native scalps thing, what if we just rob people? Just a, a good old fashioned American robbery. One day, a group of American soldiers show up to cross the river, and after seeing that Glannon is just an animal, they decide not to work with him, so they build their own ferry further down the river. After the soldiers leave, the ferry becomes an alternate route of travel compared to Glanton's ferry. The ferry down the river being operated by the Yumas and white men working with the Yumas. So how does the gang respond to this? Easy, they kill everyone there and set the ferry on fire. By now, Glanton had enslaved a number of Sonorans, and he kept crews of them working at the fortification of the hill. There were also detained in the camp a dozen or more Indian and Mexican girls, some little more than children. Glanton supervised with some interest the raising of the walls about him, but otherwise left his men to pursue the business at the crossing with a terrible latitude. He seemed to take little account of the wealth they were amassing, although daily he'd open the brass lock with which the wood and leather trunk in his quarters was secured and raise the lid and empty whole sacks of valuables into it, the trunk already holding thousands of dollars in gold and silver coins, as well as jewelry, watches, pistols, raw gold, and little leather stives, silver and bars, knives, silverware, plate, teeth. 
So at this point, rather than just roaming the countryside, they decide to build a little castle here at the edge of the ferry and just rob anyone who tries to get across the Colorado River. Glanton just a dragon sitting on top of his horde. No need to journey into the world or be anything better. Eventually, they need building supplies, so Glanton sends Toadvine, David Brown, and Webster to the city of San Diego to get the supplies they need. It's about a five days journey, and when the three get there, they go to the store to order the parts they need, and then immediately go on a bender. The next day, David Brown wakes up in an alley with the gang's money tied around his neck, and he can't find Toadvine or Webster anywhere. Turns out, the two of them got arrested for their drunken endeavors the night before. San Diego isn't like these small towns in the middle of Mexico that you can just torment all you want. They have, you know, police and jails that will do something about it. Brown goes to the alcalde, which is effectively like a judge or sheriff of the town, and asks for his two friends to be let out, but the alcalde tells him to get lost, so Brown concerns himself with other things. Brown goes to a farrier and demands to have a double barrel shotgun cut down, but by the description, the shotgun is so beautiful that the farrier says he's not going to saw the barrel because that would be a disgrace to the weapon. Brown eventually tells the farrier that if the farrier doesn't saw down the shotgun barrels, that Brown will kill him. So the farrier goes to get the police, and as he does, <laughs> Brown just tops the counter and uses the farrier's tools to saw off the shotgun barrel. And then when police show up, they were like, are you, did you threaten to injure this man? And Brow said, no, I didn't threaten anything. It was a promise. I promised to kill him. <laughs> the gang is unfit for any manner of civilized or polite living, as you could probably imagine. The next day, Webster and Toadvine get out of jail. So how did the men celebrate? With another bender, of course. This night, however, as the men are walking out of the bar drunk, Brown sees a peace officer or police officer walking by, and Brown thinks it would be funny to pour a pitcher of... Aguardente, I believe that's how it's pronounced on him, effectively a very strong alcohol. And then he puffs his cigar and holds it to the officer. And sure enough, the officer burst into flames. Only instead of a funny joke, the man began to scream and tear at himself until eventually he burned to death and lied dead in the street. Of course, because of this, Brown was arrested. One night, an officer comes to Brown in his jail cell, and while he's standing there, Brown shows him the necklace of ears that he has on his neck. It's implied that Brown took the necklace from Bathcat after Bathcat died. And he begins to tell this young officer that he is a part of a gang that has tons and tons of gold and riches amassed in the hills outside of San Diego. After nights of convincing, eventually this officer agrees to help Brown escape if Brown takes him to the money. So the two of them escape into the night and it says two nights in as they're setting up camp, Brown walks behind the officer, who helped free him, and shoots him in the back of the head, stealing what little gear he had and then leaving to head back towards the ferry. In the meantime that all of this was going on, Webster and Toadvine, as soon as Brown had been arrested, ran back to the ferry to tell Glanton. So Glanton, seeing that one of the gang members has been trapped, gets a couple more men and all of them ride to San Diego. Before he leaves, Glanton leaves the judge in charge of the ferry and the castle they're building next to the ferry. It seems that in the beginning they were just building fortifications around the office of the ferry, but at this point it's a full-blown murder castle. In the middle of the night, Glanton and some of his men make it to the alcalde's house, break into his house, and then tie him and his wife up and throw a noose over the rafters and begin to hang the alcalde in front of his wife until he tells them where David Brown went. The alcalde says to go check the jail cell, there's no one in there. And sure enough, Glanton walks in and the cell's empty. Because as we know, David Brown had escaped with the officer during this time. So they take the alcalde and his wife out of town and it says that they're found eight days later, still alive, but tied up in a hut south of San Diego. So Glanton's like, well, it seems that we came all this way to get Brown and he's not here, so. Time for a party! And after two nights of partying, the police threat to arrest him, so Glanton and his men scatter. Glanton eventually makes it back to the ferry by himself. Whenever he gets close, he's met by travelers who are heading the opposite direction of him, who are yelling at him not to go to the river because the only people there is a band of thieves and murderers. Glanton, being the king of these murderers, ignores them and keeps walking back to the ferry. However, when Glanton gets back to the ferry, 
keep in mind, it had been a, probably a couple weeks at this point. Something's changed. A young Mexican girl was crouched naked under the shade of the wall. She watched him ride past, covering her breast with her hands. She wore a rawhide collar about her neck, and she was chained to a post, and there was a clay bowl of blackened meat scraps beside her. Clanton tied the jacks to the post and rode inside on the horse. There was no one about. He rode down to the landing. While he was watching the river, the doctor came scrambling down the bank and seized Glanton by the foot. The doctor is Lincoln, by the way, the previous owner of the ferry. So forgot to mention that. Seized Glanton by the foot and began to plead with him in a senseless jabber. He'd not seen to his person in weeks and he was filthy and disheveled and he tugged on Glanton's trouser leg and pointed toward the fortifications on the hill. That man, he said, that man. Glanton slid his boot from the stirrup and pushed the doctor away with his foot and turned the horse and rode back up the hill. The judge was standing on the rise in silhouette against the evening sun like some great Balden archimandrite. He was wrapped in a mantle of free-flowing cloth beneath which he was naked. The black man Jackson came out of one of the stone bunkers dressed in a similar garb and stood beside him. Glandon rode back up along the crest of the hill to his quarters. He shows up, and a few weeks ago, he told the judge, you're in charge of this place for a while. And he gets back, and everyone is terrified and screaming. There's young children with collars on their necks. And the judge is standing naked in, like, a kingly robe on top of the mountain with Jackson standing in a similar robe right next to him. He has become the totalitarian warlord that he's always wanted to be. That night, it says that there's gunfire and partying and screaming, and Glanton lies asleep and drunk in his quarters. Early in the next morning, Jackson goes down to the river to pee, and while he's standing there, the story says, The sun was not up, and there was a low skein of mist on the water. Downstream, some ducks moved out from the willows. They circled in the eddy water, and then flapped out across the open river, and rose and circled and bent their way upstream. In the floor of the sco, the boat that Jackson is standing in, in the floor of the sco was a small coin, perhaps once lodged under the tongue of some passenger. He bent to fetch it. He stood up and wiped the grit from the piece and held it up, and as he did so, a long cane arrow passed through his upper abdomen and flew on and fell far out in the river and sank and back to the surface again and began to turn and to drift downstream. He faced around, his robe sustained about him. He was holding his wound, and with his other hand, he ravaged among his clothes for the weapons that were not there and were not there. A second arrow passed him on the left, and two more struck and lodged fast in his chest and in his groin. They were a full four feet in length, and they lofted slightly with his movements like ceremonial wands, and he seized his thigh where the dark arterial blood was spurting along the shaft, and took a step toward the shore and fell sideways into the river. Jackson was standing at the shore, and sure enough, the Yumas came back for their revenge. They kill Jackson and then immediately make their way towards the rest of the camp. They swarmed up the hill toward the fortifications where the Americans lay sleeping, and some were mounted and some afoot, and all of them armed with bows and clubs and their faces black and pale with fard and their hair bound up in clay. The first quarters they entered were Lincoln's. When they emerged a few minutes later, one of them carried the doctor's dripping head by the hair, and others were dragging behind them the doctor's dog, bound at the muzzle, jerking and bucking across the dry clay of the concourse. They entered a wikiup of willow poles and canvas and slew Gunn and Wilson and Henderson Smith, each in turn as they reared up drunkenly, and they moved on among the rude half-walls in total silence, glistening with paint and grease and blood among the bands of light, where the risen sun now touched the higher ground. When they entered Glanton's chamber, he lurched upright and glared wildly about him. The small clay room he occupied was entirely filled with a brass bed he'd appropriated from some migrating family, and he set in it like a debauched feudal baron, while his weapons hung in a rich array from the finials. Caballo and Pelo mounted into the actual bed with him and stood there, while one of the attending tribunal handed him at his right side a common axe, the hickory health of which was carved with pagan motifs and tasseled with the feathers of predatory birds. Glanton spat. Hack away, you mean red. 
he said, and the old man raised the axe and split the head of John Joel Glanton to the thrapple. The humans came in, and they not only killed Jackson and several members, but they killed Glanton. They snuck in while he was in a drunken stupor, jumped on his bed, and cut his head all the way to the throat, clean in half. The man who lived by violence, who lived by the rule and law of violence, died in a much the same way. With his last moment swearing and cursing the men who were about to do it, and challenging them to the task of killing him, of which it seems they obliged. Remember how back around the campfire, whenever the fortune teller was telling their stories? The card that Glanton drew was a man on a ferry riding into the night. and. The woman gave a description of his fortune as being that of death and misery by this man at the helm of a ferry. And it seems that Glanton, who had absolutely nothing going for him at any point in his life, but now not even a pretend purpose or a fake purpose, he just sat on top of a pile of gold and waited to take in more. He was nothing. And this dog that had been running his whole life, hurting anyone who came in his way, stopped running long enough to finally get caught. And with that, Glanton dies. And as we're going to see, so does the Glanton gang. Now, if you thought that was crazy, the Yuma showing up and killing Glanton, wait till they get to the judges' quarters. When they entered the judges' quarters, they found the idiot and a girl of perhaps 12 years cowering naked in the floor. Behind them, also naked, stood the judge. He was holding leveled at them the bronze barrel of the howitzer. The wooden truck stood in the floor. The straps pried up and twisted off the pillow blocks. The judge had the cannon under one arm, and he was holding a lighted cigar over the touch hole. The Yumas fell over one another backward, and the judge put the cigar in his mouth and took up his portmanteau and stepped out the door and backed past them and down the embankment. The idiot, who reached just to his waist, stuck close to his side, and together they entered the wood at the base of the hill and disappeared from sight. We'll talk about what was happening in the judge's room in a moment, but the judge picking up this giant cannon and holding a cigar to the touch hole ready to fire it at them just walks out of the castle and backs into the woods because no one's going to mess with a guy who is just holding a cannon. So the judge and the idiot make it out, but other than them, nearly every member of the Glanton gang died right here. This actually lines up with the historical account. It's reasonable if you forgot at this point, but as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, the Glanton gang is based on a real-life gang, who according to Samuel Chamberlain, was mostly wiped out by an attack from the Yuma tribe. There is a very brutal depiction of the Yumas burning the bodies of everyone that they killed, and then throwing the men's living animals onto the fire to burn with them. Every trace of what the Glanton gang was is now eradicated from the earth with only the few survivors who managed to get away being the witnesses that not only it existed, but of what they did and the atrocities they had committed. Earlier in the story, it was mentioned around the Anasazi and the people who build with stones, who overwhelm the people who build with mud and rocks. But what does that say of men like Lanton, men who built with nothing, who built nothing at all in their entire lives that stood the test of time? If it were not for the witnesses and the account of this story, Glanton himself would be forgotten to time far faster than those who he attempted to kill for his own personal gain. So I'll go ahead and spoil it for you. Out of every member of the Glanton gang, there are only five survivors. The judge and the idiot, as mentioned earlier when they backed into the woods, the kid and Toadvine, and the ex-priest Tobin. Those are our only five survivors of this entire massacre. Well, there's six survivors if you count David Brown, who's still on his way back from killing the officer who helped him escape from jail. But five people survived the massacre, and six of the gang is alive in total. The story then cuts to Toadvine and the kid who are limping out of the woods, getting away from the castle. I keep calling it a castle, I think it's more accurately like a fortification, but castle sounds cooler. As they're running away, the kid is limping because he caught an arrow in the leg, and it's making it hard for him to run. Can you walk, said Toadvine. I ain't got no choice. How much water you got? Not much. What do you want to do? I don't know. We could ease back to the river and lay up, said Toadvine. Till what? He looked toward the fort again, and he looked at the broken shaft in the kid's leg and the welling blood. You want to try and pull that? No. 
What do you want to do? Go on. Similar to how at several points in the story, the kid wouldn't leave men that he was with even in dire straits, right here, Toadvine won't leave him. It's wild to look at this scene and think that the story began with the two of them ready to kill each other in the mud because they were walking on planks in the rain. And now standing here, running away from their burning empire and the ashes of it, being chased for dear life, Toadvine won't leave that kid. As they make it to a clearing, several of the Yumas are closing in on them. So the kid spins to the ground and pulls his pistol and begins to fire at them slowly, one at a time, eventually dropping all of their pursuers. The attack was quick and swift, and the men didn't think to grab all of their gear and equipment. So they're pretty much on foot, and the only weapon they have is the pistol that the kid is using. They make it to a well that's up ahead in the clearing, and whenever they get there, Tobin is already at the well. How many are you? He said. What you see, said Toadvine. All the rest gone under? Glanton, the judge? They didn't answer. They slid down to the floor of the well, where they stood a few inches of water, and they knelt and drank. As they're sitting there, more of the humans attack. So the kid lays up in the tree line and once again begins to shoot them as they arrive. Seemingly, the Yumas think that there's far more of them than there is of the Yumas, even though it's just one kid shooting back. So the Yumas begin to retreat, and for a moment, the three of them can rest. As they're resting there, Tobin asks how much ammo they got, and the kid says not much, only a few shots. Near sunset, as the three men are standing there, they see two figures walking up on them in the distance. The kid looks and cocks his gun to see who it might be, and sure enough, it was the judge and the imbecile. They were both of them naked, and they neared through the desert dawn like beings of a mode little more than tangential to the world at large. Their figures now quick with clarity, and now fugitive in the strangeness of the same light. Like things whose very portent renders them ambiguous. Like things so charged with meaning that their forms are dimmed. The three at the well watched mutely this transit out of the breaking day, and even though there was no longer any question as to what it was that approached, yet none would name it. They lumbered on, the judge a pale pink beneath his talk of dust like something newly born, the imbecile much the darker, lurching together across the pan at the very extremes of exile like some scurrilous king stripped of his vestiture and driven together with his fool into the wilderness to die. Man, he, McCarthy's got such a way with words. So as the judge makes his way to the rest of the men, one of maybe the most impressive moments in not only this book, but any book I've ever read, happens all at once. As I've explained it, I probably haven't done a great job at pointing out the subtlety with which a lot of the information I've shown you has been delivered. Like, I have highlighted the parts that I find to be important for an analysis of the story. I've read sections about the judge's declaration of war and things like the missing children, but keep in mind, everything I've told you about is strewn together with dozens of accounts of blood and death and murder and every other atrocity humanity is capable of committing. So while I'm cherry picking them to show you, everything that I talk about is muddled under this web of awful things. And what's so interesting about this story is it does an incredible job of convincing you that some things are simultaneously important and unimportant. It culminates in this scene that follows where Toadvine is standing in front of the judge and the judge is asking to buy Toadvine's hat because the judge is pale and being sunburned. Eventually, Toadvine asks for a hundred and a quarter and the judge agrees. And as this entire thing is happening, Tobin and the kid are standing at the edge of the well, several feet back from the judge, just glaring at him. And it was as I was reading that, that I almost supernaturally came to the same conclusion they were in real time as they were. The judge has always been this figure who exists not in the background necessarily, but as a constant within everything the gang does. Glinton may have been the leader, but the judge has certainly been a driving force in the gang's actions. And in this moment where the three of the men who were sitting around the well barely got out of the attack from the Yumas with their lives, we have the judge who comes up, and it's in that moment I realized the judge certainly has a knack for getting out of troubling situations. We've seen time and time again that the gang instrument scenarios to get their best outcome. 
If it's either killing the Apaches for money or making a deal with them to get more money. I mean, we saw that very recently with Glanton making a deal with both the Yumas and Lincoln and in the end, double crossing both. So don't you think it's a little suspicious that in this attack by the Yumas, the judge just so happened to be standing there with a cannon he dragged off of the mountaintop and into his quarters for just such an occasion. See, we have the judge's philosophy laid out in plain ink. He believes that war and murder is the most righteous and meaningful conquest that a man can aspire towards. So how do you think that guy felt when his gang leader decided to stop doing that and instead just rob people who come to the river? The night that Glanton comes back and the night they all have a massive party and are drunk and hungover, that is the day that the Yumas attack. I think that the judge orchestrated all of this. And I think that he decided if he wasn't going to get his murder and bloodshed with Glanton, then he'd simply get Glanton out of the picture. And of course, the judge wouldn't just leave the gang. As we saw at several points in the story, if there's one thing that he does have valor in, it's the gang sticks together. And to him, Glanton left that narrative. So there's only one solution for deserters. Even though it's never said in the text, I picked up on what Tobin and the kid were picking up on, that it's really convenient Glanton managed to back out of all of that completely naked through the woods, and now, in spite of everyone that he has known for years being dead at the side of the river, he's arguing with Toadvine about a hat. And this level of tension that exists between the judge and every other person in the world starts to make itself known. The judge wiped his mouth and looked at the figures above him. How are you fixed for weapons, he said. The kid had set one foot over the edge of the pit and now he drew it back. Tobin did not move. He was watching the judge. We've just the one pistol, Holden. We, said the judge. The lad here. The kid had risen to his feet again. The ex-priest stood by him. The judge in the floor of the well likewise rose and he adjusted his hat and gripped the valis under his arm like some immense and naked barrister whom the country had crazed. Weigh your counsel, priest, he said. We are all here together. Yonder sun is like the eye of God, and we will cook impartially upon this great salacious griddle, I do assure you. I am no priest and I have no counsel, said Tobin. The lad is a free agent. The judge smiled. Quite so, he said. He looked at Toadvine and he smiled up at the ex-priest again. What then, he said. Are we to drink at these holes turn about like rival bands of apes? The ex-priest looked at the kid. They stood facing the sun. He squatted, the better to address the judge below. Do you think that there is a registry where you can file on the wells of the desert? Ah, priest, you know those offices more readily than I. I have no claim here. I've told you before, I'm a simple man. You know you're welcome to come down here and to drink and to fill your flask. Tobin didn't move. Let me have the canteen, said the kid. He'd taken the pistol from his belt and he handed it to the ex-priest and took the leather bottle and descended the bank. There is a palpable tension between the men at the well. The judge is telling Tobin and the kid that they can just come down to the water and drink to their fill and there's no need to worry. And the kid, who is openly cautious of him now, hands his gun to Tobin before he goes down to the water to fill his canteen. That way the judge can't try to attack him and just take the gun. Because if the judge gets a hold of you, there's nothing you can do to fight back. Eventually, the kid fills the canteen with water, and as he backs away from the well, he looks at Tovine and says, Are you going with us? Tovine looked at the judge. I don't know, he said. I'm subject to arrest. They'll arrest me in California. Arrest you? Toadvine didn't answer. He was sitting in the sand, and he made a tripod of three fingers, and stuck them in the sand before him, and then he lifted and turned them and poked them in again, so that there were six holes in the form of a star or a hexagon, and then he rubbed them out again. He looked up. You wouldn't think that a man run plumb out of country out here, would you? The kid rose and slung the flask by its strap over his shoulder. His trouser leg was black with blood, and the bloody stump of the shaft jutted from his thigh like a peg for hanging implements upon. He spat and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand, and he looked at Toadvine. It ain't country you've run out of, he said. Then he made his way across the sink 
and up the bank. The judge followed him with his eyes, and when the kid reached the sunlight at the top, he turned and looked back, and the judge was holding open the satchel between his naked thighs. Five hundred dollars, he said, powder and ball included. The ex-priest was at the kid's side. Do him, he hissed. The kid took the pistol, but the ex-priest clung to his arm, whispering, and when the kid pulled away, he spoke aloud. Such was his fear. You'll get no second chance, lad. Do it. He is naked. He is unarmed. God's blood. Do you think you'll best him any other way? Do it, lad. Do it for the love of God. Do it, or I swear your life is forfeit. The judge smiled. He tapped his temple. The priest, he said. The priest has been too long in the sun. Seventy-five, and that's my best offer. It's a seller's market. The kid put the pistol in his belt. Then with the ex-priest at his elbow, importunate, he circled the crater and they set out west across the pan. Toadvine climbed up and watched them. After a while, there was nothing to see. This is the breaking point for a lot of characters and a lot of tension that's been building through the story. There's been these brief mentions by Tobin, the ex-priest. Whenever the kid mentions the judge out loud or whenever the kid goes to help the judge, it seems Tobin is trying to protect him from something. He's trying to keep the kid away from him. And in this moment, that all culminates. See, this is the part of the story that uh, even people who are really big fans of the story find controversial because it's never outright said. Uh, but I think it's pretty well applied um, or implied, especially because of the historical aspect of this. So believe it or not, as I mentioned earlier, the Glanton gang is based on a real gang that was recorded by Samuel Chamberlain. And on top of that, Judge Holden, the judge, seems to be a real person, at least according to Chamberlain's report. In his book, My Confession, which again is about Samuel Chamberlain's time with the Glanton gang, Chamberlain in one section says this, the second in command, now left in charge of the camp, was a man of gigantic size called Judge Holden of Texas. Who or what he was, no one knew. But a cooler-blooded villain never went unhung. He stood six feet six in his moccasins, had a large, fleshy frame, a dull, tallow-colored face, destitute of hair and all expression. While he's described here as being very tall and large, Terms like dull tallow just mean he was kind of pale. And the phrase hairless is a phrase that was used back then, or a word that was used back then, to describe men who didn't have facial hair. So Chamberlain isn't saying that the judge was a albino man with alopecia, that there's no hair on his body. Instead, he's just saying that he's a pale guy who's clean shaven. Uh, but in McCarthy's rendition, he takes that to the extreme limits and makes him a completely hairless man who's also albino. Further to mystify this portrayal of the character. Chamberlain continues his account and says, Holden was by far the best educated man in northern Mexico. He conversed with all in their own language, spoke in several Indian lingos. At a fandango, would take the harp or the guitar from the hands of the musicians and charm all with his wonderful performance and outwaltz any Poblana of the ball. He was plum sinner with a rifle or revolver, a daring horseman, acquainted with the nature of all the strange plants and their botanical names, great in geology and mineralogy, in short, another admirable Crichton, and with all, an errant coward. Not but that he possessed enough courage to fight the Indians and Mexicans or anyone else where he had the advantage in strength, skill, and weapons. But where the combat would be equal, he would avoid it if possible. I hated him at first sight, and he knew it. Yet nothing could be more gentle and kind than his deportment towards me. He would often seek conversation with me and speak of Massachusetts, and to my astonishment, I found that he knew more about Boston than I did. For one, it's insane to think that Judge Holden was perhaps a real person, someone who was versed in art and language and politics, who was out among these killers, these monsters, hunting the countryside for native scalps, and eventually Mexican scalps and anyone who has dark hair. That's something that actually comes from the historical record as well. But you already knew all of that as related to the story, right? You knew all of the stuff about him being a master of the arts and a guitarist and what have you. 
So why am I bringing this up now? Well, I'm bringing this up now because there's a portion of Chamberlain's account I skipped over that I wanted to save now because this is the part that's relevant. While continuing his story about Judge Holden, Chamberlain says this, His desires was blood and women, and terrible stories were circulated in camp of horrid crimes committed by him when bearing another name in the Cherokee Nation and Texas, and before we left Frontiers, a little girl of 10 years was found in the chaparral, foully violated and murdered. The mark of a huge hand on her little throat pointed him out as the ravisher, as no other man had such a hand. But though all suspected, no one charged him with the crime. So it seems that both the historic Judge Holden, as well as the Judge Holden of this story, is a serial child predator. All those mentions that I brought up of wherever the gang went, there would be children found naked and bloodied, crushed to death. It... It's hard to explain whenever you read the story through normally, but you don't instantly connect all the dots. See, again, there's so many mentions of murder and descriptions of carcasses that are found horrifically mutilated and all manner of atrocities against people. But everywhere the gang goes, there is this continuous wrapping of children being found uh, either dead, like the boy who was inside, of the house with the vagrants, um, who it says he was naked and found dead in one of the cubicles. There's the mentions of the cities they go to whenever they're out on the bender, and they find the either remains or just the clothes of little girls who go missing. And then there's things like the judge holding candy out to kids who are passing on the street, trying to hand it off to them, but all of them being too afraid of him. Or that mention, whenever the judge walks out of the fortress holding the cannon under his arm, that he was completely naked and there was a naked child in the room with him as well. And it seems that everyone else in the gang is aware of this. Remember that line I pointed out earlier, whenever they are in that office building, uh, or like the, the cubicles, the place where the, the five vagrants were staying with the horse that had its face bit by a snake, that whole thing. Whenever they get in there, the judge looks at the boy and asks, whose is it? And the men say they don't know. And it says the Glanton spits and shakes his head. When I initially read that through, I thought that was Glanton shaking his head at the concept of this child being orphaned. But what it seems it actually was is that Glanton knew what the judge's intentions were with that child. It seems that a lot of men knew and they just never said anything about it. Tobin constantly trying to keep the kid back from the judge time and time again. And it seems that throughout the story, not with everyone else, because everyone else in this gang might as well be, you know, child murdering savages anyway, but whatever little part of religion or morality or sanctity is left inside of Tobit, no matter how small, it seems that now, standing between the kid and the judge, that piece of him ignites. And standing there, even though there is no evidence, the story has not said anything explicitly, the judge is responsible of those crimes, or that he planned the massacre of Glanton and most of the gang, in that moment it snaps for Tobin, and he yells to the kid, shoot him, shoot him now, your soul will be forfeit if you don't. And it, again, it's really hard to explain how well this story puts it together. Even though nothing is ever said about it, the moment that Tobin yells that, you know exactly why he's saying it. You connect the pieces at the same rate the characters do, or more specifically, at the same rate the kid does. And then that final conversation between the kid and Toadvine, where the kid asks Toadvine if he's gonna come with him, and Toadvine says, I'll be arrested in California. You wouldn't figure a man could run out of country out here. And the kid says, it ain't country you've run out of. Oh, it's so good. Toadvine, perhaps none the wiser to what's going on, or perhaps just willing to accept whatever fate lies in front of him, decides to stick behind with the judge until Tobin and the kid leave. And it's almost, it, it's like the kid and Tobin, because Toadvine won't come with them, it's like they're leaving Toadvine to a, a monster, like a lion. They're leaving him in the lion's den as they slowly back out. And I'll go ahead and tell you, this is the last time that they ever see Toadvine alive. They see him sitting there with the judge at the well. 
They walk away and the kid never speaks to Toadvine again. So as Tobin and the kid are walking away, who do they run into but David Brown, who is still riding back from his jail escape in San Diego. Again, Brown has no idea of anything that's happened. The two walk up to Brown and say, We heard you were in the Gisgato, said Tobin. I was, said Brown. I ain't now. His eyes cataloged them in every part. He looked at the piece of arrow shaft protruding from the kid's leg, and he looked into the ex-priest's eyes. Where's your outfits, he said. You're looking at him. You fall out with Glanton? Glanton's dead. Brown spat a dry white spot in the vast and broken plate lend. He had a small stone in his mouth against the thirst, and he shifted it with his jaw and looked at them. The Yumas, he said. Aye, said the ex-priest. All rubbed out? Toadvine and the judge are at the well back yonder. The judge, said Brown. The horses stared bleakly at the crazed stone floor whereon they stood. The rest gone under? Smith? Dorsey? The black man? All, said Tobin. Brown looked east across the desert. How far to the well? We left about an hour past daybreak. Is he armed? He is not. He studied their faces. The priests don't lie, he said. No one spoke. He sat fingering the scapular of dried ears, and then he turned the horse and rode on, leading the riderless animal behind. He rode watching back at them, then he stopped again. Did you see him dead? he called. Glanton? I did, called the ex-priest, for he had so. He rode on, turned slightly in the saddle, the rifle on his knee. He kept watch behind him on those pilgrims and they on him. When he was well diminished on the pan, they turned and went on. It's like Brown coming back and hearing that the judge is alive. The first thing he asks is, is the judge unarmed? It's like everyone knew that the judge had always been on a leash. Under his own will, he had decided to be tame compared to what he would be as long as Glanton was alive, as long as Glanton was the leader. But now that Glanton's dead, it's like the judge is a rabid dog for the first time unchained. Everyone is afraid of him and what he might do. And it seems that Brown, even though he has guns and he knows the judge is unarmed, is scared making his way towards him. The next day, the kid and Tobin are kneeled down next to a river drinking water when suddenly a bullet skips off the water right next to the kid's face. He throws himself back on the ground and spins around to see that the bullet came from the judge, now wearing the clothing of both Toadvine and Brown and holding Brown's rifle. The judge is reloading as he's making his way towards them and Tobin and the kid both scamper off into the brush next to the river trying to hide. The scene that follows, I cannot do justice here. I highly recommend, again, if any of the story is interesting, you read this part for yourself. The judge is tramping through the brush, holding a rifle while looking for the kid and Tobin. And the kid, who's still injured from the arrow in his leg, can't stand up to run. So instead, he's crawling through the grass, hoping that the judge won't step on top of him, as the judge begins to yell and mock him. Hello, called the judge, his voice off to the west, as if there were new riders to the creek and he addressed them. The kid lay listening. There were no new riders. After a while, the judge called out again. Come out, he called. There's plenty of water for everybody. The kid had swung the powder flask around to his back to keep it out of the creek, and he held the pistol up and waited. Upstream, the horses had stopped drinking. Then they started drinking again. When he moved out on the far side of the creek, he came upon the hand and foot tracks left by the ex-priest among the prints of the cats and foxes and the little desert pigs. As he crawls through the grass, he sees the horses stop and look at something, then look back down. He hears brush break in the other direction. Everything around him implies that the judge could be on top of him at any minute. Eventually, while crawling around, the kid finds Tobin's tracks and begins to follow them. When he catches up to Tobin, he sees that Tobin has used bones to construct a makeshift crucifix, thinking that perhaps the judge is the devil himself. Tobin stands up and holds the cross up and begins yelling incantations at the judge. And as he does, the judge pulls out his rifle and shoots Tobin. He found Tobin kneeling in the creek, bathing his wound with a piece of linen torn from his shirt. The ball had passed completely through his neck. It had narrowly missed the carotid artery, 
yet he could not make the blood to stop. He looked at the kid, crouched among the skulls and upturned red tines. You've got to kill the horses, he said. You've no other chance out of here. He'll ride you down. We could take the horses. Don't be a fool, lad. What other bait has he? We can get out as soon as it comes dark. Do you think there will be no day again? The kid watched him. Will it not stop, he said. It will not. What do you think? I've got to stop it. The blood was running between his fingers. Where's the judge, said the kid. Where indeed? If I kill him, we can take the horses. You'll not kill him. Don't be a fool. Shoot the horses. The kid looked off up the shallow Sandy Creek. Go on, lad. I like that mention of the line when the kid says they can leave it dark and the priest says, what, do you think it will never be day again? As long as there is a sun on the earth, the judge will hunt us down. So the kid sneaks his way around, finds the judge's horses, and kills them. As soon as he fires, he ducks back into the grass and begins to hide once more. Throw that gun out now, said the judge. He froze. The voice was not 50 feet away. I know what you've done. The priest put you up to it, and I'll take that as a mitigation in the act and the intent, which I would any man in his wrongdoing. But there's the question of property. You bring me the pistol now. The kid lay without moving. He heard the judge wade the creek upstream. He lay counting slowly under his breath. When the roiled water reached him, he stopped counting and let go on the current, a dry twist of grass, and told it away downstream. At the same count, it was scarcely out of sight among the bones. He moved out of the water and looked at the sun and began to make his way to where he'd left Tobin. You want to talk about a smart move? He heard way up the river that the judge walk through the water. And as soon as he heard him step into the water, he started counting for when the ripples of water got to him. At the same time, he reset the count and dropped grass on the water and counted to see how far it went in the same amount of time so he could have an idea for how far upriver the judge is. The kid makes it back to Tobin and as the two of them are hiding, it says while talking about the judge, he called out points of jurisprudence. He cited cases. He expounded upon those laws pertaining to property rights in Beast Mansuit, and he quoted from cases of attainder insofar as he reckoned them germane to the corruption of blood in the prior and felonious owners of the horses now dead among the bones. Then he spoke of other things. The ex-priest leaned to the kid. Don't listen, he said. I ain't listening. Stop your ears. So now the judge is just stampering around in the grass talking about case law of dead horses and gun property and all kinds of stuff, just, I guess, trying to convince the kid that it's safe to come out. Eventually, at night, the two of them slip away, and they get into the open desert, and then, when they think they're safe, the judge and the fool show up again. Until the afternoon, Tobin and the kid hobble their way through the desert, and they're slowly running out of water, and between their injuries, they can't keep going much longer. It's at this time that the kid begins to notice that the wind's picking up, and the wind itself is covering their tracks in the sand, making it hard for the judge to track them, even though they can still see him out on the distant horizon. We gotta hide, he said. Hide? Yes. Where do you aim to hide? Here, we'll hide here. You can't hide, lad. We can hide. You think you can't follow your track? The wind's taking it. It's gone from the slope yonder. Gone? Ever trace. The ex-priest shook his head. Come on, we gotta get going. You can't hide. Get up. The ex-priest shook his head. Ha, ah, lad, he said. Get up, said the kid. Go on, go on. He waved his hand. There's, again, been several points in the story up until now where people have done the same thing to the kid. He, they continue to brush him off and say, oh, go on without me. And the kid never leaves him. But this time, the kid is getting tired of hearing people close to him tell him to leave them. So the kid spoke to him. He ain't nothing. You told me so yourself. Men are made of the dust of the earth. You said so. It was no para, 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 parable. No parable. That it was a naked fact and the judge was a man like all men. Face him down then, said the ex-priest. Face him down if he is so. And him with the rifle and me with the pistol? Him with two rifles. Get up from there. Tobin rose. He stood unsteadily. He leaned against the kid. They set out, veering off from the drifted track and down past the wagon. 
it's fulfilling that after so many times of the kid being told to leave and to save himself and him ignoring their request, and the kid's very short-winded through the story, he doesn't speak a lot, but here with Tobin, someone who he probably, arguably with Tobvine, cares about more than anyone else in the group, when Tobin tells the kid to leave him, the kid yells back and says, he ain't nothing, the judge ain't nothing. It's not like one of your parables that you always tell me about. This is a true fact. The judge is made from dirt and dirt can bleed. Whenever the judge comes up over the hillside into the little valley that Tobin and the kid are hiding in, it says that the judge, he has all his weapons and the clothing, but that he has made a small parasol out of bones and old hide. And he also has the idiot chained to a leather leash. So not only is he decked out with guns walking through the desert, but I guess on account of his, you know, albino nature, he has a small umbrella to shield himself from the sun, and he has a crazed man on a leash like a dog. It's some, like, weirdly bizarro version of a woman with an umbrella walking her poodle during a day out shopping, but it is this judge, this massive man, this monster, hunting down a child and an ex-priest. The judge and the idiot glance around them and then walk through the area. And after they leave, Tobin and the kid begin to discuss what they're even going to do now. As they're discussing going back to the creek, they look up and the judge is now walking back towards them. As the judge is walking through the area, he begins to yell, That priest has led you to this, boy. I know you would not hide. I know, too, that you've not the heart of a common assassin. I've passed before your gun sights twice this hour, and will pass a third time. Why not show yourself? No assassin, called the judge, and no partisan either. There's a flawed place in the fabric of your heart. Do you think I could not know? You alone were mutinous. You alone reserved in your soul some corner of clemency for the heathen. The imbecile stood and raised its hands to its face and yammered weirdly and sat again. You think I've killed Brown and Toadvine? They are alive as you and me. They are alive and in possession of the fruits of their election. Do you understand? Ask the priest. The priest knows. The priest does not lie. The judge raised the parasol and adjusted his parcels. Perhaps, he called, perhaps you have seen this place in a dream that you would die here. And he descended the esker, passed once more across the boneyard, led by the tethered fool, until the two were shimmering and insubstantial in the waves of the heat, and then they were gone altogether. I'm going to come back to that line the judge says about the kid being mutinous. I'll come back to that at the end of the story. Uh, but we have here for now is the judge is yelling. He says that Brown and Toadvine are still alive, and then he just continues to walk across the desert. So Tobin and the kid continue to wander across the desert into the night until at the point where they're ready to fall to the ground dead, they are saved by a group of Indians. They were members of the Diagino tribe and they see these two people nearly dead on the floor of the desert and decide to bring them back into their homes. The Diagonists feed them and treat their wounds and whenever they ask what happened to him, Tobin and the kid just say that it was the Yumas and the members of the tribe simply nod and continue to take care of the two men. I don't think I have to say how profound this is, uh, at least, you know, in sense of the narrative, that both of these men made their living and became successful by hunting down and killing natives indiscriminately. And now their life is saved at the point of death by natives of the region. It also leans back on my theory for what the ending of this story is, but again, we're almost there. Eventually, Tobin and the kid make it to San Diego, and for the first time, the two of them step out to see the sea, something that the kid has never seen before. As the kid goes to see the sea, Tobin continues to work his way through the streets looking for a doctor. While the kid no longer has a shaft sticking out of his leg, the arrowhead is still inside of his thigh. After the kid's done looking at the ocean, he goes to a local tavern, and nearly as soon as he sits down, a group of police come to arrest him. The kid's thrown into jail, and he wakes up the next day, and who is standing outside of his jail other than the judge? The judge is wearing a nice linen coat, and it seems that he's been invited into the prison 
by one of the deputies of the prison itself. Looking down on the kid and smiling, the judge begins. Well, he said, how are you? The kid didn't answer. They wanted to know from me if you were always crazy, said the judge. They said it was the country. The country turned them out. Where's Tobin? I told them that the Cretan had been a respected doctor of divinity from Harvard College as recently as March of this year, that his wits had stood him as far west as the Aquarius Mountains. It was the ensuing country that carried them off, together with his clothes. And Toadvine and Brown, where are they? In the desert, where you left them. A cruel thing. Your companions in arms? The judge shook his head. What do they aim to do with me? I believe it is their intention to hang you. What did you tell them? Told them the truth, that you were the person responsible. Not that we have all the details, but they understand that it was you and none other who shaped events along such a calamitous course, eventuating in the massacre at the ford by the savages with whom you conspired. Means and ends are of little moment here, idle speculations. But even though you carry the draft of your murderous plan with you to the grave, it will nonetheless be known in all its infamy to your maker, and as that is so, so shall it be made known to the least of men, all in the fullness of time. You're the one that's crazy, said the kid. The judge smiled. No, he said, it was never me. But why lurk there in the shadows? Come here where we can talk, you and me. The kid stood against the far wall hardly more than a shadow himself. Come up, said the judge. Come up, for I have yet more to tell you. He looked down the hallway. Don't be afraid, he said. I'll speak softly. It's not for the world's ears, but for yours only. Let me see you. Don't you know that I'd have loved you like a son? Huh. Oh, oh, I haven't, oh, I haven't read that line since I, uh, since I thought about what the judge has been doing to kids through the whole story. Oh, that's so bad. Okay. All right. Ooh, that... Sorry, I got cold everywhere. Just that line spoken about that. Anyway, okay. Sorry. Uh, he reached through the bars. Come here, he said. Let me touch you. Oh, no, it gets worse. Oh, I, have, I haven't read this portion since I thought about what the judge does. Oh, no. He says, I love you like a son. Then says, let me touch you throwing his hands through the bars. Oh my gosh. Imagine the judge, this monster of a man. Ugh. Okay. Ah, this story bothers me in so many different parts. This is one of them. Um, the kid stood with his back to the wall. Come here if you're not afraid, whispered the judge. I ain't afraid of you. The judge smiled. He spoke softly into the dim mud cubicle. You came forward, he said, to take part in a work but you were a witness against yourself. You said in judgment on your own deeds. You put your own allowances before the judgments of history and you broke with the body of which you were pledged apart and poisoned it in all its enterprise. Hear me, man. I spoke in the desert for you and you only and you turned a deaf ear to me. If war is not holy, man is nothing but antic clay. Even the Cretan acted in good faith according to his parts, for it was required of no man to give more than he possessed, nor was any man's share compared to another's. Only each was called upon to empty out his heart into the common, and one did not. Can you tell me who that one was? It was you, whispered the kid. You were the one. The judge watched him through the bars. He shook his head. What joins men together, he said, is not the sharing of bread, but the sharing of enemies. But if I was your enemy, with whom would you have shared me? With whom? The priest. Where is he now? Look at me. Our animosities were formed and waiting before ever we two met. Yet even so, you could have changed it all. You, said the kid, it was you. It was never me, said the judge. Listen to me. Do you think Glanton was a fool? Don't you know he'd have killed you? Lies, said the kid. Lies, by God, lies. Think again, said the judge. He never took part in your craziness. The judge smiled. He took his watch from his waistcoat and opened it and held it to the failing light. For even if you should have stood your ground, he said, yet what ground was it? 
He looked up. He pressed the case shut and restored the instrument to his person. Time to be going, he said. I have errands. So there are two ways to view that section. Uh, one of them is that the judge is crazy. And while that kind of may sound like a cop-out, I do think there is some, maybe not evidence, but there's some weight that opinion has from the text. Uh, there's instances where the judge launches into diatribes that make sense to him, but don't seem appropriate for the moment. Maybe he's so riddled with violence in his head that he kind of sees the world the way he thinks it should be, rather than how it actually is. Uh, or in other words, he's not smart, he's just making stuff up. Um, which might be true in some part, but I don't really agree with. What I agree with more is this is the second emphasis on the judge's belief system. It's similar to in the desert when he called the kid mutinous. Here he's saying that the kid set out on something important, something of a higher calling, war, death, destruction, and that he turned his back on himself. By not committing fully to the gang, and I'll talk about what that means to me in a moment, but by not committing fully to the gang, he calls the kid a traitor, that everything that happened was his fault. The kid counters back and says, you were the traitor, you were the one who sold us out, but the judge says that the kid betrayed himself and therefore the rest of the gang. It also further lays on my theory that the judge planned everything out because it says what the judge told the police to have the kid arrested is that the massacre at the Colorado River was done by the kid who conspired with the Yumas to kill everyone at the river that day. Now, if the Yuma attack was completely random, why would the judge come up with this story of there being an entire conspiracy. That must mean the police are looking for a conspiracy or a planning in some regard, right? So I think the judge planned with the Yumas to kill everyone at the ferry and then just pinned everything on the kid. Over the next few days, the kid explains to the men in the jail where all the treasures that the Glanton gang had amassed are now located. The court, seeing that the kid is being honest and also realizing that he is a kid who was surrounded by much older, much more evil men, decide to just let the kid go. Eventually, the kid finds a doctor to remove the piece from his leg, and it says that during his dream while he's on the table and most other dreams he has after this, he thinks of the judge, the constant looming presence always in his mind. In June, while traveling through the city of Los Angeles, the kid sees a public hanging of two people. He's too far away from the hanging itself to see who they are or what they look like, but after they're hung, he comes back later that evening and it's none other but Toadvine and David Brown. So it seems the judge was right. He didn't kill them out there in the woods. He maybe just beat them or tied them up or convinced them to give to the judge their clothing and weapons. But either way, the judge was right. He didn't kill them. Maybe the judge was also right about Tobin and saying that Tobin simply went mad and was now locked up in some sanitarium. It would explain why there at the end of the river, he builds a makeshift crucifix and holds it up and begins to yell at the judge. Uh, but I also kind of interpret that as Tobin making a distraction so that the kid could get a shot off. It depends on your interpretation, but perhaps the judge was right in saying Tobin was crazy because here he was right about Toadvine and Brown not being killed in the desert. But again, nevertheless, they were killed here. And the last time the kid ever spoke to Toadvine was when he left him at that well sitting next to the judge. During this time, the kid seems to be destitute. He saw a boy who kind of looked like the idiot or the fool in a window of a house, so he runs to the room to see who it is, only to have the door opened and see that it's some other unrelated fool, uh, and the kid walks off defeated. He asks about the priest and Tobin until he eventually quits and decides there's gonna be no way he can find him, and Tobin's never mentioned again. With his last two dollars, he goes to the coroner and buys the necklace of ears that was hanging on David Brown whenever he was hung. These ears pass from Bath Cat to Dave Brown and now to the kid. So from here, the kid grows and eventually becomes the man. By the time he's 28 years old, he's been working odd jobs for years throughout California and the American West, everything from cattle farmers, to factory workers, to port workers. It seems that as he gets older, the kid has decided to change his life, at least in small ways. He never learned to read, but regardless, it says that the kid begins to carry a Bible. He begins to take jobs 
escorting people through the American West who otherwise would be completely unprotected to do so. One day while out on one of these journeys, he sees an entire parade of people who have just been massacred. There are bodies and blood all across the desert, something that he's very familiar with. But what the man, previously the kid, does now that he wouldn't have done back then, is in the midst of all of this blood and bodies, he sees an old woman curled up underneath a rock. He made his way among the corpses and stood before her. She was very old and her face was gray and leathery and sand had collected in the folds of her clothing. She did not look up. The shawl that covered her head was much faded of its color, yet it bore like a patent woven into the fabric the figures of stars and quarter moons and other insignia of a province unknown to him. He spoke to her in a low voice. He told her that he was an American and that he was a long way from the country of his birth and that he had no family and that he had traveled much and seen many things and had been at war and endured hardships. He told her that he would convey her to a safe place. Some party of her country people who would welcome her and that she should join them for he could not leave her in this place or she would surely die. He knelt on one knee, resting the rifle before him like a staff. Abuelita, he said. He reached into the little cove and touched her arm. She moved slightly, her whole body light and rigid. She weighed nothing. She was just a dried shell and she had been dead in that place for years. This is so much different from what the kid was, what any member of the Glanton gang was. He's now more of the stereotypical cowboy, the hero, who's looking for people who need his help across the American West. And he sees this woman who he thinks to be alone, and he walks to her and starts empathizing. He talks about how he's a man who has lost his country and lost his way, but that he's a fighter, that he knows how to come out of it, and he's going to do whatever it takes to keep her safe. And when he reaches out and touches her, she is the bones of something that once existed, but is now no more. Or in other words, the kid seems to be too late. The kid has conversations with buffalo hunters, which is symbolic as both of them had a habit of hunting a thing nearly out of existence. One night while out in a valley, he's approached by a group of young men who are also out in the wilderness. They sit around the fire with the man and begin to talk, and eventually the man shows the group his collection of ears, that again he got off of David Brown. One of the boys in the group, a boy named Elrod, says that the man's a liar. And with everything the man says about his past, Elrod continuously says that he's a liar. Eventually the man stops and says, you ain't calling me a liar, are you son? I ain't your son. How old are you? That's some more of your business. How old are you? He's 15. You hush your damn mouth. He turned to the man. He don't speak for me, he said. He's done spoke. I was 15 years old when I was first shot. I ain't never been shot. You ain't 16 yet, neither. <laughs> Again, the kid now called the man. Just his matter of fact statements. I was your age when I got shot. Well, I haven't been shot. Oh, you want to fix that? You ain't 16 yet, neither. You aim to shoot me? I aim to try to keep from it. Come on, Elrod. You ain't going to shoot nobody. Maybe in the back or them asleep. Elrod, we're gone. I knowed you for what you was when I seen you. You better go on. Sit there and talk about shooting somebody. They ain't nobody done it yet. The other four stood at the limits of the firelight. The youngest of them was casting glances out at the dark sanctuary of the prairie night. Go on, the man said. They're waiting on you. He spat into the man's fire and wiped his mouth. That night, whenever the man goes to sleep... He's awoken by the 15-year-old boy standing over his bed, ready to shoot him with a rifle. The man rolls out of bed and pulls his revolver and aims it at the kid and says, you wouldn't have lived anyway, before he pulls the trigger. The next day, the boy's friends come up and take his body away, and the man sits there and watches as the 15-year-old's much younger brother looks at him and looks back at his dead brother and then walks him off the trail. There is an intense nihilism about this scene, at least to me. Other people interpret it differently, but whenever I first read this, it's like, at the beginning of the story, the man who was then the kid was in this exact position. He was young, dumb, and violent. Like he said there, I took my first bullet when I was 15 at that river boat in Louisiana. And there's something 
narratively, like obviously I understand why logistically the man shot the kid or the man shot the boy because the boy was about to shoot him. Like it makes sense. But there's something so narratively dark about it that that kid was in the exact same position I was once in and I got better. But this kid doesn't get that chance and he fires. Specifically with the phrase he uses where he says, you wouldn't have lived anyway. What a way to look back on effectively a figure, a representation of yourself. So one night after this, the man is riding along the Brazos River and he decides to stop in a bar that is hosting some kind of entertainment. Whenever the man steps into the bar, he sees that this entertainment is a dancing bear. A bear that is wearing a suit and it is doing a dance as a small girl spins a music box for the bear to dance to. As the man walks in and sits down at the bar, he looks into the mirror behind the barman, and who else does he see on the other side of the restaurant except for the judge? The judge is staring back at him through that mirror, and for a moment his blood runs cold as this man he's feared for years and years, perhaps even convinced himself it was part of some bad dream, is now right there in the reflection. As this is happening, the showman who is presenting the bear to everyone is walking through the crowd taking donations and gets into a fight with one of the bar patrons. In response, the bar patron pulls his pistol and shoots the bear dead on stage. As the man is watching this, the little girl stops playing the music box and begins to cry over the dead bear saying, it's all over, it's all over. Do you believe it's all over, son? He turned. The judge was standing at the bar looking down at him. He smiled, he removed his hat. The great pale dome of his skull shone like an enormous phosphorant egg in the lamplight. The last of the true, the last of the true. I'd say they're all gone under now, saving me and thee, would you not? He tried to see past him. The great corpus enshadowed him from all beyond. He could hear the woman announcing the commencement of dancing in the hall to the rear. And some are not yet born who shall have cause to curse the dolphin soul, said the judge. He turned slightly. Plenty of time for the dance. I ain't studying no dance. The judge smiled. The judge continues to make the man uncomfortable. He leans over the bar now unattended and steals a bottle and begins drinking. The man says, I gotta go. The judge looked aggrieved. Go, he said. He nodded. He reached and took hold of his hat where it lay on the bar, but he did not take it up and he did not move. What man would not be a dancer if he could, said the judge. It's a great thing, the dance. Drink up, he said, drink up. This night thy soul may be required of thee. Oh, oh, these lines. Oh, they're so brutal when you know where this goes. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry I keep freaking out over it. It's, it's a good book. Anyway, he looked at the glass. The judge smiled and gestured with the bottle. He took up the glass and drank. The judge watched him. Was it always your idea, he said, that if you do not speak, you would not be recognized? You seen me. The judge ignored this. I recognized you when I first saw you, and yet you were a disappointment to me, then and now. Even so, at the last, I find you here with me. I ain't with you. The judge raised his bald brow. Not, he said. He looked about him in a puzzled and artful way, and he was a passable thespian. I never come here hunting you. What then, said the judge. What would I want with you? I come here same reason as any man. And what reason is that? What reason is what? That these men are here. They come here to have a good time. The judge watched him. He began to point out various men in the room and to ask if these men were here for a good time or if indeed they knew why they were here at all. Everybody don't have to have a reason to be someplace. That's so, said the judge. They do not have to have a reason, but order is not set aside because of their indifference. The judge turns to the room and says, this is an orchestration for an event, for a dance in fact. The participants will be apprised of their roles at the proper time. For now, it is enough that they have arrived. As the dance is the thing with which we are concerned and contains complete within itself its own arrangement and history and finale, there is no necessity that the dancers contain these things within themselves as well. 
In any event, the history of all is not the history of each, nor indeed the sum of those histories, and none here can finally comprehend the reason for his presence, for he has no way of knowing even in what the event consists. In fact, were he to know, he might well absent himself, and you can see that he cannot be any part of the plan if plan there be. He smiled, his great teeth shone, he drank. An event, a ceremony, the orchestration thereof, the overture carries certain marks of decisiveness. It includes the slaying of a large bear. The evening's progress will not appear strange or unusual even to those who question the rightness of the event so ordered. A ceremony, then. One could well argue that there are not categories of no ceremony, but only ceremonies of greater or lesser degree, and deferring to this argument, we will say that this is a ceremony of a certain magnitude, perhaps more commonly called a ritual. A ritual includes the letting of blood. Rituals which fail in this requirement are but mock rituals. Here, every man knows the false at once. Never doubt it. That feeling in the breast that evokes a child's memory of loneliness, such as when the others have gone and only the game is left with its solitary participant. A solitary game without an opponent. Where only the rules are at hazard, don't look away, we are not speaking in mysteries. You of all men are no stranger to that feeling, the emptiness and the despair. It is that which we take arms against, is it not? It's not blood, the tempering agent, and the mortar which bonds... The judge leaned closer. What do you think death is, man? Of whom do we speak when we speak of a man who was and is not? Are these blind riddles, or are they not some part of every man's jurisdiction? What is death if not an agency? And whom does he intend toward? The judge is saying that they are here for this dance. The people who are a part of this event are there for this dance and no one knows what the dance will entail whenever they step into it no one knows what the ritual is going to be but they know that they are a part of it and that's all that they can know when the men here showed up for a dance they did not know that a slain of the bear would be on the itinerary but they did show up for a dance and anything that dance may contain their place at the table was set before they even knew what was going to be served a man seeks his own destiny and no other, said the judge, will or nil. Any man who could discover his own fate and elect therefore some opposite course could only come at last to that self-same reckoning at the same appointed time, for each man's destiny is as large as the world he inhabits and contains within it all opposites as well. This desert upon which so many have been broken is vast and calls for largeness of heart, but it is also ultimately empty. It is hard. It is barren. Its very nature is stone. He poured the tumbler full. Drink up, he said. The world goes on. We have dancing nightly, and this night is no exception. The straight and the winding way are one, and now that you are here, what do the years count since last we two met together? Men's memories are uncertain, and the past that was differs little from the past that was not. He took up the tumbler, and the judge had poured, and he drank and set it down again. He looked at the judge. I've been everywhere, he said. This is just one more place. The judge arched his brow. Did you post witnesses, he said, to report to you on the continuing existence of those places once you quit them? That's crazy. It is? Where is yesterday? Where is Glanton and Brown? Where's the priest? He leaned closer. Where's Shelby, whom you left to the mercies of Elias in the desert? And where is Tate, whom you abandoned in the mountains? Where are the ladies? Ah, the fair and tender ladies with whom you danced at the governor's ball when you were a hero anointed with the blood of the enemies of the republic you elected to defend. And where is the fiddler? And where's the dance? I guess you can tell me. I tell you this, as war becomes dishonored and its nobility called into question, those honorable men who recognize the sanctity of blood will become excluded from the dance, which is the warrior's right, and thereby will the dance become a false dance, and the dancers false dancers. And yet there will be one there always who is a true dancer, and can you guess who that might be? You ain't nothing. 
You, you speak truer than you know. But I will tell you, only that man who has offered up himself entire to the blood of war, who has been to the floor of the pit and seen horror in the round and learned at last that it speaks to his inmost heart, only that man can dance. Even a dumb animal can dance. The judge set the bottle on the bar. Hear me, man, he said. There is room on the stage for one beast and one alone. All others are destined for a night that is eternal and without name. One by one they will step down into the darkness before the footlamps. Bears that dance, bears that don't. The kid gets up to leave and he tries to take his mind off of this. He walks into the back room of the saloon where there is a brothel. And he quickly goes with the first woman who walks up to him and he goes and spends his time in the brothel. And after it's over, the woman tells him that he can't stay in this room anymore because they need to keep using these rooms. And she tells the man to get out. And the man kind of sits there for a minute. It's like he's afraid. It's like he's afraid of whatever's coming next. And he's sitting there on the bed looking out the window. And eventually he swings his legs over the edge and gets up and goes back downstairs. And then it says when he gets to the bottom, he stood at the edge of the dance floor. A ring of people had taken the floor and were holding hands and grinning and calling out to one another. A fiddler sat on a stool on a stage and a man walked up and down calling out the order of the dance and gesturing and stepping in the way he wished them to go. Outside in the darkened lot, groups of wretched Tonkawas stood in the mud with their face composed in strange lost portraits within the sash work of the window lights. The fiddler rose and set the fiddle to his jaw. There was a shout and the music began and the ring of dancers began to rotate ponderously with a great shuffling. He went out the back. So this moment where the kid is trying to take his mind off everything the judge has said, and he is now standing there before the dance floor, ready to dance, and the kid decides to leave. It says, The rain had stopped and the air was cold. He stood in the yard. Stars were falling across the sky, myriad and random. This is a callback to the beginning of the book when his father would tell him that the night he was born, how the stars did fall. Speeding along brief vectors from their origins in night to their destinies in dust and nothingness. Within the hall, the fiddle squealed and the dancers shuffled and stomped. In the street, men were calling for the little girl whose bear was dead, for she was lost. They went among the darkened lots with lanterns and torches calling out to her. Again, the judge is in town, so it seems another young child has gone missing. He went down the walkboard towards the Jakes. Again, Jakes are effectively outhouses. He stood outside, listening to the voices fading away, and he looked again at the silent tracks of the stars where they died over the darkened hills. Then he opened the rough board door of the Jakes and stepped in. The judge was seated upon the closet. He was naked and he rose up smiling and gathered him in his arms against his immense and terrible flesh and shot the wooden bar latch home behind him. In the saloon, two men who wanted to buy the hide were looking for the owner of the bear. The bear lay on the stage in an immense pool of blood. All the candles had gone out save one and it guttered uneasily in its grease like a votive lamp. In the dance hall, a young man had joined the fiddler, and he kept the measure of the music with a pair of spoons which he clapped between his knees. The horse, a shade half naked, some with their breast exposed, in the mudded dog yard behind the premises, two men went down the boards towards the jakes. A third man was standing there urinating into the mud. Is someone in there? the first man said. The man who was relieving himself did not look up. I wouldn't go in there if I was you, he said. Is there somebody in there? I wouldn't go in. He hitched himself up and buttoned his trousers and stepped past them and went up the walk towards the lights. The first man watched him go and then opened the door of the jakes. 
good God Almighty, he said. What is it? He didn't answer. He stepped past the other and went back up the walk. The other man stood looking after him. Then he opened the door and looked in. In the saloon, they had rolled the dead bear onto a wagon sheet, and there was a general call for hands. In the anteroom, the tobacco smoke circled the lamps like an evil fog, and the men bid and dealt in a low mutter. There was a lull in the dancing, and a second fiddler took the stage, and the two plucked their strings and turned the little hardwood pegs until they were satisfied. Many among the dancers were staggering drunk through the room, and some had rid themselves of shirts and jackets and stood bare-chested and sweating, even though the room was cold enough to cloud their breath. An enormous whore stood clapping her hands at the bandstand and calling drunkenly for the music. She wore nothing but a pair of men's drawers, and some of her sisters were likewise clad in what appeared to be trophies, hats or pantaloons or blue twill cavalry jackets. As the music sawed up, there was a lively cry from all, and a caller stood to the front and called out the dance, and the dancers stomped and hooted and lurched against one another. And they are dancing. The board floor slamming under the jackboots, and the fiddlers grinning hideously over the canned pieces, towering over them all is the judge, and he is naked, dancing, his feet lively and quick, and now in double time and bowing to the ladies, huge and pale and hairless, like an enormous infant. He never sleeps, he says. He says he'll never die. He bows to the fiddlers and sashays backwards and throws back his head and laughs deep in his throat, and he is a great favorite, the judge. He wafts his hat, and the lunar dome of his skull passes palely under the lamps, and he swigs about and takes possession of one of the fiddles, and he parades and makes a pass, two passes, dancing and fiddling at once. His feet are light and nimble. He never sleeps. He says that he will never die. He dances in light and in shadow, and he is a great favorite. He never sleeps, the judge. He is dancing, dancing. He says that he will never die. The end. And that is the novel, Blood Meridian. So, what was that ending? Um, I am going to go ahead and ruin the game for you now. I'm not going to be the final authority on what all of that means. I'm pretty confident in what happened, uh, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be the expert in the symbolism or the themes of it. But I have a pretty good idea. So to get it out of the way, what logistically happened um, is in the midst of all of this, the bear dying on stage and the men wanting to scavenge its body for a pelt and the dance continuing to amp up and the people dancing and the judge joining them. In the midst of that, the man who was once the kid steps out of the brothel and he chooses not to dance. And instead, he goes out back to go use an outhouse. And oh man, the visual is so terrifying. As he opens the outhouse door and steps in, the judge is standing in there completely naked. And we never are told what the kid looked like or exactly what the judge did to him, but it's enough that whenever the men open the outhouse, all that they can say is, good God almighty. The kid was horrifically murdered by the judge. We saw in one instance earlier that in a split second, the judge crushed a man's skull with his bare hands. So imagine what he could do if given time. And not to belabor the point, but I think it's pretty clear that considering the judge was a horrific and prolific uh, child predator, and the man was a child that he had preyed on for quite some time, you can use your worst parts of imagination to determine what he might have done to the man. And the story ends with the room dancing and the judge dancing above all of them, screaming of how he never sleeps and he will never die and he'll dance forever. So what does all that mean? So while we're talking about this story, let's go ahead and get the big detail out of the way. Uh, this is not something that is original to me at all. This is probably the first analysis most people make of the story. And that is... Judge Holden, at least symbolically, is the devil. Not only with the symbolism I mentioned earlier, like the tale of him making gunpowder being a reference back to Paradise Lost, but also in other details, like the judge is never seen sleeping. 
Uh, and he's also never seen eating or drinking, at least not directly mentioned. He is known for dancing and specifically for playing the fiddle, which what religious figure is famous for playing the fiddle? His appearance of the Glanning Gang was almost supernatural, just appearing in the middle of the desert and then acting as their escort. Not only that, but his appearance that he had at the beginning of the novel with the kid, and then Tobin going on to say that everyone says they've seen the judge at some point before this. The first thing said of the judge directly in the entire book is when the Reverend Green looks at him and yells, this is him, cried the Reverend, sobbing, this is him, the devil, here he stands. I mean, the rifle he uses to shoot people is named after death. The whole in Arcadia, there I am. He literally uses the gun of death to kill whoever he doesn't like. And of course, that combined with his conversations of selfishness, of how the freedom of the birds is an insult to him. And if creation exists without his knowledge, it exists without his consent. It sounds like a jealous angel who once wished to be God. His appearance itself is even snake-like. He's hairless with this pale white skin and these snake eyes or pig eyes as they're described somewhere else in the story. He seems to have near infinite knowledge of different languages and cultures and politics as if he has lived a much longer life than his current form suggests. Even at the end of the story, there's no mention of him having aged at all despite it being decades since they last met. And there's also, of course, his philosophy regarding war, and that war and death is the ultimate merit of a man, as well as a slew of short mentions of Bible verses he quotes, or things and language that ties him into God. As a matter of fact, whenever Tobin is telling the story about the judge taking them to the volcano to make the gunpowder, he describes the volcano as being something out of Dante's Inferno, further implying that the judge is quite literally taking the gang through hell. Now, do I think that it was always McCarthy's point to have the judge be the actual literal Satan in the story? No, I just think that's what the thematic element is. That's what the judge feels like. He feels like an embodiment of the devil. I don't think the purpose of the story was that there was an explicitly supernatural element in the midst of this historical horror. What would you categorize this as? It's definitely horrific, probably just historical fiction, but very dark historical fiction. He didn't just throw the devil into the middle of that. But Judge Holden is definitely the proxy of the devil. He is the agent of evil in the story. And I say all that to say, for one, I think it's interesting that Judge Holden holds so many characteristics in line with the devil. But also, if you get to the end of the story and you read that the judge murders the kid, or the judge murders the man, and your thought is, oh, that's annoying. Why didn't the judge get what he deserves? I think you're missing the point. And if you watching the video right now felt that way, I'm going to assume that's not your fault and probably my bad in telling you the story, because it's very different between reading a book and then however I've done trying to regurgitate that information anyway. Because that would be like getting to the end of a story and then hearing that death killed someone and then being frustrated that death didn't get what death deserves. Judge Holden is not so much a character and not so much someone that goes on a journey as much as he is an element within the piece. He is not a thing that might be, he is a thing that is. He is a collection of things that are, of the horrors and the brutality that can exist within the world and the mindsets that some people can have that create these ultimate situations of brutality like Blood Meridian set in. It's like getting mad at an act of nature for taking someone's life. It just doesn't make sense. So whenever we apply it that way, we see Judge Holden as this essence rather than a person, then instead of asking what does the kid's death say about the judge, the question is what does the kid's death say about the kid? Now, I also want to emphasize in all of McCarthy's stories, there is very, very rarely a moral message or a definitive, this is good guy, this is bad guy. Uh, every now and then you'll get one like The Road had a few, uh, and that book's also a lot easier to read because of that. But Blood Meridian isn't a story of good people and bad people. It is entirely people who are predominantly bad, but occasionally show moments of good. And I think we can all agree 
that the closest to a good character we have within this story is the kid. And I think that while the judge was evil, I don't think he was crazy. And I think within the rules of the world they inhabited, a lot of what he said made sense. Like, of course, his whole speech about war being the only virtue that matters and men should fight and kill each other. Of course, that's evil and barbaric to us, but he's saying that to a group of people who cut off people's scalps to make money. Of course, that would be the rule that would abide by them, even if they don't like to hear it. So, again, this is very much so up for interpretation. If you enjoyed the story and just wanted to hear the story and don't care about my opinions on it, then thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. Uh, but... Whenever I first read it, and as I read the story over and over and listened to lectures about it and uh, read reviews about this book or analysis of this book, I continued to reaffirm my initial ideas with what that ending means. In that final conversation that the judge has with the kid, I know he's called the man, but I'm going to keep calling him the kid for consistency's sake. In that final conversation, he talks about how the dance, as he calls it, which is a metaphor for, I mean, you could say life, warfare, events, whatever, uh, moments in time or all of time itself. In this dance, every participant who steps into that dance does not know what will happen. He equates it to the moment they're in. The people who came here for a dance didn't know that a bear was going to be shot, but he explains that if any one member of the dance knew what his fate would be, it would ruin the dance entirely because that one person could change the course of everyone else's destinies. So a dance only works, it is only fitting, if everyone doesn't know what will happen when they step into their role. And as a matter of fact, the only choice that people happen, and this lies back on the themes the story is constantly brought up, a faith, destiny, free will, the only choice, according to the judge, that people have is if they dance or they don't dance. We're all going to step into that quiet night, as the judge says. Bears who dance and bears who don't. Fate and free will comes up a ton throughout this story. Again, unless you think of the judge as a fully supernatural character, which I don't think he is, then there were several fateful meetings of the judge throughout the kid's life. Like, again, whenever he was in Nacogdoches and he saw him at the Reverend's Revival. But also, like the little moments, whenever the kid goes to draw the arrow to see if he'll put down one of the injured comrades, the judge looks at him and stares him down. And if it hadn't been for the judge staring him down, which caused him to pick a different arrow, which caused him to stay behind, which caused him to get stuck with Tate, which caused him to go up onto the mountain, and everything that followed after that, which eventually came out that the kid wasn't there when the gunfight with the Mexican soldiers began, which might have gotten him killed. All of that came from the judge making eye contact with him and the kid choosing a different arrow. So there's so many moments of fate like that that occur throughout the story. And again, as the judge said, if any of those moments were known by the kid going in, he could have changed them and fate for everyone could have gone completely differently. So if fate is to be real and if the judge analysis of it at the end is true, then that means the only choice this kid has in his life is if he participates in what fate has for him or not, if he dances or if he doesn't. And this is kind of subjective, like even more so than an analysis. See, whenever, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, I said the hardest part to adapt of this entire story, if you were adapted into the film, is the kid's level of participation in everything that's happening. Because if you have the kid just murdering people, doing the exact same with the rest of the gang, then he's no different. But like I said earlier, the kid is never mentioned explicitly in these moments of violence. He's just present. That's as far as the story will definitively say. So this kind of changes depending on what version of the kid you have in your mind. But because of what the judge says at the end of the story, a few times when he's in the jail cell and whenever they're in the desert, when he calls him mutinous, uh, uh, mutinous against the cause, and when he also says that the kid has betrayed himself, that leads me to believe that the kid never fully went along with what the gang was doing. Sure, he'd fight back against Apaches who fired on him first and Mexican soldiers who fired on him first, but it makes me feel like the kid was never a part of the slaughter of unarmed civilians. And because of that, fate, God, whatever element you want to think is orchestrating this story, began to set him apart. It began 
to provide him with a way out. If you think about it several times, whenever he was walking with the band of American soldiers in the beginning of the story to, again, that mention of Tate on top of the snowy mountaintop, uh, whenever he wins the draw with the Mexican soldier, and time and time again, fate has instrumented everything to keep the kid alive. And it seems that the greatest moment of instrumentation was immediately after he showed his most successive acts of kindness. He stays behind and decides not to kill Shelby whenever they're being chased by the Mexican army, and then leaves him water from his own canteen. Then whenever he gets to Tate further up the road, he decides instead of going on and saving himself to stay behind and help Tate as well. It is after that, after they get stranded on top of the mountain and the kid begins to run, and I know I mentioned it earlier, but this is why it sticks with me. The kid comes to the burning tree, the metaphorical voice of God standing before him. He stands among it with the spiders and the snakes who are all equal to him in this moment, or I should say he's equal to them. And as he stands there, he sees this and he gathers warmth for it. It is another moment of fate providing for him, keeping him alive. And I think it is the most, until the end of the story, it is the most direct example of the world telling the kid to get out, to do something different. But instead, the kid goes back to the group. He goes back to the group of people who had to burn the scalps because they don't have any use for him anymore. And eventually would just take over a fairy and decide to rob and kill because they've got nothing else to do. Even that moment with Tobin and the kid hobbling across the desert and the wind begins to pick up and covers up the tracks behind them so that the judge can't find them. Time and time again, the world has moved mountains to save this boy's life. And I think the final moment happens there in that last chapter of the book. The final chance the world is giving him. We already see that he's trying to be better. The notion that he carries a Bible that he can't even read. Or he goes to the old woman who's actually dead but he thinks is alive and talks of how he'll do everything he can to save her. We see these moments of someone who wants to do better. Someone who is trying so desperately to be good. And the killing of the 15 year old, that can go both ways. And honestly, I'm not smart enough and don't have opinions that strong one way or the other. Some people think that killing the kid is a good thing because it shows a severance from what the kid once was. And some people think that it's a bad thing. Like I mentioned earlier, I had on my first reading where I saw it as kind of an act of nihilism, of betterment over your past self in a bad way. Um, I'll leave that up to you. I, like I said, I don't feel that strongly one way or the other. But what I do feel strongly about is that moment after the conversation with the judge. After the kid and the judge meet in that saloon and after the kid leaves him to go to the brothel. And then when he comes back down, he is standing in front of the stage and there are two options. He can dance or he can walk away. And the kid chooses to walk away. Now, this kind of depends on how you interpret the idea of dance, or at least as the judge puts it forward. When I read it, I see the dance as being the proliferation, the doing something with your life. It is a neutral act because it can be used for good or evil. You can be like the judge and dance, and by dance the judge means wage war and kill as many people as you can, or you can be like what the kids started to be, helping others, trying to be a hero, something in spite of the world that falls apart around him being something greater than the makings that you were supposed to be, or as the world originally had you to be, rising to the occasion. Both are equally a dance, it's just if you choose to dance or not. Again, as the judge said, our fates are set out from us for the beginning. None of us can control them, we can only choose if we participate or not. And I think there was a higher calling for the kid. I think that from the burning tree in the middle of the woods, or the multiple times he was saved, I think so badly that the universe had something great for this kid, perhaps even a hero, dare I say, to rise up in this broken world and to make something of himself and to make something of the people around him. And in that moment, the world presented him the stage. He can dance, he can rise to the occasion, or as the judge says, did you think that if you never said anything, no one would recognize what you are? 
He can continue to be afraid of what the world might be, continue to think that he's not worth it or he doesn't deserve it, and he can walk out the back door. And here in this moment, the kid walks out the back door. And in that moment where the judge kills him, I don't see it as a man killing the boy. I see it as death itself or the world itself destroying something that had so much potential to be so great and is now eaten up and chewed up by the sands of the desert, just like everything else. I think that the final moments of the story are saying that there will be those like the judge, those who continue to dance. In spite of what we do, at the end of the story, the judge was dancing. He'll never get old, he'll never die, and he'll never sleep. Evil will always be there. Monsters will always be in the dark. The most evil and depraved of humanity will continue to thrive in spite of us. And the only way that that can be kept from happening, the only way the judge is kept from winning, is good men deciding to dance. Good men deciding to rise to the occasion. To not shy away from what the world has to offer them or what they have to offer the world, and instead to make something of themselves, to be something greater. Or to be consumed by the evil men who do choose to dance. Bears who dance and bears who don't. I see the story of Blood Meridian of being about the tragedy of not only the Old West and of America, but of humanity itself. There will always be evil. In the beginning of the story, the hermit talked about how man can make a machine and a machine to perpetuate evil for a thousand years. Evil will always exist. The changing factor is when good people who, in spite of the evil around them, like the kid, step up to the plate and decide to dance for themselves. And that's why I think the ending of the story is a tragedy, not because the kid died, but because he decided not to dance. And because of that, what future did he have but death? It's a very brutal story, it's a bloody story, but every aspect of it, from the blood and gore to the beautiful imagery, the scenery, the characters, the hate, it all goes to paint the picture of how morbid and evil the world is and how desperate it is for a hero who decides to dance. And that is why I love Blood Meridian and love Cormac McCarthy. Um, I'm not going to spoil, you know, I was going to talk about the epilogue. It's like a paragraph and my theory with it, but it's even more fun if I tell you to go read the epilogue for yourself online and good luck with that because it's a doozy. Uh, <laughs> but if you watch this long into a video, of me explaining this novel from 1985 that I think is really cool, then I just want to say you're really cool for being here. And that means the most. And I just want to say thank you for watching. Uh, normally at the end of these videos, I like to ramble, but I have been filming this for a total of like 10 or 11 hours at this point, And I'm really tired and need to get it edited. So I won't ramble for that long. I will say thank you all so much for watching. Uh, as you can see, this book really did mean a lot to me, and hopefully I was able to convey that over to you guys. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed. I hope this wasn't boring. If you stuck around this long, you're great. This is way too long. Hopefully the green screen goes well. We'll see how it turns out. Maybe I'll use it again. Maybe I'll burn it. Just depends on how you all like it. But for real, thank you all for being here. It means the world. Uh, so with that, I think we'll be done. I will say, World of Tanks. Remember to download World of Tanks. It is a fun game. Uh, the people I worked with were very kind and respectful to me, and they're great guys, and they make a great product. So go get World of Tanks. Download that at the link in the description. But other than that, that should do it. So I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!